Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this Parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. <coughs> Clerk. Government Business Notice of Motion Number 1, standing in the name of the Leader of the Government of the Senate, relating to an apology to the stolen generation. Senator Evans. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I have uh, great uh, pleasure in moving the motion. Mr. President, I first want to acknowledge all the traditional owners on the land upon we meet today. I wish to acknowledge the presence of many Indigenous peoples in the Parliament and its surrounds who are part of what we know as the Stolen Generations. I also want to acknowledge the many Australians, Indigenous and non-Indigenous across Australia who are listening or watching the Parliament this morning, although probably more likely the House of Representatives. Mr President, today is a very important occasion in the history of our nation and this parliament. Today is not just about our past, it's also about our future. For many Australians, today means confronting and accepting what has gone before and acknowledging our values of civility, fairness and compassion that hopefully will guide us in our future endeavours. The motion uh, we move today, Mr Chairman, uh, Mr President, says that we honour the Indigenous peoples of this land the oldest continuing cultures in, in, in human history. We reflect on their past mistreatment. We reflect in particular on the mistreatment of those who were stolen generations, this blemished chapter in our nation's history. The time has now come for the nation to turn a new page in Australia's history by righting the wrongs of the past and so moving forward with confidence to the future. We apologise for the laws and policies of successive parliaments and governments that have inflicted profound grief, suffering and loss on those our fellow Australians. We apologise especially for the removal of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children from their families, their communities and their country. For the pain, suffering and hurt of these stolen generations, their descendants and for the families left behind, we say sorry. To the mothers and the fathers, the brothers and the sisters, for the breaking up of families and communities, we say sorry and for the indignity and degradation thus inflicted on a proud people and a proud culture, we say sorry. We, the Parliament of Australia, respectfully request that this apology be received in the spirit in which it is offered, as part of the healing of the nation. For the future we take heart, resolving that this new page in the history of our great continent can now be written. We today take this first step by acknowledging the past and laying claim to a future that embraces all Australians, a future where this parliament resolves that the injustices of the past must never, never happen again, a future where we harness the determination of all Australians, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, to close the gap that lies between us in life expectancy, educational achievement and economic opportunity, a future where we embrace the possibility of new solutions to enduring problems where old approaches have failed a future based on mutual respect, mutual resolve and mutual responsibility. A future where all Australians, whatever their origins, are truly equal partners with equal opportunities and with an equal stake in shaping the next chapter in the history of this great country, Australia. Mr President, uh, nearly 10 years ago, on the 27th of May 1997, the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission released its report, bringing them home. The report was a result of a national inquiry which was established by the Keating government in August 1995. The report was dedicated <coughs> to the generations of Aboriginal children taken from their families and communities who are still searching for home and to the memory of the children who will never return. 
The inquiry visited every state and territory and most regions of Australia. It took evidence in public and private from Indigenous people, government and church representatives, former mission staff, foster and adoptive parents, doctors and health professionals, academics, police and others. Most hearings were conducted by Sir Ronald Wilson, the Heriot President, and Mick Dodson, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner. We are indebted to these two great Australians. In each major region throughout Australia, an Indigenous Commissioner was appointed to assist with the hearings. An Indigenous Advisory Council with representatives from all the regions also assisted the inquiry. A total of 770 people and organisations provided evidence or a submission. Some 535 were Indigenous people. Most had been removed as children. Others were parents of siblings or children of removed children. The report found that somewhere between one in three and one in ten Indigenous children were forcibly removed from their families between 1910 and 1970. We don't, do not know how many were separated prior to 1910. Indeed, we do not know with certainty how many children were removed from their families. But we do know that Indigenous children were placed in institutions, church missions, adopted or fostered, and were at risk of physical and sexual abuse. And many, of course, did not receive wages for their labour. The practice was on such a large scale and over such a long <coughs> period, continuing so close to the present day, that its effect cannot be dismissed as olden times. It is our responsibility. The truth is in the past and is very much with us today in the effects on the lives of Indigenous Australians. There are some, I know, who still believe that the removal of Indigenous children was good. Some removals, uh, it is argued, were part of a broad welfare system which decided what was in the best interests of the children. But the truth is, the stolen generation were removed from their families because of their culture, their colour and their race, because they were considered inferior, because non-Indigenous Australians thought that they could do better. Thousands of Indigenous people grew up without the love of their parents or the love of their brothers and sisters. Many never knew who they were or where they came from. These policies did break down families, clans and tribes, and played a key role in dislocating communities, depriving many of them the bonds that binds, bind communities and depriving them of family and cultural legacies. After the release of the report, many of the stolen generations made a request for an apology. They said that this would have meaning by showing that Australians recognised their hurt and pain and accepted that what had been done to them was wrong. It was a heartfelt request because they said this would help the healing process. <coughs> the stolen generations are real people. Let's think of them as individuals as well. It is to them that we belatedly offer our apology. Since that time, apologies were given in state parliaments in New South Wales, Queensland, WA, South Australia, Victoria, Tasmania, and in the parliaments of the ACT and Northern Territory. Words of apology have been said in churches, in public meetings, and in private conversations. They have been discussed and debated Australia-wide. But until now, no apology has been offered in this place by an Australian government. And that has been wrong. The stolen generations have been deeply damaged by the decisions of this parliament and of governments. Their suffering was a product of the deliberate policies of the state, as reflected in the explicit powers given under statute. There are countless moving stories from many thousands of Aboriginal people who were taken from their families involuntarily. I was particularly touched by the story of Sandra Hill, who says today's apology from the parliament will be the biggest thing to happen in her life. I'd like to recount part of her story, which was uh, published in the Sunday Times of Perth last weekend for the benefit of the Senate today. Sandra is a professional artist, a mother of three children and grandmother to five children who lives in the southwest of uh, WA in Ballingup. Sandra is also a strong, resilient and proud Noongar woman who was forcibly taken from her parents in 1958 at the age of six. <coughs> Along with her two sisters and younger brother, Sandra was taken uh, to Sister Kate's children's home where they lived for two years before being fostered out to a white family. It would be 27 years before those children saw their parents again. And I'd like to recount some of Sandra's story as only her words can do justice to the experiences 
that her and her family have endured. And she says, you can't begin to imagine the sense of loss that I and so many like me have experienced. My children were the first free children born into my family for four generations, and I celebrate every day that we share together as a family. My heart aches for my mum and dad. To lose a child is bad enough. To lose four young children in one fell, fell swoop is incomprehensible. Our removal forced mum to not only relive her experiences, but also that of her father and grandfather. Both were surrendered to the monks at Nunosia. In 1933, the native welfare swooped down on my grandparents' camp in Caversham. They took my mother, Doreen, and her sister, Hilda, who were seven and ten at the time. She was taken to Moore River Native Settlement and then transferred, due to her fair skin, to Sister Kate's home for half-castes at Buckland Hill. The authorities changed her name and her birth date so that her parents couldn't trace her. Over a period of 23 years, from 1933, my grandparents lost six children to the welfare authorities, ending in 1956 with their youngest daughter, Baronia. Mum could barely talk about the family's experience without enormous distress, even after 60 years. No education, material gain, or so-called opportunities could or would ever be a fair trade-off for losing the ones you love. My family was my world, and it was stolen from me and my siblings. And if I could go back in time, I would choose to stay where I belonged, where my spirit and my heart still live with my beloved mum and dad. She goes on to say, we don't want to relegate blame or guilt. That would be counterproductive. However, recognition and acknowledgement of the profound and far-reaching effects that past policies have had on my people is critical in helping us to move forward into a more positive and inclusive future. I've listened to many of the stolen generations tell us their stories over the years while working on committees of this parliament and, and uh, in moving around the electorate. You're always struck by the dignity with which those stories are told. And the thing that strikes me most is the lack of bitterness, the lack of thought of vengeance. Uh, and I defy anyone not to be moved by those stories. Don't think of them as a generation or, or, or under the title we give them. Think of them as individual people. It's been written uh, that, the, the, that the pain and suffering cannot be addressed unless the whole community listens with an open heart and mind to the stories of what happened and having listened and understood, commits itself to repair the damage. It's awful to comp comprehend the pain and suffering of the children who were removed and the anguish of their parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles. The trauma of a removal is indescribable. Every parent fears the death of their children. The forcible separation from their children must have been equally traumatic. To have such a policy organised and sanctioned by the national government would only have added to the trauma and the feeling of helplessness. The past is always with us. It shapes the present and the future. It shapes who we are and how we behave. It determines the colour of our thinking, and we can only progress when we acknowledge the good and the bad that has happened. It's taken nearly 11 years since the report was published, but this morning, in the other place, the Prime Minister, on behalf of the Australian Parliament, offered an apology to the Stolen Generations. There is no more important place for these words to be said, because this parliament speaks for the nation. The Prime Minister apologised for the laws and policies of past governments, which caused profound grief and loss on many Indigenous Australians. And he promised that this will never happen again. He has committed us to a new beginning, a new national effort, and we must succeed. The response of the nation to today's apology has been wonderful. People are embracing the opportunity to do the right thing, to do what we teach our children to do, today to say sorry for doing something hurtful, and more important, importantly, to mean it. Non-Indigenous Australians should be proud that we are strong enough as a people to admit the wrong and to say sorry. I know that this is a day that many Indigenous Australians believed they would never live to see. It has been far too long coming. For that, I am sorry too. And we acknowledge that those who did not live to see this day, 
To their descendants we say sorry for the pain and hurt suffered over generations and the loss of identity, family and country that can never be restored. Now much has been said and written in the past few weeks about the symbolism of an apology and its significance. Some people have argued that the symbolic act of saying sorry will somehow undermine or even replace the practical reforms needed to fix the huge gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. I believe the opposite is true. And I'm mindful of what Sir William Dean said, and I'd like to quote him. It is simply to assert our identity as a nation and the basic fact that national shame, as well as national pride, can and should exist in relation to past acts and omissions, at least when done or made in the name of the community or with the authority of government. When there is no room for national pride or national shame about the past, there can be no national soul. Mr President, saying sorry gives us the impetus to move on. It reminds us of our responsibilities as citizens, as members of the Australian community, to help those in society less well off. It's the next step in the huge task of closing the gap. Yes, it's arguably a symbolic gesture, but symbols are important by definition in sending a strong message which I believe will help us tackle the substance of the issue, removing the inequalities that exist between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. We know that the health and well-being of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island Australians remains dramatically worse than the rest of the community as a whole. Many still endure inadequate health services, overcrowded and substandard housing, poor access to education and barriers in getting a job. Alcohol and drugs are crippling communities and child abuse is evident. Entrenched health problems are denying Indigenous Australians a future and progress to improve their health status has been slow under successive governments. The inequality between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians is stark. The 17-year life expectancy gap remains one of the starkest indicators of inequality in Australian society. Current rates of Indigenous life expectancy are comparable to those of other Australians in the 1920s. Third, worlds like, third world diseases like rheumatic fever and trachoma <coughs> persist, and there are high rates of chronic disease, including renal failure, cardiovascular disease and diabetes. Now, the government, and I think the parliament, comprehends the enormity of closing this gap, and we know it can only be done in a mutually responsible partnership with Indigenous Australians. That's why we seek the support of the whole parliament. The government is making a concerted effort to ensure the fundamentals of a decent life are shared by Indigenous Australians. Good health, nutrition, a safe and comfortable home, a high quality education and the opportunity to share in the dividends of our, econ our economy through work. We are determined to make sure that all children, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, have the same healthy future. Within a decade, we pledged to halve the gap in mortality rates between Indigenous and non-Indigenous children under the age of five. Such goals, such targets are important. And in the same period, we want to bridge, halve the gap in reading, writing and numeracy. To do this, we are providing comprehensive funding for child and maternal health services, early development and parenting support, and literacy and numeracy in the early years. Health services have been ex expanded and improved. The government is prioritising the expansion of alcohol detoxification and rehabilitation services across the Northern Territory. And we're also expanding sobering up shelters in Catherine and Tennant Creek so that alcohol abusers can be accommodated in a safe environment. Giving Indigenous children the best chance for a bright future requires a sound foundation of education and training. Literacy and numeracy are the building blocks, but currently the performance of Indigenous children often falls far behind. Now this won't still be good enough. We have no illusions about the extent and complexity of the challenges before us. But we must close the gap in life expectancy between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians, and we must close the infant mortality gap for young Indigenous children. What we must understand from the past is that we cannot do this for Indigenous Australians. Paternalism, new or old, does not work. We must find solutions together with Indigenous Australians and empower them to overcome the enormous barriers to equal opportunity in our society. Now, today's motion is uh, much different from the way we normally conduct business. The motion will be supported by the alternative government and other senators around the chamber. 
I think that's vital for Indigenous Australians to accept this, this apology. It has to be from all of us and it has to be meant. Hopefully the broad support for the apology will be a platform for a more bipartisan approach to attack, attack the inequalities between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. It's with regret in the past that Indigenous policy became an ideological issue to be fought over. It would be good to think that today marks an end to the ideological battles of the past and a willingness on all sides to work together with Indigenous Australians. For too long, the ideological battles of politicians have been at the expense of Indigenous people. These are our challenges for the future. The responsibility for a just and equitable future for Indigenous Australians falls on all our shoulders. Today, this parliament on behalf of the nation has taken a powerful step in this regard. The apology today is not about imposing guilt or shame on this generation of Australians. It's not about attributing personal blame. It is the acknowledgement of the injustices and mistakes of the past and its ex an acceptance of what has happened. And it can also be the next step in reconciliation. It's now up to us as a nation to write, as the Prime Minister pledged in the other place this morning, to bring together Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians, government and opposition, Commonwealth and state, to write a new chapter in our nation's story. I commend the motion to the Senate. Senator Minchin. I rise to speak to the motion uh, just moved by Senator Evans in relation to an apology to those Indigenous Australians that were forcibly removed from their families and communities under laws of past uh, state and federal governments. Uh, while the coalition does support the motion, I must say at the outset that we do have strong objections to the way in which the government has handled uh, this matter. Uh, an apology has been Labor policy for many years, and they've now been in government for nearly three months. But it was only last night that MPs and senators were able to see the wording of the motion to be put to the House and Senate. And not only that, the government has insisted that a vote be taken on the motion after only a limited number of speakers and before everyone who wants to speak has had that opportunity. Uh, the government's handling of this sensitive matter, uh, frankly, has been arrogant in our view and disrespectful of the parliament in, whom, who, in whose name this apology is to be made. Uh, nevertheless, uh, as we have announced, the Coalition will support this motion. Uh, we have given a very lengthy consideration of this matter in our party room. We admit it has not been an easy issue for any of us or for the millions of Australians that we represent. The debate about an apology has, of course, um, been held previously in this parliament, and state parliaments across the country have made some form of apology or statement of regret for the actions of the past. As parliamentarians, I think we have a big responsibility to ensure that these issues are debated for the right reasons. And in this case, it is about making sure that we see better outcomes for Indigenous Australians and we all work to overcome obvious Indigenous disadvantage. As I say, we've given a lot of thought to this matter for a decade. Uh, when uh, our government responded to the Bringing Them Home report in 1997, the then Prime Minister John Howard expressed his profound personal sorrow, but stated that the coalition did not believe, and I quote, that Australians of this generation should be required to accept guilt and blame for past actions and policies over which they had no control. That was a view sincerely held by our government and which was, I think, shared by many Australians at that time. And I must say that one should always approach with caution any proposition which involves judging past actions by contemporary standards or seeking to hold one generation responsible for the actions of those who came before. And I should also state for the record that our government was concerned that a formal statement of apology could trigger a substantial number of claims for compensation, which we felt then would be both very divisive and, if successful, an unjustified burden on current taxpayers. We remain of that view in relation to the issue of compensation. Uh, we note that while the government has ruled out any compensation, uh, this motion is silent on that matter. Uh, I note that Senator Brown proposes to move an amendment on that matter, and I give notice now of our opposition to an amendment relating to compensation. But in light of our reservations about a formal apology, in 1999 the then Prime Minister moved a statement of regret in the House of Representatives. That statement reaffirmed the Parliament's commitment to reconciliation, acknowledged the mistreatment of many Indigenous Australians over a significant period, represents the most blemished chapter in our national history and expressed the Parliament's deep and sincere regret 
that Indigenous Australians suffered injustices under the practice of past generations and for the hurt and trauma that many Indigenous people continued to feel as a consequence of those practices. The intent of that statement remains as relevant today as it was nearly 10 years ago, but we do acknowledge that Indigenous Australians affected by the policies of the past need more than our sympathies and regret in order for them to accept the sincerity of our nation's remorse for past practices. It's been a long road since that national inquiry into the separation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, the Bringing Them Home report. May I say that Brendan Nelson's contribution to that debate after the release of that report is as poignant and emotive today as it was then. His strong sense of humanity and commitment to our Indigenous Australians helped to ensure that the Coalition would move to support this motion today. Dr Nelson is to be commended for his leadership on this issue, which, as I said, is not an easy one for the men and women of the Liberal and National Parties and the millions of Australians we do represent. But Dr Nelson was right when he stated back then that this is not a question of our generation or those subsequent carrying guilt. It is about understanding what was done and the consequences of it. We now understand and accept that this apology is the right thing to do. We accept that the Australian people want this parliament to come together to settle this matter. Our policy on this matter has evolved against the background of our strong faith in the importance of families and the impact on families of the policies of forced removal does not sit well with what our parties fundamentally believe in. And when we look at the individual stories of those affected by separations, we do find hurt, damage, regrets and, in many cases, justifiable anger. But we also find that those who implemented these policies were, in many cases, acting in what they then believed were in the best interests of the children at the time. And, of course, any civilised society has laws to provide for the protection of children from harm, including from their own families. Such laws exist today in Australia, but regrettably do not always operate to protect Australia's vulnerable children. And this is a fundamental argument about who knows what is best for children in our society, and it's a debate still ongoing. We trust that even today state government officers around the country do act appropriately when they remove children at risk, even from their parents. The danger, of course, is in creating a perception that removal is always wrong. Ultimately, authorities must act to protect, to protect children at risk. So the balance between the sanctity of the family on the one hand and the state's responsibility for the protection of children is never easy to achieve, and of course especially so in the case of Aboriginal children. Mr President, the last decade has seen uh, much action and many programs <coughs> in relation to Indigenous affairs, and this chamber has been very active in that matter, and the former government implemented a number of significant reforms as we turned away from what we perceive to be political correctness to focus on real results. The former government had at the forefront of its policy for Indigenous Australians ensuring better outcomes. Our policies were admittedly about substance. They weren't about symbolism. And John, Har John Howard was not the barrier to an apology. It cannot be said of our government in any way that we did not do our utmost to ensure that Indigenous people in this country received adequate support or that our reforms did not help reduce the disadvantage facing our Indigenous communities. I personally had the privilege of spending a considerable amount of time in our Indigenous communities during the first three years of our government when I had executive responsibility for native title, and I therefore experienced firsthand the enormous disadvantage suffered by people in many of our more remote Indigenous communities. And negotiating native title reform with Indigenous leaders in their communities was a difficult but personally very enriching experience. Native title, I think, is just one aspect of Indigenous affairs where our determination to implement practical improvements were, of course, met with hostility, but which we can now see have resulted in real advances. Our reforms to the way in which we deal with native title claims have resulted in much better outcomes for all involved. And as a coalition, we are proud of our overall achievements in Indigenous affairs. Expenditure on Indigenous-specific programs and services in our last budget um, was set at $3.5 billion for the current financial year, a 39 per cent real increase uh, from the levels of 1995-96 when we came to office. More Indigenous Australians are participating in our strong economy 
including a fall in the unemployment rate among them from 30 per cent in 1994 to just 12.8 per cent in 0405. Over the same period, Indigenous long-term unemployment has fallen from 14.2 per cent to 5.1 per cent. And although more improvements need to be made in the fields of health and education, there are some positive signs, including a 16 per cent decrease in the Indigenous mortality rate in the Northern Territory, South Australia and Western Australia from 1991 to 2003. So we have seen some real and significant improvements, but of course we acknowledge that there's a very long way to go to ensure that Indigenous Australians are on an equal footing and no longer feel shamed by past policies. One of the most significant steps of our government was the introduction of emergency measures in the Northern Territory just last year to protect Aboriginal children from abuse in their own communities. Our government launched this drastic but decisive action after the release of the Little Children a Sacred Report to the Northern Territory Government. Like many here, I am a parent and particularly felt the repulsion caused by the revelations in that report. This is a most significant intervention. We must act to stop such abhorrent crimes against children in Indigenous communities and must establish the protection of the law. The measures in that intervention are worth noting. They were to increase police levels in prescribed townships, including secondments from other jurisdictions funded by the Australian government, introducing comprehensive voluntary health checks for all Aboriginal children, providing treatment and making referrals where necessary, improving governance by appointing managers of all government business in prescribed townships, widespread alcohol restrictions, banning the possession of X-rated pornography and introducing audits of publicly funded computers to identify illegal material, welfare reforms to stem the flow of cash going towards substance abuse and gambling, and to ensure funds meant to be for children's welfare are used for that purpose, enforcing school attendance, improving housing in townships through increased funding and introduction of market-based rents and tenancy arrangements. They are a very comprehensive set of interventions and they were initiated by, initiated by our government in its single-minded pursuit of ensuring that Indigenous children no longer suffer abuse of any description. And that's why the Northern Territory intervention launched by John Howard is just so important. We do need to ensure that children in these communities can grow up without fear and grow up to reach their full potential. The intervention in the Northern Territory, I think, has also been pivotal in focusing the public's attention on the plight of Indigenous communities, and particularly of their children. And this intervention, its aims, its early successes, have helped bring us, the Coalition, and I think the Parliament and the Nation, to where we are today. And of course it raises broader questions about a community. Every one of us is and must be concerned about child abuse in every Australian community. And we need to ensure that all jurisdictions continue to work together to counter child abuse. I was a part of a government that may not have proposed a formal apology, but did make sure that our Indigenous communities received assistance when and where they needed it most. If there was any failure on our part, it was in relation to the significance of symbolism in helping our Indigenous communities to move forward. We were unashamedly focused on practical outcomes, but we can now acknowledge that that was at the expense of important symbolic acts. The transition to support an apology for us and I think the people we represent has been a gradual process, but the report to the Northern Territory Government, that Little Children a Sacred Report, was yet another wake-up call that I think did capture the attention of our population. The fact that such horrific abuse of children could be so prevalent today required that intervention and it did require the nation's attention. There is, as Senator Evans has rightly said, so much more to be done. And I do hope this debate focuses the new government on ensuring funding to Indigenous communities is well managed and does deliver the results we all want. It is vitally important that the new government presses ahead with the measures adopted by the emergency intervention and doesn't just rest with the symbolism, important as it is, of today. We do accept that the lack of a formal apology from the federal government has been an impediment to better relations between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. The Coalition now recognises that this apology is very important to Indigenous Australians and that the Parliament should adopt this motion in the interests of enhancing their hopes, their aspirations and their opportunities. But as important as this motion may be, 
our parliaments and governments must remain focused on delivering real results on the ground for disadvantaged Indigenous Australians. We can only do that by maximising their chances to take advantage of all the opportunities offered by this great country to lead a rich and rewarding life. So, Mr President, on behalf of Coalition Senators, I re-emphasise our commitment to our 1999 Statement of Regret, and I do now offer our support for the motion put by Senator Evans today as we apologise to all those Indigenous Australians affected by the policies of the past. Senator Scullion. And Mr President, uh, as, as I rise to speak to this motion, uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of, the, of this country and their ancestors uh, that this motion is being put. Uh, like many people uh, in this place, Mr President, uh, their life's journey has been very varied before they became a senator. I was very lucky before entering the, senator, the Senate as a senator for the Northern Territory uh, to be engaged as both a commercial fisherman and a professional shooter. And as part of that process, I was uh, very privileged to work alongside Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. Uh, not only working alongside them, but uh, living together as a family and often playing together. Um, as, as we worked together, many of these circumstances were fairly remote circumstances, so I had the opportunity at night where there's no television, normally around a fire, uh, for, many, for often many months at a time. And there's a two or three hours where we had an opportunity as the fire was dying down to just simply discuss things. That's all we had. And as people do, we discussed each other's life experiences. And uh, I had the great privilege to hear. Uh, are very different stories. Many people where I worked in Arnhem Land in particular, um, uh, the people were, have not been dispossessed. They had always had their own country. They always had connection to country. But there were also, also there were many people who had uh, been, were part of the Stolen Generation, uh, had been dispossessed, and many of them had a variety of views about, uh, about uh, a number of issues, but particularly an apology. And I have to say uh, that I have uh, been an apology cynic through much of that time, and as mates we had pretty robust discussions about uh, the practical applications of an apology and how that would have an effect on, on their lives. And I think it's important that I make that confession. Uh, I also had an, an opportunity last year to speak, uh, Mr President, uh, with a group of over 100 Indigenous men who were part of the Attorney-General's uh, leadership group, and there was a, an older group of men and a younger group of men. We met in, uh, in, in one of the, uh, the rooms in Parliament, and they'd asked me to give them a, uh, a presentation on my leadership journey. And as a pragmatist, I said, "Look, uh, you're not going to get often to get a pretty frank and forthright discussion with Chatham House rules with a minister in government. You should possibly spend more of your time discuss having a crack at that." And of course, it wasn't long into the conversation, and someone said, "Well." If you were the Prime Minister, Nigel, unlikely though it would ever be, would you, uh, would you say sorry? And uh, to declare myself as a cynic, and I said no. And I went through, and we had this discussion that, uh, as a pragmatist, I didn't really understand how it would help. We went through these processes, and it was a bit of a distraction. Now, thanks to a long term relationship with many people in that room and discussions we had after that, um, a number of people were able to convince me by their own stories of just how important this was. And though whilst it wasn't a practical step, um, the way that people felt, and it is so difficult, I believe now through this experience, to put yourselves in the feet of others, in the shoes of others. And uh, through, that, through that process, I have to say that uh, recognition of the past practices and the harm and the hurt uh, that have happened to many Indigenous people need to be acknowledged and we need to say sorry. The exact number of uh, children that have been involved and the exact number of people bearing internal wounds as a result of the removal under past government policies and practice may never be known, Mr President, and nor may the true number of people that shared that pain through not knowing their ancestral history or the fate of other family members. What I do know is that it is very important that we acknowledge the pain and suffering that resulted from those policies, and for that I say sorry. I'm also sincerely sorry that any individual or family has suffered through past government policies and practices, however well-intentioned or otherwise they may have been seen at the time by that government. I must also acknowledge that not all past Indigenous policies and practices of past and current governments of all persuasions have necessarily failed. And I would again cite the intervention, whilst it was fairly controversial. Uh, I think there are elements that everybody would agree that are very important policies. Uh, that uh, 
will be very positive to Indigenous communities. And I think there are positive aspects of policies in the past that we need, we need to look to uh, for the future. I think it's really important that uh, we learn from the past that we never repeat the failures and we must also, as I've said, learn from the positive aspects in, in, in regard to any future policies. I view today's significant motion as a very important acknowledgement and acceptance of previous actions and as a sincere apology to those personally who have suffered. Today's debate is a further step towards our collective better future and I believe should signal an end to the focus on the past and a step towards a new future. From here we must continue to move forward and it's so important that we move to forward together. And as the third president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson, said, I like the dreams of the future better than the history of the past. The policies of removing children from their families ended about 25 years ago. But I think it is so important, Mr President, that we recognise, unfortunately, and we acknowledge, unfortunately, that the rate at which Aboriginal children are now being removed from their families by welfare authorities has actually increased since then. And it and it's also should be acknowledged that the way in which they're removed is far better, and we've managed to ameliorate that. We've got a lot better communication. Normally, the time that they're removed is they are being removed uh, for a period of time until the environment they've been taken from has been, has been restored. But if you're going to be uh, fair dinkum uh, about this uh, apology and about this debate, um, I would hope that people don't take this as an assault against anyone or shouldn't really tarnish our, our, our future endeavours. And that's certainly not my intention here today. But unless we're honest with ourselves and accept the realities that many Indigenous communities still find themselves in, um, then I, I, I don't think we can move forward in a way that we should. Indigenous health, Indigenous education, social opportunity, uh, employment opportunity still lag so far behind what is experienced and expected by many other Australians. The exposure to and uh, actual neglect and abuse is still far more prevalent in Indigenous communities than with other sectors of our community. These are real issues that confront not only, other, not only Indigenous uh, uh, in Australians but all Australians. Now, we must acknowledge these facts in order to address the underlying issues that have led to the present reality confronting many Indigenous people today. And I think we also need to acknowledge the policies that are happening today are having a similar effect to the policies of the past. And I would cite uh, the need to acknowledge that the contribution of unconditional welfare has had to the cycle of substance abuse and poverty in many of the Indigenous communities we have today. And I think if we fail from today to develop and implement effective policies that look very carefully at the past and, in fact, failures of the present, then I feel that some stage in the future there will be another generation of Australians apologising for our failures. Now, my vision for Australia is to have a nation where everyone is encouraged to add to our richness and collective cultural wealth while being unified as a single proud nation, sharing equally in the opportunities that this wonderful country has to offer. We are never going to achieve anything close to this vision if we refuse to accept that there are serious problems that are still present within some of our Indigenous communities. These problems will never be resolved without first accepting that they exist. We can no longer deny the problem simply because we don't see them. And as we move around through our daily lives, we only read about them. They are real and that they exist, and they deserve to be dealt with immediately. To do, if we deny that this is happening, we we'll deny a future for the next generation of, of, of children, and this is totally unacceptable. Today's apology is recognition of the past and acceptance of the outcomes that resulted from those policies. More importantly, today's apology must constitute a significant step towards the future. Our rhetoric of today must be matched by all of our actions of tomorrow. Only then will we truly have a stake in our collective future. I and the Nationals are fully committed to doing everything that we can to make our future a brighter one for all Australians. Senator Allison. Mr President, I begin by acknowledging country and the Indigenous peoples of this land, particularly those who are here with us today. I congratulate the government on arranging yesterday's long overdue welcome to country for the opening of parliament and I thank Matilda House for her deeply moving words and the Indigenous dancers and performers for their deadly performance. 
I acknowledge the patient but persistent efforts of our colleague, former Democrat Senator Aidan Ridgway, uh, for welcome to country to be included in the ceremonies that mark events such as the opening of parliament. And I think it's a great shame that we are having this debate without a contribution from an Indigenous member of parliament or senator in this place. My colleagues and I, without reservation, join the Rudd federal government in offering an official Australian parliament apology to those Indigenous Australians who were taken from their mothers, their fathers, their siblings, their communities and their land, and placed in institutions and in the charge of complete strangers. We are sorry for the lifetime of damage that this did to them and to their families. We are sorry for the ongoing damage that this causes to Indigenous communities, and we are sorry that the principle of self-determination was so completely denied by this and other acts of political, cultural, economic and physical domination by our forebears. We say sorry for the ignorance and the prejudice and the misguided attempts to improve the uh, opportunities and lives of in Indigenous children that gave rise to more than 60 years, three generations of people dispossessed of their kin and their dignity. The precise numbers are not known, but from 1910 to 1970, between one in three and one in ten Indigenous children were taken. We are sorry that the removal of children was so often brutal. They put us in the police ute and said they were taking us to Broome. They put, in, put the mums in there as well, but when we'd gone about 10 miles, they stopped and threw the mothers out of the car. We jumped on our mothers' backs, crying, trying not to be left behind, but the policeman pulled us off and threw us back in the car. They pushed the mothers away and drove off while our mothers were chasing the car, running and crying after us. We were screaming in the back of that car. We are sorry that Aboriginal children and their parents were deliberately kept apart and denied the truth of their heritage. I remember this woman saying to me, your mother's dead, you've got no mother now, that's why you're here with us. Then about two years after my mother and my mother's sister came uh, to the bungalow, but they weren't allowed to visit us because we were black. We say sorry that it took another 30 years after the child stealing stopped to ask Aboriginal Australians to tell us their story. And we are moved by the courage uh, shown by the stolen generations in doing so. We have read Bringing Them Home and to the extent to which this is humanly possible, we try to understand their pain. We acknowledge that to remove a baby, a small child, even an adolescent from its parents, whatever their circumstances, whatever their culture, is the cause of deep hurt, sorrow and grief to both parent and child. There was a time when white children were more readily taken away from their families than is the case now. However, it was mandatory for children of Aboriginal women and white fathers. Lots of kids do get taken away, but that's for a reason. Not like us. We just, we just got taken away because we were black kids. I suppose half-caste kids. If they wouldn't like it, they shouldn't do it to Aboriginal children. And they were lied, lied to um, so that the separation, as some prefer to call it, would have an awful, painful finality. Your family don't care about you anymore. They wouldn't, give you, they wouldn't have given you away. They don't love you. All they are are just dirty, drunken blacks. You heard this daily. We're sorry that many children were abused and exploited and emotionally, physically, educationally and culturally deprived in institutions and at the hands of some heartless men and women when the state held that they were being protected. I was sent out when I was 11 years old to a pastoral station. I worked there for seven and a half years, never got paid anything. I was best in the class. I came first in all subjects. I was 15 when I got into second year and I wanted to continue school but I wasn't allowed to because they didn't think I had the brains. So I was taken out of school and that's when I was sent out to farms just to do housework. Punishment was routine. Young men and women at Moore River Settlement constantly ran away. Not only were they separated from their families, but they were regimented and they were locked up like animals. They were locked in dormitory uh, after supper for the night. They were given severe punishments, including solitary confinements for minor um, misdeeds. 
Dormitory life was like living in hell. It was not a life. The only thing that sort of came out of it was how to work, how to be clean, you know, and hygiene, that sort of thing. But we got a lot of bashings. One in ten boys and three in ten girls report that they were sexually abused in foster placements. The probability is that most went unreported because those who did report were not believed. One in ten girls reported sexual abuse in the work placement organised by protection boards or institutions. The thing that hurts the most is that they didn't care about who they put us with. As long as it looked like they were doing their job, it just didn't matter. They put me with one family and the man of the house used to come down and use me whenever he wanted to. Being raped over and over again and there was no one I could turn to. They were supposed to look after me and protect me, but no one ever did. The New South Wales Protection Board recorded in 1940. It has been known for years that these unfortunate people are exploited. Girls of 12, 14 and 15 years of age have been hired out to stations and have become pregnant. So their children too were removed and with them often the responsibility of the men who sired them. The distinction between being stolen and being separated will be argued by some, and it's true that some were not forcibly removed. Some Aboriginal children removed, were removed because of neglect, but for the most part their circumstances were totally irrelevant. Some parents were coerced into giving up their children to institutions to avoid them being taken by force. Others were tricked into signing documents so that the official record will always be unreliable. Some hoped their children would be better off away from the poverty and the squalor. However, we now know that removed children were less likely to have a post-secondary uh, education, much less likely to have stable living conditions, less likely to be in a stable, confiding, uh, confiding relationship with a partner, twice as likely to be arrested by police and convicted of an offence, three times as likely to have been in jail and much more likely to have used illicit substances. The institutions that took Aboriginal children received only minimal funding and as a consequence they were constantly hungry and denied basic facilities and medical treatment. In any case, the objective of taking so-called half-caste children, whatever their circumstances, was clear and it was official. The policy in the earliest times of settlement was, and I quote, to inculcate European values and work habits in children who would then be employed in, in the service of colonial settlers. The theory by the late 19th century was that children of mixed descent would be merged and absorbed into white society and other indigenous people would be forced onto reserves and missions and over time they would die out. This generation of parliamentarians must make this apology because we are the ones who are confronted by the evidence. Many of us were here in the parliament in 1997 when the Human Rights and Equal Opportunities Commission presented its report and I want to acknowledge here the great work of the commission and particularly Sir Ronald Wilson who briefed us on those awful findings. We learned the depth of racial discrimination, the arbitrary deprivation of liberty, the pain and suffering, the abuse, the disruption of family life, the loss of cultural rights and fulfilment, the exploitation and the loss of opportunities. That report tells us, for the majority of witnesses to the inquiry, the effects have been multiple and profoundly disabling. Psychological and emotional damage renders many people less able to learn social skills and survival skills. Their ability to operate successfully in the world is impaired, causing low educational achievement and unemployment and consequent poverty. These in turn cause our own emotional distress, leading to some to leading, sorry, lead their own emotional distress, leading some to perpetrate violence, self-harm, substance abuse and antisocial behaviour. This apology must be official and it must come from the highest level and it needs to be heartfelt and heard by those who were hurt if it is to make a difference. Ten years were lost and yet more of the stolen generation died without hearing this, this apology. State and territory governments have apologised, churches have apologised. As Australian Democrats and as individuals we have said sorry, but saying sorry as members of our federal parliament matters more. I regret that it took 10 years and a change of government to say sorry. 
The Commission made 54 sets of recommendations, one of which was acknowledgement and apology from parliaments, from state and uh, territory police forces, from churches and other non-government organisations. This done, this done, we should move to the rest. The guarantees that there will be no repetition, the measures of restitution, uh, the measures of rehabilitation and money, monetary compensation. Mr Ted Lovett, a member of the Gunditjmara Nation and the Stolen Generation, uh, says, no apology to the Victorian Aboriginal community or to the members of the Stolen Generations could ever be adequate without compensation for what's been lost. Of all the things that were stolen, the loss of our country, language, culture, traditional law and family have been the most hurtful. The removal and dispersal of family members from our traditional lands and government policies that controlled our lives, even the relationships that we were allowed to enter into, have caused enormous pain for all of our people. As a boy, I was made a state ward in Victoria during the 1950s and late 1960s. I was put into Tirana Boys Home in Melbourne and then the Salvation Army Boys Home at Bayswater. During that time, I was subjected to inhumane and unjust treatment as if I was a criminal even though my only crime was to have been born into an Aboriginal family. I was subsequently prevented from being in their care. Up to this time, I had not committed even a minor offence of a criminal nature. We are sorry that incarceration for Indigenous youth has been, even recently, a mandatory first resort, and many lives and opportunities have been lost as a consequence. We are disappointed uh, that the Rudd government has so far rejected compensation. Um, however, we will not support Senator Brown's amendment today. An apology is a distinct action and uh, we consider that it should be uh, there to stand on its own. The Democrats have for many years called for compensation and have uh, legislation before the Senate that would achieve this. And I've learned, uh, anything, if I've learned anything in this place, it is that governments must be persuaded to change position and that a last-minute simplistic amendment won't do that. I also know that the more multi-partisan the debate and the vote on this motion is, the more complete and the more meaningful it will be to those for whom it was intended. What's so exciting about today is the fact that the coalition has reversed its long-held public opposition to making an apology, and I acknowledge the political courage that it takes to do that. I hope this change of heart and the consensus vote it delivers is uh, so much the sweeter and so much more healing to the stolen generations as a result. My commitment uh, during the short time that remains for us in the Senate is to push not only for compensation, eventually the government I think will see that this is uh, the right course of action, uh, after all Tasmania and WA have done that, but for a truly collaborative all-party effort to solve the problems that give rise to such serious disadvantage to Indigenous Australians. Reparation must include family reunion, collecting and communicating the oral histories and the experiences of the stolen generation. We need properly funded, long-term, soundly based goals and strategies to tackle drug and alcohol dependence, incarceration and deaths in custody, child mortality and poor levels of education, health and economic endeavour. And Indigenous Australians should get a better deal for what they've given up. The housing crisis. Uh, would be solved if profits and royalties from mining operations alone were more, f more fairly shared with the traditional owners of the land. And we must all listen intently, carefully and respectfully, or the strategies will be totally worthless and the money again wasted. Forcing a baby from the arms of its indigenous mother because white people know what's best for that child proved very stupid and very wrong. It was a sorry business, and we say sorry. Senator Bob Brown. Thank you, uh, President. I, I begin uh, on behalf of the Australian Greens by recognising the first Australians, the traditional owners, right across this great country of ours. And I congratulate the Rudd government both for yesterday's affording of the welcome to country and thank the Indigenous people for that welcome and uh, the government for providing this important moment in our nation's history. 
Now, the Greens wholeheartedly support this motion. Were it the Greens, we would have representatives of the stolen generations with us here on the central floor of this Senate to receive our apologies and to respond, because that in human terms how, is how apologies should be and that's how they work best. When I was a little boy, my loving but somewhat exasperated mother, wanting to let me know that she was a human being with her own limits, once told me she would go away and leave me if I didn't behave. And she closed the door. Well, of course, she didn't go. And she lived to 73 and was the mother I adored. Yet that shock of worn separation is seared into my mind here at 63. I can't express my debt to her and my father. What then if at that dreadful moment she had in fact gone? Or worse, complete strangers had arrived as if from Mars and taken her from me, or me from her. My life would have been taken too, and I certainly would not be standing here in the Senate today. But now I stand here in the Senate and with the parliament as a whole, look back in horror at the fact that thousands of other little girls and boys were in fact taken from their mothers and their fathers. Not by strangers from Mars, but by Australian governments. Thousands of mothers and fathers, because they were Aboriginal, because they were black, and therefore not understood or valued by the perpetrators, had their little boys and girls, many just babies, taken from them by strangers in the name of our nation. It doesn't matter what the reason was, personal or official. Governments not only allowed but directed this racist separation of the innocent indigenous infants from their powerless numberless parents in unaccountable fear and agony, an agony that would not, for all of life, let go its grip. Today in this Parliament of Australia, we acknowledge that heart-wrenching wrong of the stolen generations. We express our sorrow, unencumbered by attempts to excuse or rationalise such behaviour. This nation let its authorities trespass against a fundamental law of nature, that every child deserves and must have the love of parents who have love to give, and that no parent who loves a child should have that love denied. We know the facts. We try to understand the pain. And we reach out not just for forgiveness, but towards whatever restitution there can now be given to those who suffered and are suffering so much. And in reaching out, all of us may rest a little better in the name of humanity and in the name of our nation, Australia. We Greens welcome this day in Australia's parliament, but we urge the government to logically move from sorrow through to just and fair compensation. To be sure, no government cheque will ever make up for the dispossession of Indigenous Australians taken from their parents, just as no compensation ever makes up for an eye lost in an accident or even a job lost in a corporate collapse. Yet logic and compassion make it clear that the national parliament should now move and move speedily to compensate the stolen generations just as the Tasmanian Parliament, with the Labor and Liberal and Greens parties working together, did last year. President, I move the foreshadowed amendment to the tenth sentence of the government's national apology motion, so that that sentence now reads, we, the Parliament of Australia, commit to offering just compensation to all those who suffered loss 
and respectfully request that this apology be received in the spirit in which it is offered as part of the healing of the nation. This is not a last minute amendment. This amendment came as a first minute response to uh, this great motion and a logical follow through down the road we must take as a nation towards reconciliation. We Greens advocate to the Rudd government that all of the 54 recommendations of the Bringing Them Home inquiry should be implemented. The report's recommendations on monetary reparations are critical to re redressing the terrible wrongs of, to quote from this motion, the blemish chapter of our history. In particular, that re report recommended to this parliament that appropriate reparations, including monetary reparations, be made in recognition of the history of gross violations of human rights. That reparation be made to all who suffered because of forcible removal policies, including those who were forcibly removed as children, their family members, their communities and their descendants, who as a result have been deprived of community ties of culture and language and links with and entitlements to their traditional lands. That the Council of Australian Governments establish a, national, a joint national compensation fund managed by a board chaired by an Indigenous person and made up of both Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. President, I commend this amendment to the Senate, to all parties in the Senate, because it incorporates the, the essential practical component to this historic gesture we are making here today. It moves us closer to a nation reconciled between the first Australians and all other Australians. That the 97 per cent majority of us who have come or whose forefathers and mothers came to these shores since 1797. 1787. That reconciliation, President, requires that all the people understand the history of dispossession of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Australians from their land. These were acts of consideration by the colonial there were acts of consideration by the colonialists, but they were too few. Australia's true history reveals that through the ravages of European disease, official and unofficial military or vigilante operations, and even poisoning of food and water holes, the first peoples of this continent were cruelly decimated along with their cultures and their languages. That history has not yet been put in full reverse, but we are challenged to reverse it as best we can. Former Prime Minister John Howard rejected what he called the black armband version of Australia's history and put on blinkers instead. But he could not in the end defy the truth or the more mature aspiration of Australians as a whole to honestly fa face the past and to deal with it. So as the sun set on his government, he lit some candles of reconciliation by calling for acknowledgement of Indigenous Australians at the head of our constitution and by moving however crudely unprecedented resources into addressing the plight of Aborigines in the Northern Territory. Like the Australian Greens now, the new government of Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, in consultation with First Australians, is committed to pursuing constitutional change and undertaking the work of ending the broad-scale disadvantages which First Australians still suffer. We Greens are committed to accelerating that course of action. President saying sorry is a step along the road to true reconciliation and recognition of the original sovereignty of Aboriginal and Torres Strait peoples in Australia. In 1997 in this Senate, as my Greens colleague uh, Senator Milne was <coughs> with the a Liberal government and Labor opposition of the day bringing Indigenous people onto the floor of the Tasmanian parliament 
to receive and respond to an apology. I rise in this Senate to say sorry to the stolen generations on behalf of the Australian Greens. Here, a decade later, I congratulate the new Rudd Labor government for giving the nation this day when sorry is truly said by all of us. We all understand that the dispossession and cruelty of the past cannot go away, but that this simple act of heartfelt sorrow is an essential step to heal our nation's history and to help, therefore, ensure that Australia's future will be safer, securer, fairer and happier for all of us. So at last, in 2008, this nation says to its first Australians, we are sorry. Now, Mr President, from sorrow, let us move to fair and just reparation to the stolen generations for the betterment of all Australians. Senator Fielding. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Today, Australia's parliament will deliver a long overdue apology to Australia's Indigenous people. It will be an historic and emotional day for many who have waited a long time to hear these words. Saying sorry shouldn't be so hard. In families, just like any relationship, we know that we should be quick to say sorry when we do something wrong and mend any hurt we have caused. It is not about blame. It is about genuinely being sorry that the other person has been hurt and even if that action or that hurt was unintentional. Every parent knows and understands the importance of teaching our children to say sorry when something goes wrong. There is no doubt that something has gone wrong for the children and families of the stolen generations. But what exactly do we mean by this term, the stolen generations? I think many Australians may not understand the wrong that was done to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island children. That it was Australian government official policy from the mid-1800s right through to the 1970s to remove children from their parents in order to assimilate the Indigenous population to the wider community. Family First does not believe that Australian governments 50 years ago or even 100 years ago intended harm to any child or family. These governments and authorities acted in a manner that they thought was right at the time and in the best interest of the children involved. But removing children from their parents just because they were Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders' children, not on genuine welfare grounds, was wrong. The parents were hurt. The children got hurt. A report found that many of the children taken from their families fell victim to physical and sexual abuse. They got hurt, and everybody should be sorry, very sorry, for the hurt caused to these children. We should show compassion and empathy. These children are now adults, while many others have passed on. But the unresolved hurt continues in them and their families and their communities. Unresolved, unacknowledged hurt in any family or relationship just festers and never really goes away. We wouldn't wait to say sorry if this was our family. We'd want to fix the rift and restore the relationship. When we don't resolve past hurts, we find that resentment builds and there really is little possibility of an ongoing healthy relationship. However, sorry often seems to be the hardest word to say, yet it is one of the most important words in any family, marriage or relationship. Saying sorry allows our kids and us as parents to move past our mistakes and our failures. Saying sorry is a part of life because we all do and say things at times we shouldn't. Sometimes on purpose, sometimes out of ignorance or out of carelessness, hurts are made. But we need to fix 
and we need forgiveness. There is responsibility on both parties here. And it's no different in the relationship between the Australian government and the indigenous order. people. Senator Fielding, order for a minute. There is far too many people uh, walking around the chamber in audible conversations. Senator Fielding deserves to be heard in silence. Senator Fielding. Thank you. That's no different in the relationships between the Australian government and indigenous people, which was torn apart by the government's policy to remove indigenous children from their parents, their families and their communities. In our family, we also teach that when someone says sorry, they must also ask for forgiveness. Sometimes we can say sorry as a throwaway line just to get us off the hook. But my wife Sue and I have taught our kids that a proper apology comes with the words, I'm sorry, please will you forgive me? The child who has had been hurt, even in an unattended situation, then feels their hurt has been acknowledged and also importantly they are part of the healing by actively forgiving their brother or sister. We reckon that saying sorry and being forgiven go hand in hand. Relationships get restored, friendships are mended and fences are rebuilt. As I said before, sorry can be the hardest word to say but forgiving can be the hardest thing to do. Forgiveness is not an easy thing. As a nation today, we are sincerely sorry for the great hurt and pain caused, and we admit the Australian governments have treated Indigenous Australians badly. In turn, I hope Indigenous Australians can open to a process of forgiveness. Forgiveness doesn't mean condoning what happened. We can't change the past, but we can forgive it. There are real positive effects from letting go of the hurt by forgiving. It enables all of us to move forward. Most importantly, forgiving makes room for hope. Hope for the future. Hope for a better life for the kids. Hope for a united Australia. As a nation, we need to help the process of forgiveness by really committing to deal with the complex and long-standing problems facing the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community. We need to close the 17-year life expectancy gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous children. Who can hope for a future without knowing your kids will get good schooling and decent health care? It is a scandal that Indigenous Australians are so far behind other Australians with the standard of education and health care provided to them and the outcomes from those key services. The big task for government is to make sure that schooling, health, other services are provided at an equal uh, level to the broader Australian community and the challenge for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people is to make the most of those opportunities. Family First agrees the Australian Parliament should say sorry for the past. I hope the children and families that have been hurt can accept that apology and forgive us. The debt must finally be cancelled so we can all move on together and build a united family of Australians. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator Bob Brown be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator Bob Brown be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair, and I appoint Senator Seawitt, teller for the ayes, and Senator Weber, teller for the noes. Order. As a result of the division, there being four ayes and 65 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I now put the question that the motion moved by Senator Evans be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it.
Clark. Government business notice of motion number six for a motion to take note of the national apology. Minister. Uh, thank you. I move the motion uh, as circulated in the chamber. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to limit the time in today's debate to 10 minutes per speaker. With the concurrence of the Senate, I ask the clerks to set the, cl the clock accordingly. And I should move the motion before I lay I'll call you, Senator, Senator Kirk. So, um, I'm, I've been told it's OK. So, uh, Senator Ludwig. Senator Ludwig. Thank you. Uh, I do uh, seek your indulgence. One, uh, one of the matters that I think it's worthwhile putting down is that I do thank the Senate for agreeing to the way the debate proceeded today. It is important to have the Senate uh, support the process that has been undertaken today. We have uh, This motion does give the Senate the ability to speak on the national apology to the stolen generations. What this motion ensures is that today, from both houses of parliament, the stolen generations receive an apology. And I do thank the Senate for that, for the procedures to ensure that people can speak on the debate today. It is the right thing to do to have the motion moved and passed today from both the House and the Senate. The Australian people do want this parliament to collectively apologise. Senators wanting to speak on this motion, like myself, will be able to do so and ensure that the time uh, will be available for those persons to be able to speak on the debate. Now, to prevent myself from falling into the difficulty of having to speak twice on the motion, I was going to take the opportunity, and I do uh, thank Senator Kirk for allowing me to undertake this today, but I did want to ensure that the motion uh, did receive its proper place and being able to debate it today in respect of this issue. It is with a great privilege that I speak in this chamber on this historic day when the Australian government and the Australian parliament formally apologises to stolen generations and to Indigenous Australians for the wrongs of the past, for the pain and suffering that past policies brought to Indigenous Australians, sorry for the forced separation of children from their families and communities, sorry for the indignity and harm that this brought to those forcibly taken and to those left behind to grieve. I do not pretend to understand the pain and suffering inflicted on tens of thousands of Indigenous Australians who were forcibly removed from their families, their communities and their culture. I do not pretend to know the pain of those who were forced to live their lives in these unjustified, unjustifiable circumstances. But as a parent, I do know the importance of the family and living a life filled with love and support within that family. And I'm proud that the Australian Parliament is now apologising for the forced separation of an Indigenous families and the significant and ongoing challenges that have resulted. For those individuals, families and communities affected by these past policies, I can only commend the apology articulated by the Prime Minister this morning. I add my voice to that genuine and unreserved apology and the nature of reconciliation in which it is offered. The apology today provides a unique opportunity for the Australian people and the Australian government to move forward with a sense of common purpose. The parliament should not allow this moment to pass as a missed opportunity. The importance of today needs to be backed up, of course, with meaningful, practical and effective action from the government. The department for which I am responsible, the Department of Human Services, can participate in a very real way in addressing the practical challenges still facing our community. The department can play an important role as the key service provider in the national effort to address the serious issues still facing many Indigenous communities. I would like to take a moment to commend the hard work and genuine effort of staff members of Centrelink and the Department of Human Services. They are dedicated public servants who are tasked with the frontline effort to work with Indigenous communities to address the serious challenges we still face. I hope that today's apology can help the Department to further our mutual respect for Indigenous Australians. Mr. Pro Mr. Uh, Acting Deputy President, this is an important day for the Australian Parliament, and it is an important step 
that we have taken today. It has been a long, hard road to get here, and there is more work to be done. Let us work together in the spirit of reconciliation and mutual respect to meet the challenges that continue to face our community. Let us harness the great spirit of today to work for real improvement in the lives and conditions of Indigenous Australians. We owe it to those who have suffered in the past. We owe nothing less to the generations to come. Thank you, Senator Ludwig. Senator Kirk. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak in support of the National Apology to the Stolen Generation, delivered uh, this morning by the Prime Minister in the House of Representatives and moved in this place by the Leader of the Government in the Senate. Today, as the Australian Parliament acknowledges the past mistreatment of Indigenous Australians and in particular offers a formal apology to members of the Stolen Generation, their descendants and families, we formally recognise, reflect and acknowledge the experiences and repercussions that past policies and laws have had on these people, the first Australians. In particular, today we recognise the many thousands of Indigenous children who were forcibly removed from their families, communities and countries, country during the mid-1800s right through to 1970, and we say to them that we are deeply sorry. These children, known to us now as members of the Stolen Generation, taken from their families, often solely on the basis of race, and placed into institutional care or with non-Indigenous families, have suffered profound grief and loss. In the words of former Prime Minister Keating, and I quote, we failed to see what we were doing degraded all of us. Madam Acting Deputy President, we now know and today acknowledge that for many this practice inflicted profound grief, suffering and loss on these our fellow Australians and for this we the Australian Parliament are sorry. The apology given today is offered in recognition of and in response to the policies, laws and decisions of past parliaments and governments. Whilst it does not attribute guilt to the current generation of Australian people, in the words of former Labor Prime Minister Paul Keating in his Redfern speech in 1992, and I quote, we simply cannot sweep injustice aside, even if our own conscience allowed us to, end quote. The word sorry, as I understand it, holds a special me meaning in Indigenous culture in that it is used to describe rituals regarding death known as sorry business. In this sense, it is used to express empathy, sympathy, compassion and understanding as opposed to responsibility, guilt or liability. It is my hope, Madam Acting Deputy President, that today's apology acts as a powerful symbol to restore respect to Indigenous Australians, not only on a personal level but also in sending a message to the rest of the country and to the world that Indigenous Australians and Indigenous culture is valued in this country. Removing children from their families on the basis solely of race and attempting to assimilate them with uh, with children of mixed ancestry into the indigenous non-indigenous community has impacted the lives of many indigenous Australians. Not only did children have to contend with the great loss of being removed from their parents, they also lost their connection with their extended family, their traditional land, culture and language. In many cases, as we have now learned, Indigenous children were placed in vulnerable situations at risk of physical, emotional and sexual abuse. We now understand that the experience of many of the children who were forcibly removed from their families has had long-term disabling consequences. Madam Acting Deputy President, I wish to bring to the attention um, the example of one South Australian woman, someone from my home state, and uh, she is the late Doris Cartaneri. Uh, she was a, a woman who was uh, forcibly removed from her parents when she was just four weeks old. Her mother passed away and the United Aborigines Mission came and took her from her father and her siblings in Port Maclay to be raised at the Colebrook home in Eden Hills in, uh, in a suburb of Adelaide. Colebrook housed a number of Aboriginal children, including the former chair uh, of ATSIC, uh, known to many, uh, Loitcha O'Donoghue. The children were given a strict religious upbringing in the home which was run by the United Aborigines Mission. 
In a book that uh, Doris published um, entitled Kick the Kin, Kick the Tin, she wrote about her experiences, about um, her coming to terms with what it meant to be a stolen child. She said, and I quote, the saddest thing is that I really didn't have a mum or family to guide me, end quote. In a poem written by her, expressing her feelings, she wrote, walking through a blue dream, reality calls, but it's not what it seems. Living while the subconscious screams, living to find out what it all means. Doris was a brave ambassador and campaigner for members of the stolen generation. Through her openness and candour about her experiences, I'm sorry that she is not here with us today to hear this national apology, um, which would have meant so much to her. To those who grew up at Colebrook in South Australia and to the many thousands of Indigenous Australians who had similar experiences to uh, Doris across this country, we, the Australian Parliament, say sorry. The Bringing Them Home report, which reported on the National Inquiry into the separation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children from their families, uh, was tabled in this parliament in 1997. The committee, of course, was chaired by the late Sir Ronald Wilson, and the report brought to the forefront of the national conscience the impact which past governments' policies and laws had on Indigenous Australians. In particular, the report brought to our attention that nationally between one in three and one in ten Indigenous children were forcibly removed from their families during the period that I referred to earlier. It's been 11 years since the Bringing Them Home report uh, has been tabled, and during this time all state and territory governments have apologised to the stolen generation. But of course, Madam Acting Deputy President, as we know, unfortunately this parliament has never given a formal apology. The um, Howard government uh, offered an expression of deep and sincere regret in a motion of reconciliation in, in 1999, but there has never been a full formal apology until today. I wanted to make just brief mention of Labor's track record in this area, Madam Acting Deputy President, and um, beginning with my state of South Australia. When um, Labor came to office in South Australia in 1965, the then Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, uh, Mr Dunstan, introduced three pieces of legislation which granted greater autonomy to Indigenous people. Most significant of these was the introduction of the Land Trust Bill, which was the first step by any Australian state government to grant Aboriginal title to land. In 1972, when Labor was elected to government at the federal level, Prime Minister uh, Whitlam set about altering Australia's treatment of Indigenous people through a raft of positive and progressive policy initiatives. The most notable of these was when the Prime Minister granted 2,000 square metres of tribal land back to the Garaninji people. So, Madam Matching Deputy President, I am proud today to be a member of the Rudd Labor government, which has initiated and negotiated today's apology with Indigenous people. I fondly refer to the inspirational speech of former Labor Prime Minister Paul Keating uh, at the launch of Australia's celebration of the 1993 International Year of the World's Indigenous People. This speech is commonly known as the Redfern speech. He made the point, and I quote, that the fundamental test of our social goals and our national will, our ability to say to ourselves and the rest of the world that Australia is a first-rate social democracy, rests in how we treat and care for our Indigenous people. I hope, Madam Acting Deputy President, that this apology represents a significant step along the road to reconciliation with Indigenous Australians. It is offered with sincerity, sympathy, compassion, hope and now a greater sense of understanding. Whilst we understand that reconciliation is a journey that remains incomplete, we are keen for the opportunity to build a new relationship with Indigenous Australians and to work together in particular to close the 17-year life expectancy gap between non-Indigenous and Indigenous Australians by maintaining long-term action and support in the areas of health, education, housing and employment. 
Madam Acting De Deputy President, I look forward to closing this dark chapter in Australian history and look forward to working together with Indigenous people for a brighter future. Thank you, Senator. Senator Levitz. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting uh, Deputy President. Today I join with others in supporting the motion moved by the Leader of the Government. The purpose of the motion is to say sorry to Indigenous Australians for past misdeeds and apology. It is to advance reconciliation. Laudable, worthy and noble objectives, deserving the support of every senator in this chamber. Previously, this parliament has resolved a similar sentiment in its expression of regret in 1999. The dislocation white settlement had on our Indigenous brothers and sisters is hard to imagine. The differences were phenomenal, be it in traditions, beliefs, technology, resistance to certain diseases and tolerance to alcohol, to name a few. Another is the understanding, or should I say, lack of understanding in how our Indigenous population operated in the sense of a genuine extended family in the nurture of children, which was often misunderstood as child neglect. I commend the statesmanlike speech of the alternative Prime Minister, Dr Nelson, delivered earlier today. Sincere, genuine and visionary. In 1996, I had the honour and privilege to serve as the chair of this parliament's native title committee seeing firsthand the unacceptable disadvantage of our Indigenous communities, visiting them from Kubapedi to Kananara to the Torres Straits to my home state of Tasmania. In discussing native title, in discussing apologies, a number of themes did emerge. One was the Indigenous community's understandable desire to enjoy mainstream health and wealth, something which Native Title promised to deliver. Another was the need for local leadership and responsibility. The difference between communities only half an hour drive apart was something, were sometimes very stark, the differences being in the local leadership. The other was the scourge of white lawyers inflicting their ideology in the name of looking after the Indigenous communities. Not surprisingly, Indigenous aspirations are largely the same as ours. They want a house, they want good health, they want a car, they want security and a future for their children. And so when former Labor Senator Graeme Richardson promised all Indigenous communities flowing water, it was welcomed. That practical help, if carried out, would have been a massive step forward, as is the intervention in the Northern Territory, restoring law and order and protecting women and children. But in the groupthink we currently have, it seems you are socially aware to be angry about not apologising for past deeds whilst condemning those who feel anger about the abuse and misdeeds that currently occur within these communities. I suspect children in danger of being raped would prefer protection to an apology. I trust, I trust we will have both. We can have both and we must have both, the practical and the symbolic. I don't mind admitting that I am more of a practical person or a person in support of substance over the symbolic. But I accept symbolism is important and it's a journey that I have travelled and accepted. Words of apology are important circuit breakers. If accepted and acknowledged with a reciprocation of forgiveness. Apologies will not provide the healing unless the words are accepted and forgiveness is reciprocated. 
In my home state of Tasmania, there was an official apology a decade ago, followed by compensation. Regrettably, I don't detect any change. Indeed, the same activists who called for the apology and, con and compensation condoned the burning of the Australian flag just a few weeks ago. I hope today's apology does not travel the same path. We need to recognise that many Australians are questioning of today's apology. Are they all mean-spirited? Absolutely not. Similarly, not all those advocating an apology are politically cor correct flunkies. Both views come from genuine, sincere Australians. But I must say the Prime Minister's approach is causing some division and cynicism. The, ref the refusal by the Prime Minister to share the wording with the Australian people until a few hours ago suggests other imperatives were at work, as is his absolute refusal to share the legal advice on the issue of compensation. Sure, the Prime Minister had the media, the audience, the screens, might I add that only showed Mr Rudd, and even the day and hour finally choreographed. But he had all that done before he even had the words in place. And then the parliament was denied the opportunity to fully discuss the issue to keep the self-promotion timetable for the Prime Minister. This is an issue which was developed over 10 years ago and is now brought into this place with indecent haste and lack of consultation and breach of accepted parliamentary practices. We have had the vote before the debate finished. That's fine if you are into the slick media timetable, but not so if you are truly genuine about bringing as many Australians as possible with you. The apology, I believe, has been demeaned as a result. Indeed, the Russian lack of consultation is highlighted by the reported bungle over which group were the traditional owners for the purposes of yesterday's delightful welcome to country and the different representatives for today's activities. I can understand the cynicism of many in the community. I also understand the doubts by many over the term stolen generation. As someone who's read the report cover to cover, including its appendices, and discussing some misgivings I have with one of the authors, Sir Ronald Wilson, in my office, can I say I empathise with those doubts. To assert that people who took vows of poverty and devoted their life's work to serving the Aboriginal community were complicit in genocide is unsustainable and even offensive, even more so after the findings in the Gunner and Cabillo cases. I understand how people feel when a person gets compensation because of their race for being stolen by welfare authorities when mother was doing time in jail for neglect of children, but we don't compensate capable, loving, young unmarried mothers who were defrauded by the same welfare authorities by being told their child had died at birth and given empty coffins to bury. It seems we're allowed to feel sorry for the first, but not the second. I admit when you hear the Labor member for Bass pronounce the apology as a first step and then laugh hysterically when asked what the next step might be, shows the shallowness of some. To all those people that have those doubts, see any inequity or express cynicism, I simply say this. I understand those reservations, but nevertheless I plead with you to give this apology a go. Many have asked for it for many years. Many say it will make a material difference for a group in our society that have been undeniably mistreated. So why not give it a go? Time is running short. Very short. Some time ago, a group of Christian Aboriginal women that I shared with apologised for their hatred of the white people. Racism in this country has been a two-way street, but I think most of the traffic's been on the white side. But if these Aboriginal women had the 
had found it within themselves to seek forgiveness from the white community, why can we not find it within ourselves to also offer an apology for past misdeeds? That's what this apology is about. That is why I fully support it, and I trust that reconciliation will be enhanced as a result of this Senator, unanimous decision of this place. Thank you, Senator. Senator Seward. Thank you, um, Madam, uh, uh, Madam Acting Deputy Chair. I acknowledge the traditional owners, the Ngunnawal, of the land in which we meet. I pay respect to their elders, their culture and their law. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Adnan, I also wish to acknowledge all the people who have come to Canberra for this week from all over this country to, as this issue is being discussed in Parliament. People from the Kimberleys, Alice Springs, from New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, Tasmania and Queensland. And to, to, to the new Rudd government, I say thank you for this day. It has been so important to so many people. I was very pleased to finally hear an Australian Prime Minister say sorry on behalf of the parliament and his government. It means a great deal to many, many Australians. I'd also like to say thank you for the opening of the 42nd parliament yesterday with the magnificent welcome to country. I'm sure every member of parliament, our member of the House of Representatives and the Senate today saw all the people that were streaming up to this place to either bear witness and look and take part in the ceremony, either on the lawns or in the Great Hall, or went to all the places around Australia where the, the apology was being televised. In my home state of Western Australia, I understand there was nearly 2,000 people at seven o'clock in the morning on the foreshore of the Swan River listening to the apology. I understand that the feeling there was just as it was here. If you were standing in the Great Hall, you're sharing this moment with the stolen generations. I don't think there's ever been a greater moment for me to actually hear that apology and be with the people feeling the emotion of that apology. It is significant that it is seen to be the very first action of this new government. But we will be watching to see that after this first step of apology and acknowledgement that the government continues to take the second, third, fourth and fifth steps that are needed to address the health, education, housing and representation and opportunities of life to the um, Aboriginal people of Australia. We welcome the commitment of the new government to close the gap on life expectancy and community health, on education and on economic opportunity. We also welcome their stated commitment to evidence-based policy. And I'll come to that again later. We are very hopeful that they will assess and respond to the evidence of the problems with the intervention in the Northern Territory to maintain or increase the commitment of resources, but to make sure that those resources are being properly used, can, are being used constructively and effectively. And unfortunately, the evidence that we're seeing come in now is not reflecting the, this case. The Greens also. Um, again, reiterate our support for a full, sincere and unreserved apology for stolen land, stolen children, stolen wages, stolen rights and stolen opportunities. We're sorry for the appalling way we non-Indigenous Australians have treated the First Peoples of this land. We're sorry for the way that the removal of children has ripped the hearts out of families and created a legacy of intergenerational suffering and trauma and con contributed to contributed to the wider exclusion of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people from social, cultural and economic life of the nation. We desperately hope that this will be a new beginning. The Bringing Them Home report, the report on the national inquiry into the removal of, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, was brought down on the 26th of May 1997. The Greens, through Senator Bob Brown, then gave our heartfelt and unreserved apology in the Senate in 1977. My very first action as a new senator was to speak on this very issue. In my first words to the Senate, I acknowledged the traditional owners, the Ngunnawal of this country. I also went on to express my, um, I also went on to say sorry to our Indigenous peoples, and I, and I said that I looked forward to a day when we will acknowledge their voices and do them justice by enabling their true representation in governance of this country. And I also felt it was our shame that we are the only developed nation which has failed to achieve this and that the plight of our Indigenous peoples continues to worsen. 
The Greens believe there is a need for a full audit of the Bringing Them Home report and of the 54 recommendations. We need to measure the progress that's been made on these recommendations and to identify targets and timelines and monetary resources to, to deliver on each and every one of them. To date, our, our audit indicates that most have in fact not been implemented. I also want to acknowledge and remember and pay my respects to Rob Riley, who kicked off the very first inquiry into the removal of children in Western Australia, which then went on to become a model for the National Inquiry. I've told Rob's story in this place before, in fact on Sorry Day in 2006. Rob was a pillar of, the, of strength for the local Noongar community in Perth. For many years he headed up the Aboriginal Legal Service, but he was also one who, night after night, went down to the lock-up when one of the Noongar, Noongar street kids was taken down to the lock-up and needed help. When Rob re released the first WA report, he came out and told his story of being taken from his mother at the age of 18 months, of being brought up, being told that his mother was dead and not learning any different until it was too late and she had passed on. Rob unfortunately took his life when it got too much for him. Rob's story gives us a very clear example of the way that removal has very stark impacts on both the health and well-being of children removed and on their families. These ongoing tangible impacts are the reason that a heartfelt apology on behalf of the nation that is backed up by a commitment to address the wrongs of the past is so important. This clearly includes reparations, which are so clearly and strongly recommended in the Bring Them Home report. For concrete evidence and an understanding of the intergenerational impacts of, the rem of removal on the health and well-being of um, Aboriginal Australians, I draw and the stolen generations, I draw your attention to the West Australian Aboriginal Health Survey. A reminder of the speech given by then Australian of the Year, Dr Fiona Stanley, in Parliament House in May 2005. I also acknowledge the work of Dr Helen Milroy and others on this issue. This survey quantified the relationship between the removal of parents and grandparents, who are now the carers of the current generation of Aboriginal kids, and the health and well-being of those children. One in six Aboriginal children in WA were surveyed. That's over 5,000 kids, the biggest and most comprehensive survey of this kind. Of those um, 0 to 17-year-olds, nearly 13 per cent of their carers have been removed. And while the practice of the force, uh, sorry, um, had, those, those had been removed. Those carers who had been removed as children had higher rates of alcohol consumption, were more likely to have been arrested or charged, were half as likely to have someone with which they felt they could share their problems. They were also more likely to have contact with mental health services. And the children for which they cared were twice as likely to have behavioural and emotional problems twice as likely to have a high risk of hyperactivity and emotional conduct disorders. And those children were twice as likely to be um, already abusing drugs and alcohol. As you can see, there is very clear links between those people, uh, that between the impacts um, and the stolen generations and the impact of the children of the current generations. Children growing up hearing the stories of officially sanctioned mistreatment of their parents, their mothers and their grandmothers in an environment where these injustices are not acknowledged or, even deni or are even denied can easily be led to despair, particularly when they themselves are growing up in disadvantage and experiencing firsthand the impacts of social exclusion and living in a community with a high rate of unemployment in which they face an uncertain future. This is why a full and unconditional apology from the government to the stolen generations on behalf of the parliament and the government is important to not just the children who were removed, but to their children and grandchildren. The health and wellbeing burden carried by Aboriginal Australia and Aboriginal community is huge, but compared to the size of the population of, in our nation of their numbers, their population is, is relatively small. So how can we justify not being able to address their social exclusion and their disadvantage? How can we justify not being able to fix the 17-year gap in life expectancy? It was very disappointing to hear when, the, notion, when the, the discussion around the delivery of the apology was being discussed that the issue of reparation and compensation was, dis was dismissed out of hand. We believe this business is not resolved and finished until stolen generations are properly, properly compensated, until they have full reparation. 
and we Greens are committed to absolutely following that issue and ensuring that the stolen generations are fully compensated and, repara and just reparation is delivered. Thank you, Senator. Senator McEwen. Deputy President, I would uh, like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and to the traditional owners of all the lands that make up our nation of Australia. In the uh, long history of the land that we now call Australia, the period of non-Indigenous occupation has been very short, less than 300 years. In that short time, much dam damage has been done to our Indigenous Australians. Some people still try and delude themselves that everything that was done was done with the best intentions. But if everything was so well intentioned, why do our Indigenous Australians still have a higher mortality rate, poorer education outcomes, poorer health, lower home ownership rates, higher unemployment rates and higher incarceration rates than the rest of us? White settlement of this nation brought with it the view that nothing else mattered but the advancement of the new white colony, and that was coupled with a belief that white people were somehow superior. It was an attitude that led to abuse and dispossession of our Indigenous Australians, a beginning from which the nation has yet to recover. As we focus today on the forced removal of children from their families, the stolen generation, there will persist those self-satisfying remarks from some who continue to say that things weren't really so bad and that the stolen generations is a misnomer. An extreme view is that there is nothing at all to apologise for if the actions were seen by the perpetrators to be for the advancement of Aboriginal Australians. Put aside for the moment, Madam Acting Deputy President, that our Indigenous Australians were not even regarded as equal Australians because they didn't have the vote, the families who had their children taken away were not consulted. They were not engaged in any discussion about the matter at all, about whether or not this action would be better for them and their children. They were not engaged and not consulted because they were not considered worthy of such engagement. Some people don't like the word stolen, yet it is very appropriate to use this term when anything is taken without permission and when it is hidden away. The fact that human beings were involved with force and secrecy used to sever ties with family and culture makes it the most offensive and cruel form of theft. The fact that governments condoned, indeed legislated for this to happen, makes it even more regretful. Let's not fool ourselves. While the nation's short history, a short white history, is rich in achievements, some of our past is shameful, and what happened was hurtful. And the hurt of the past continues to the present. And if there is hurt, we must apologise and we must say sorry. This is an Aboriginal as well as a non-Aboriginal custom. To deny an apology when it has been asked for does nothing to help us move on as a nation from a past that allowed racism and discrimination to be sanctioned by governments. Systematic discrimination swept across our country, beginning in Victoria in 1869, when the Aborigines Protection Act Victoria gave the governor power to order the removal of any Aboriginal child from their family to a reformatory or industrial school. In 1897, Queensland introduced the Aboriginal Protection and Restriction of the Sale of Opium Act, which allowed the Chief Protector to hold children in dormitories. Western Australia, New South Wales, South Australia, Northern Territory and Tasmania then followed suit, giving bureaucrats the power of guardianship over Indigenous children. These laws strip mothers and fathers of their right to, have, to, be, their children, to be their child's guardian and principal caregiver. In 1937, there was nowhere for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders to escape from these bigoted policies as the first Commonwealth State Conference on Native Welfare adopted assimilation as the national policy. That policy meant that children could be taken away from their parents not because they were bad parents but because the children were a different colour, because the children had a mixed parentage and needed to be saved from their traditional culture, that is, the black part of their culture. Indigenous children were placed in institutions, church missions, adopted or fostered. Often their new living conditions meant they not only lost contact with their family and friends, but with their culture. A vast majority of the stolen children had every connection severed as they were taken away from their land, their language and their loved ones. Some were able to reconnect later in life, but for many, by the time they were able to find the strength to seek out their mothers and siblings, it was too late because their loved ones had already died or because they could not reconcile the culture they had been taken from. 
Of course, experience varied from person to person, and it's ridiculous to say that all of the people affected by government policies shared the same feelings and the same fate. In the 1997 report, Bringing Them Home, one confidential submission summed up the systematic discrimination of the policies well. When, the, <coughs> when a victim said, lots of white kids do get taken away, but that's for a reason, not like us. We just got taken away because we was black kids. I suppose half-caste kids. If they wouldn't like it, they shouldn't do it to Aboriginal families. It has been argued by some that the children who were taken away were better off in the hands of white people than in their own families. How on earth can you define better off, let alone use it as some justification for wrenching families apart? Who can say that kids who were sent to a home for half-castes or places like Colbrook House in South Australia were better off because they were taught how to cook and clean for non-Indigenous Australians. Only the children and the families of the children who were removed can decide whether or not they were better off. While some Indigenous children may have been removed on genuine welfare grounds during this time, those children were not considered the stolen generation. The stolen generation is the children who were removed solely because of their race and their forced removal did not leave them better off. Many reports from victims of the stolen generation speak of incredible mistreatment extending from inadequate clothing to outright abuse. Almost a quarter of witnesses to one inquiry who were fostered or adopted reported being physically abused. One in five reported sexual abuse. One in six children were sent to institutions who were sent to institutions reported physical abuse and one in ten reported sexu sexual abuse. Claims that the state and federal governments of the day had the best of intentions are hard to swallow. The various legislation that led to the stolen generation was racist and should never have been written. The Bringing Them Home report was followed by the National Inquiry into the Separation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Children from Their Families. That report made 54 recommendations. A key recommendation was that reparation be made to Indigenous people affected by policies of forced removal and that this reparation should include an acknowledgement of responsibility and an apology from all Australian governments. Since then, apologies have been forthcoming. Every state and territory government, whether Conservative or Labor, have apologised, but until now, not the Commonwealth. The Bringing Them Home report recommended that the first step in healing is the acknowledgement of truth and the delivery of an apology. It is the responsibility of the Australian government on behalf of previous Australian governments that administered this wrongful policy to acknowledge what, has, what was done and to say that we are sorry. There is another excuse used for not supporting an apology, <clears throat> and that is that today's Australians aren't responsible for what happened. The motion that was passed in this chamber today makes it clear that this is the parliament and the Commonwealth government that are providing the, providing the apology in recognition of the wrongs perpetrated by past parliaments and governments. The apology is not an expression of personal responsibility or guilt by individual Australians. Those individuals who do believe or who know they had a part to play in what happened to the stolen generations are still at liberty to apologise or not as they see fit. Government can't and won't do it for us. Now, I'm very pleased that today we have shown the world that we are prepared to acknowledge the wrongs of the past and move to the future. There was some discussion from those initially opposed to or quibbling about supporting a motion such as the one we passed today along the lines of there's more important things for the government to be addressing. I don't think there is anything more important than making an effort to, reduce, to address the wrongs of the past and to plan for and bring to fruition a better future for all Australians. Isn't that what we try and do here every day in this parliament? Whatever motion we're deba debating, whatever legislation we're considering, a better future for everyone is surely the goal. I also would like to uh, thank everyone who travelled here to Canberra today to witness the national apology and to those of the stolen generation. I'm sorry you had to wait so long for it. Now that the acknowledgement has been made, I look forward to building a better future for all Australians, especially our Indigenous brothers and sisters. Thank you, Senator. Senator Murray. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to take note of Senator Evans' motion on the national apology to the stolen generations, an apology I unequivocally and wholeheartedly support. I and my party have long advocated such an apology. I have waited a long time for this national apology by the full federal parliament and the government of the Australian Commonwealth. Although it is long overdue, it is surely welcome. Importantly, it is also unanimous. 
The great speech of former Prime Minister Paul Keating at Redfern still rings in my ears. His complete acknowledgement of harm done to the Indigenous people of Australia is now rightly followed up by Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, both with the apology and the promise of much more remedial action to come. I listened carefully to every word of his address. It was a fine speech, fitting both to the occasion and the importance of this statement. I come to this debate with some understanding of my own of what the Stone Generation experienced, although each individual's experience is different. I was taken at the age of two. I too was taken from my country, but I was reclaimed in later years. As a senator, I have been heavily involved with the problems of children taken from their families. I have read hundreds of submissions, books and articles on these matters. I have spoken all over the country in this cause. After the Bringing Them Home report, in this Senate I lobbied for and initiated further inquiries into the harm done to children who were taken from their families and institutionalised or put in care. As a result, we now have a trifecta of national inquiries that attest to this reality. The reports are the Harry Oaks 1997 Bringing Them Home report, the Senate Community Affairs 2001 report into child migration, Lost Innocence Writing the Record, and the two reports, the Senate Community Affairs Inquiry into Children Raised in Institutional and Other Forms of Care, the 2004 Fault Forgotten Australians report, and the 2005 Protecting Vulnerable Children and National Challenge report. Taken together, the Forgotten Australians report conservatively estimates that there are some 500,000 people in Australia who experienced life in orphanages, children's homes or other forms of out-of-home care last century. They are the 7 to 10,000 child migrants, the 30 to 50,000 Aboriginal Stolen Generations children and the 450,000 plus Australian-born non-Indigenous children raised in orphanages and other forms of out-of-home care. These three cohorts exhibit the intergenerational effects of harming children, whereby if you hurt a child, a harmed adult will often result. The abuse, neglect and assault of children should never be tolerated, not only because it is wrong, but also because of the huge aggregated long-term social and economic effects. Although some survive care relatively intact, far too many live ruined and marginalised adult lives with the painful memories and scars of childhoods lived in fear. Over the last century, thousands are believed to have committed suicide. As adults, people harmed in care have endured lives tarnished by welfare dependency, substance abuse, mental and other health disorders, relationship and parenting problems and endless searches for identity. To this very day, many continue to suffer from the loss of identity and family, from feelings of abandonment, from a fear of authority, and from a lack of trust and security. The upshot is that this policy of forcible removal directly contributed to the alienation of Aboriginal society today. Its effects have been profound, not only for the survivors, but also for subsequent generations who continue to suffer the enduring effects of the removal of parents and grandparents. It is indisputable that the contemporary problems facing Aboriginal society cannot be understo understood without reference to the shameful history. To my mind, there are two main aspects to apologising for the sin of forcibly removing Indigenous children from their families. One is to apologise for the policy, and one is to apologise for the execution of the policy. The evidence is irrefutable. The Stolen Generations policy was racist in intent. It was not a welfare policy of removing neglected children who were at risk in dysfunctional families. It was designed to get so-called half-caste children out of black families and to begin a process of assimilation into the white community. There were already federal and state welfare laws allowing for the removal of children at risk in dysfunctional families. No other legislation was necessary. But racially based legislation and regulation was introduced for the specific purpose of removing indigenous children from their families, their communities and their country. Yes, there were indigenous neglected children who were at risk in dysfunctional families who were removed for welfare reasons. But most children were removed regardless of their specific home circumstances. Having been removed, if the execution of the policy had been to high standards of care, then that would have been a mitigating factor. But the execution of the policy was mostly bad, and churches, agencies, state and federal governments all failed in their duty of care. If we compensate victims of crime and trauma, we should also compensate those who experience childhoods of fear, neglect and criminal acts. 
Evidence to all three inquiries revealed children experiencing severe physical pain, fear and terror resulting from beatings and floggings. The Bringing Them Home report says at page 161, and I quote, I've seen girls naked, strapped to chairs and whipped. We've all been through the locking up period, locked in dark rooms, in a little room like a cell, and kept keep us on bread and water for a week. Countless stories are told of the sexual and physical assault of indigenous children of neglect, abuse and mental torture. I wish journalists and politicians would stop euphemizing rape as abuse. It is criminal sexual assault. I wish they would stop their easy belief that nuns and priests acted with the best intentions. Yes, some did, but most seemed to just stand by, while others were just satanic. Let me give you an example of the abhorrent behavior across all institutions that shows why abuse is so weak a word for what too many indigenous and non-indigenous children endured at the hands of those who preyed on them. The vile crime of sexual assault was summed up in the Child Migrant Report at page 75, and I quote, Boys and girls were subjected to sexual assault in a variety of forms while in care. The committee heard stories of boys being subjected to explicit sexual acts such as fondling and gentle touching, of being forced to perform oral sex, of being repeatedly sodomized, and of girls being assaulted and raped. Evidence was also given of boys being pressured into bestial acts. That's acts with animals, for those that you, who, of you who don't know what that means. The failure to exercise the duty of care demands restitution. It demands reparations. It demands compensation. In my view, a compensation or redress scheme should not be solely the responsibility of the Commonwealth when various governments, churches, charities and agencies were proportionately responsible. Redress was an important and unanimous recommendation of the Forgotten Australians report. Recommendation 6 of that report stated that the Commonwealth Government establish and manage a national reparation fund for victims of institutional abuse in institutions and out-of-home care settings, and that the scheme be funded by contributions from the Commonwealth and state governments and the churches and agencies proportionately. The Commonwealth have regard to the schemes already in operation in Canada, Ireland and Tasmania, and I can add since in Queensland, Tasmania and Western Australia. Uh, sorry, Queensland and Western Australia. In the design and implementation of the above scheme, a board be established to administer the scheme, consider claims and award monetary compensation. The board in determining claims be satisfied that there was a reasonable likelihood that the abuse occurred. The board should have regard to whether legal redress has been pursued. The processes established in ass assessing claims be non-adversarial -adver and informal and compensation be provided for individuals who have suffered physical, sexual or emotional abuse while residing in these institutions or out-of-home care settings. Although the Senate Committee acknowledged that the Commonwealth generally did not have a direct role in administering institutional care arrangements, it did consider that the Commonwealth should contribute to a national reparation scheme as an act of recompense on behalf of the nation. The opportunity is there for the Rudd government to take the necessary steps to right the wrongs of the past. The opportunity is there for the Labour members of the government, particularly in the Senate, to advocate that in your own forums. It is neither too hard nor is it unaffordable, as evidenced by the international redress schemes in Canada and Ireland and here in Australia by Tasmania, Queensland and Western Australia. The West Australian scheme, uh, which has been most recently announced, uh, amounts to $114 million and applies to all uh, children harmed or adults who were harmed as children in institutions. The amount of money outlaid by the Commonwealth would be expended over a number of years, uh, based on the Irish experience, at least six years, I would have thought, taking into account the application and decision-making process. In sum, it would not be too hard to add to the three states' efforts so far with a national reparations fund that also picks up contributions by those who have not yet accepted their proportional responsibility. In concluding, I want to again state how warmly and strongly I welcome the actions of the Labour government today, and I hope that they can do much more in future, including the establishment of a national reparations fund. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Cormann. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. As a relatively new Australian, the debate on the apology is a difficult debate for me to be involved in. As I said in my first speech in the Senate, I chose to become an Australian, and I'm grateful for the opportunity. I love my adopted country. I admire the Australian spirit. 
I admire what has been achieved by successive generations of Australians, initially in very difficult conditions in a relatively short period of time. And I'm grateful for the opportunities that the efforts and sacrifices of past generations have created for Australians today. I became involved in the political process because I wanted to play a part in helping to make Australia a better place for future generations. In taking note of the motion on the apology, though, I rise to express my reservations and give a voice to the reservations of many Australians on how our government has handled this issue, which has divided our nation for the whole period I have been an Australian citizen. With great empathy and sincere regret for the personal hurt and suffering of those who were unjustifiably removed from their families, I remain concerned about the why we have passed this apology today. I am concerned about the use of the term stolen generations. I'm concerned about us representing this generation of Australians sitting in judgment over the actions and motivations of past generations of Australians. More than anything, I'm concerned about the process, the divisive way our government has handled this sensitive and emotive issue. I'm concerned that the government was not prepared to take all of the Australian people into its confidence before last night. I'm concerned about the secrecy and lack of transparency. And I'm concerned that the wording of the apology when finally released with less than 16 hours to go goes well beyond an apology to those who were unjustifiably removed from their families. And finally, I'm concerned that the government has refused to release the legal advice it says it has, that this apology will not lead to a requirement for compensation. And I'm concerned that two weeks ago, we were told by the chair of the Northern Territory Intervention Task Force that our new government had still not given any direction to them on how to proceed with the intervention aimed at the protection of Aboriginal children from abuse and neglect today. In short, in my view, the government's handling of this difficult issue has been arrogant, it has been divisive, and it's been insincere. Where Dr. Nelson demonstrated true leadership by directly engaging in the difficult debate with those in our party room that quite legitimately held different views, the Prime Minister, in contrast, arrogantly railroaded this parliament and through this parliament, the Australian people. He railroaded this parliament with a partisan political approach. It is Dr. Nelson who demonstrated true leadership. Without Dr. Nelson's leadership today, it would not have happened. All Australians should be concerned if the approach to this issue sets a tone for this government's approach to other difficult issues for our nation. To be meaningful, an apology has to be sincere. To be sincere, this apology should have the support of the Australian people. The apology was given by the Parliament as representatives of the Australian people. The Government is aware that the Australian people have been divided on this issue. The Government is aware that Australians remain divided on this issue today. And the government must have been concerned about the views of the Australian people. Why else did the government make a deliberate decision to keep the wording of the apology secret until the last possible moment? Why did they, on this first opportunity to be open and transparent, to listen and to be upfront with the Australian people, exclude them from their consideration of what was their first important priority in Parliament? Why did they not engage with the Australian people in a genuine attempt to bring the Australian people together? We will not get healing and reconciliation if we exclude the Australian people from this process. I hope sincerely that moving forward the government will be engaging in a genuine fashion with all Australians on this and other issues. 
The Parliament today has apologised. It was an apology that had bipartisan support. Now that it has happened, we should and need to move on. We all need to focus on helping to achieve better outcomes for Aboriginal people. The Little Children are Sacred report confronted us all with our responsibility to focus on the safety and protection of Aboriginal children subject to abuse and neglect today. It continues to confront us and should confront our government every waking hour of every single day. And in the spirit of both the motion for rec reconciliation passed by the Parliament in 1999 and the motion passed by the Parliament today, we all need to commit as a nation to the cause of reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. To work together to strengthen the bonds that unite us, to respect and appreciate our differences and to build a fair and prosperous future we can all share. Thank you. Senator Crossan. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, I'm uh, extremely privileged to be part of a federal parliament that took a giant leap of faith in the annals of Australian history books today. I think today will go down as one of the momentous days uh, in the history of this nation when we look back on it, not just tomorrow, when we reflect on the absolute significance of today, but we think about this next week and years to come. When I first uh, stood in this uh, Senate, I offered my personal apologies to the people of the Stolen Generation. Having lived and worked with uh, people in the Northern Territory for more than 25 years, I've heard many stories. I've got to know many of these people. Uh, both at a personal level and at a deep friendship level. Uh, and I know that for decades they have waited for some acknowledgement, not only by the parliament, by but this country, that what has occurred in the past was such an incredible mistake and was so terribly wrong. If you actually think of yourself as a person and what defines you as a person, it's actually your family. It's who you are and where you've come from and who you relate to, what you learn from each other, how you defend and support each other, and at times how you have some massive blues with each other as well. I can't imagine as a mother of four what it would have possibly have been like back in uh, the turn of this century to see your child being removed uh, from your arms or from your camp or from your family existence. I can't imagine the pain that a mother or even her relatives would have felt in, in seeing that occur. We've heard the stories, we've watched the movies, and I think everybody can internalise what kind of impression that would have on you as a parent and, of course, as you as a child. And so we know now, of course, the significance of the 1995 Herriot Report, which was called Bringing Them Home. The term stolen generation, of course, was first used by Professor Peter Reid when he was at Australian National University. And I think it's a term that has stuck with this nation because it's so aptly described what these people were and what they were to themselves. But as a national country and as, as we take pride in our country, we always look at the achievements of this country, whether they're scientific achievements, sporting achievements arts and crafts, and we relish in those, and we're happy, and we celebrate those. We don't do such a good job at recognising the faults uh, and perhaps the flaws in our history and confronting them full on. The fact that children were taken from their parents on the basis of their race is indeed a national shame, and we do have to confront that past act and that admission. And we've done it today, and I think we've done it in a very appropriate, capable way. We've done it through consultation with Indigenous people and through the people who have been concerned. We've done it by talking to members of the uh, National Sorry Day Committee. We've done it by talking to members of the Stolen Generation Alliance. In the Northern Territory, I had the privilege of meeting for many hours representatives from the Northern Territory Stolen Generation Aboriginal Corporation. Uh, members of the Stolen Generation who come from the Redder Dixon home, 
from Croker Island, from Garden Point, from Groot Island, from Carlin, the Carlin compound, the fostered and adopted group, and members from Catherine. The significance of those names, of course, is they were the names of the homes that children were taken to in the Northern Territory, the Reda Dixon home, to the Carlin compound, those that were taken to Croker Island or those that were taken to Garden Point. There aren't too many of them left, I have to say, probably around 186 in the Northern Territory. In fact, only three still alive who were taken to the Carlin compound. And of course, Auntie Hilda Muir is one of those. She couldn't be here in Canberra today, but I know she would have been listening in the Hall of Parliament House in the Northern Territory. Can I just say that what people were after was a final recognition from this parliament that the acts and the actions uh, back then were wrong. But they were very clear to me in their discussions that they wanted this day to be about the beginning of a new era. They wanted to be very clear that this was about not a closure or an end, not about signalling further action or assistance, but about a brand new day, about bringing peoples together, about confronting the past and acknowledging how severely wrong that was and everybody moving forward and taking a step forward. They wanted to ensure that it was made on behalf of the Australian Parliament and not the Australian people. They lay no fault at any one particular person, not then and not now. They wanted to ensure that this parliament acknowledged that the acts of this parliament were wrong, and we've done that. And of course, that has particular reference to the Northern Territory. The Northern Territory Aboriginal Ordinance Act of 1911 applied specifically to families in the Northern Territory. They were directly affected by this. Uh, they, unlike any other non-Commonwealth legislation in various states, the Commonwealth Aboriginals Ordinance Act had a direct effect uh, and a specific effect from the families in the Northern Territory. They wanted to ensure that the policy was to be to the people affected by the laws, policies and practices of forcible removal. In fact, what they were hoping for was that recommendation 5A of the Bringing Them Home report would be specified and enacted today, and that uh, is what has happened. Recommendation 5A said that all Australian parliaments, and now all Australian parliaments have, officially acknowledge the responsibility of their predecessors for their laws, policies and practices of forcible removal, because these children were forcibly removed. Uh, and that make appropriate reparation as detailed in the following recommendations. And so that's occurred. Uh, we've had the start today, of course, with uh, Prime Minister Rudd setting up a commission to look at housing and uh, preschool education. It's a beginning, and it's a new beginning, and that's exactly what the members of the Stolen Generation uh, wanted. They were also concerned that this apology must acknowledge their Indigenous mothers and I noticed that today the Prime Minister in his speech did exactly that. They wanted to acknowledge that their mothers who were left behind when the children were taken suffered the most unkind and cruel impact that you could possibly imagine as a parent. They also want us to acknowledge that when they were removed from their families, they incurred an incredible loss of language, a loss of culture, and of course a loss of land, because a lot of these people would have been the next senior people in their communities and camps and the next line of traditional owners. All of that, of course, has been denied of them. These children were discouraged from family contact. They were taught to reject Aboriginality. Their institutional conditions were harsh. Their education was often basic. Many never received wages. Physical punishments were often common, they were at risk of sexual abuse, and the authorities failed to care for and protect the children. And we know, of course, and we've had documented in the Bringing Them Home report, the lifelong effect that some of these people have endured. The loss of primary carer in infancy, uh, the fact that 
forcibly remove people were no better off, despite the fact that's what the policies intended. Their parenting skills have been undermined. Their next generations are at risk. There's a loss of heritage, and there has been massive effects on those left behind, particularly the loss of language, culture and land. These people deserved this apology today, uh, and I am glad to have been part of it. I just want to say, in finishing, one of the strongest memories I have of my time in this Senate is walking over the Sydney Harbour Bridge. And I just want to place on record today my thanks to non-Indigenous people who have walked the journey with the Solon Generation uh, people over the years, uh, people out there in the broader community who have worked hard to achieve the sorry uh, apology we've had from the federal parliament today, and to those members of the Stolen Generation who are wandering around at morning tea this morning with thanks on their T-shirts. This has been a very significant day for them and a very significant day for our nation, and I sincerely hope that we can all now work, walk forward together in a new era of reconciliation. Thank you. Senator MacDonald. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, uh, I am deeply and genuinely sorry for the way in which uh, Indigenous Australians have been treated uh, for many years. I can apologise for the fact that in the time that I've been in Parliament, uh, we didn't do enough to address many of those problems. I'm also very sorry uh, that some of the initiatives uh, that we implemented for Indigenous people in the Northern Territory, the only jurisdiction over which we have control, have already been placed in doubt by the new government. I am desperately sorry about the treatment of Aborigines even as we speak. Uh, stories abound in my state of Queensland about uh, sexual abuse of young Indigenous people and worse than third world health and education services provided by the state government. The state government seems incapable or uninterested, uninterested in addressing those issues. Daily in Queensland there are reports of these tragic uh, incidents. All the talk all the symbolism, all the hand-wringing will not address the appalling situations that many Indigenous people still find themselves in today. The work that the Howard government started should be accelerated, but already the politically correct brigade are stalling that work. And I mention just one instance, uh, the actions of the Northern Territory and Commonwealth governments in reversing the opening up of communities to other Australians which seems to be to be so essential to involve Indigenous Australians in the wider community and to let the wider community interact uh, with Indigenous Australians. And in this regard, I share the concern of prominent Australians like Mr Warren Mundine, the former president of the ALP, uh, who has, uh, as well as I do, concerns about bringing back the permit system. Uh, many of the uh, issues implemented by Mr Brough should have been duplicated around Australia but it served the purposes of Labor state governments not to accept those solutions. I'm desperately sorry for the plight of many Indigenous people who find themselves in the revolving door of po poverty, substance abuse and sexual abuse, and parents who are simply incapable of bringing up their children. The forcibly separated generation uh, of Indigenous people were separated by well-meaning people decades and decades ago. I don't believe that I or other Australians can apologise for actions taken by former generations in different circumstances at times of, of different attitudes, laws and Christian beliefs. I venture to say that all the missionaries, churches and state government officials did what they did, believing it to be the best uh, for those involved, for the children they believed to be at risk, for the children they believed would never be able to enjoy what they believed would be a civilised way of life. In today's thinking, all that has changed and would not be repeated. Having said that, though, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, one only has to look at the everyday occurrences in the non-Indigenous communities today when young people seen to be at risk are forcibly taken from their parents because those parents are simply incapable of dealing with young children at a particular age. I know about this because I have family in this situation. But if apologies are to be uh, given and compensation paid, I think it behoves the government to look wider than just the position of Indigenous people. I want to refer the government to the report of the Senate Affairs References Committee entitled Forgotten Australians, published in August 2004, which gives a damning account of young non-Indigenous Australians who were forcibly taken from their parents in the 1930s and 40s. I'm indebted to a Mr John Walsh from Roma in Queensland who contacted me 
and alerted me to this report into the terrible situation in which he and many other young Australians found themselves in the last 70 years. In many cases, uh, the father had volunteered to join the Australian Defence Force to go overseas in defence of our country and the empire. Their spouses left with young children who, when they'd asked for assistance from the government of the time, had their young children forcibly removed from them. Horrific stories abound of how these young people were molested by monsters, how they were uh, transferred from one orphanage to another and at an early age made to uh, work for their existence. If apologies are to be made and compensation paid to Indigenous people, they should, in my view, also be made to all those Australians, be they Indigenous or otherwise, who have suffered through the forcible removal of children from their parents in years gone by. I am deeply sorry on what happened to those people, and I do believe uh, that those still alive who suffered and continue to suffer uh, should uh, receive uh, the same uh, uh, treatment or should be treated in the same way as those Indigenous people also forcibly removed. I would assume again that those who perpetrated the acts of separation in the 1930s and 40s uh, did so not out of uh, malice uh, but out of what they believed at the time was the correct way to deal with the situation as they found it. We can look back today and say how inappropriate and in fact devastating those actions have been, uh, but again I remain to be convinced of the worth of a formal apology by the Australian government for actions perpetrated by another government in another time. Uh, nothing will ever prevent me, having learnt of their plight, from being deeply sorry for them as I am for those Indigenous people who were forcibly separated and suffered as a result. But a formal apology, I think, does not take the matter further. The day after the formal apology, life will move on for most Indigenous people. I want to see out of this debate continuation of the good work started by the Howard government uh, that, uh, so that in that way we can really do something to address the problems that confront Indigenous people. Formal apologies have been offered by churches and state governments uh, in the past and what has been achieved. After all, actions speak louder than words. State governments have uh, responsibility for safety, protection, education and health and have failed and words will not fix these deficiencies. It needs real actions. I draw the Senate's attention to the uh, motion passed by Parliament in 1999 where the Parliament expressed its deep regret and sincere regret that Indigenous uh, Australians suffered injustices under the practices of past generations and for the hurt and trauma that many of these Indigenous people feel uh, as, and continue to feel as a consequence of the, those uh, practices. Uh, those words, uh, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, back in 1999 were actually followed by action which culminated in the Northern Territory intervention, the first real attempt to right the appalling conditions and circumstances of Australia's Indigenous people. If the apology takes that any further, then I'm very happy. I doubt that it will, however, and what we need to do from this government and is to, what we need to get from this uh, government is not more rhetoric and hand-wringing, but real action of the sort that Mr. Mr Bruff introduced to try and build the situation of Indigenous people to what other Australians accept, rightly so, as a matter of right. I also urge the government to look at the plight of the forgotten Australians and any other persons, Indigenous or otherwise, who have been forcibly separated from their parents by the authorities over the years. And whilst on the subject of uh, actions of past generations, which are unthinkable today, I wonder what the government has planned for those South Sea Islanders, uh, taken not only from their families and loved ones, but also from their own country. They were taken by what was then acceptable conduct according to the laws and norms of those days, but actions which today we find totally repugnant and abhorrent, uh, not to mention unlawful. I am desperately sorry for what former generations did to these people, uh, but uh, with the benefit of uh, hindsight, uh, I do so from a much more enlightened era. In fact, I am desperately sorry what former generations of governments, churches and welfare agencies uh, did to uh, Indigenous and non-Indigenous people and to South Sea Islanders to name but a few of the peoples of Australia who have every right to feel distraught and resentful. I apologise for any hurt that I myself may have ever brought to the uh, uh, people of Indigenous Australia in my lifetime. I hope there isn't anything that fits that description apart from my reticence to pillory state governments and former Australian governments who have ignored the problems uh, of uh, Indigenous people. And I'm also sorry that we didn't move with action like the Northern Territory intervention uh, earlier than this. I am not in a position 
to apologise for the actions of Australians in past generations who took actions which in most cases were well-meaning. If symbolism and words do solve the, the hurt, uh, then as I say, I'll be very happy. If, however, they are just words of political expediency that mean little and have even less impact, impact on the real solution, then I won't be uh, happy. And Mr Acting uh, Deputy President, I conclude with again, as we did in 1999, a, a express the Parliament's deep and sincere regret that Indigenous Australians suffered injustices under the practice of past generations and uh, also apologise uh, for the hurt and trauma that many Indigenous people continue to feel as a consequence of those practices. And Mr President, I conclude with the final paragraph of that 1999 motion uh, that the Parliament believes that we, having achieved much as a nation, can now move forward together for the benefit of all Australians. Thank you. Senator Dr Spoyer. Deputy President, it is with great pride that I uh, speak to and support the motion before us today and, of course, acknowledge on this uh, day of history uh, the traditional owners of this land. Uh, my colleagues and I support this motion in its entirety and, as you would be aware, we did not support amendments because today is not a day for quibbling. Today is not a day for political point scoring. Uh, today is an occasion that must not be marred. I am so proud to stand in this chamber today and I support the eloquence of the words chosen by the Prime Minister and I support the way he spoke those words. And it is very rare occasion indeed that I can say he spoke for me today. I don't know if I've often been able to say that of a Prime Minister in this place. And I'm only sad that I feel that I'm leaving this place just as the government seems to be getting it right on these matters of history and of such great importance. That's not to say, Mr Acting Deputy President, that the Democrats nor I feel strongly about the issue of compensation. Of course we do. And I feel it is quite right that these issues of compensation and an apology be dealt with and dealt with separately. But I do think that as a matter of principle and of fairness, I can't reconcile how any government uh, can acknowledge the error of the policies, that is, of a stolen generation, and the pain and the suffering that these policies have inflicted, yet rule out any form of reparation. So yes, that debate will come, but today uh, is an important day for an apology, just as yesterday's welcome to country was a remarkable uh, and historic event. Uh, and uh, I, I found it a wonderfully moving ceremony yesterday, Mr Acting uh, Deputy President. It felt like we were moving as a country in the right direction. I think the Prime Minister was talking about carpe diem. Uh, today it's about ex unitate vires. We are united, united as a parliament and hopefully united as a people in moving ahead and healing wounds. It is an honour to speak as a South Australian, representing, of course, the, uh, the descendants of those who have walked this land for many thousands of generations before us, members of an ancient and proud culture unique in its longevity and its character. And, of course, many people would be aware of the many, many different um, Indigenous Australians who are represented in South Australia, my home state. But is one generation in particular, Mr Acting Deputy President, to whom today I direct my thoughts, my sorrow, my empathy and my words. To a generation who suffered unspeakable wrong, a generation who were torn from that which they held most dear and thus were doomed to confront a life without the healing and the guiding that a family love can provide. As a senator for the state of South Australia, I echo the words and endorse the words of the motion without detraction. I am sorry. I am sorry that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children were removed from their families, their culture, their clans. I'm sorry for the suffering and the hurt of those stolen generations, their descendants and their families left behind. I'm sorry for the pain, for the sorrow, for the degradation that was inflicted on these generations and their families by successive government policies. I'm sorry this pain was inflicted by policies determined by former members of governments that, of course, we now represent.
to those who have campaigned relentlessly for many years, for decades, to reach this moment, I offer my congratulations, my solidarity and my admiration. I know many thought that this day would never come, and may well it not for the tireless efforts of um, many organisations, Mr Acting Deputy President, many individuals. Um, Reconciliation Australia is one example, the Sorry Day Committee, and of course there are so many individual Australians, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, who have worked so hard. I wear a scarf today given to me by Luigi O'Donoghue many years ago as we um, debated this, uh, uh, of this issue and worked together on it. I, um, I think there are many, many people who uh, are enjoying this particular occasion and feel that their efforts have not been totally in vain. I offer my encouragement for, although the magnitude of this occasion cannot be understated, as is made clear by the words of this apology, it is but a first step towards a shared future built on mutual recognition and empowerment. And of course, there remains much work to be done, as has been acknowledged, I think, by all in this place. It's true that the divide between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians represents a blight on this nation still. Indigenous Australians live 17 years fewer, are 17.5 times more likely to be in jail or fail basic numeracy and literacy tests, three to four times more than non-Indigenous Australians. But much has been made of the symbolism of this act in the face of such figures. And symbolism is important. It does matter. As Reconciliation Australia has said, the divide between so-called symbolic and practical aspects of reconciliation is a false and dangerous construction, one which fails to recognise that the apology is fundamentally about building mutually respectful relationships as the foundation for Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians moving forward together, acknowledging our shared history and looking to a shared future. Mr Acting Deputy President, I do congratulate this government on the initiative it's shown and for imbuing this apology with the priority that it deserves by making it one of the foremost acts of their 42nd, the 42nd parliament. This should not be, and I don't believe it has been about blame. I think this has always been about healing and about moving forward. And hence uh, the Democrats' strong belief that an important part of this, as indeed the Bringing Them Home report acknowledges, that compensation and reparation is an important part of that. It's about ensuring that we acknowledge that pain and suffering. It does not do justice to the Bringing Them Home report, um, and it doesn't bring an end to this unfinished business if we just have the apology. But for today, it's a fundamental and important first step. Uh, to the government and to opposition colleagues, uh, those of us on the crossbench and to all elected members in this place, and especially the new ones, I think, through whom uh, some of us will live vicariously over the, uh, the coming years, I urge you to seize this cooperative uh, spirit, you know, use this, the spirit of this movement to move forward, um, hopefully, and often in circumstances such as these, the collective goodwill of the movement can be lost in semantics and cynicism. I hope not. I say to you now, let's declare here and now that such a faith will not befall this parliament, and the generations of the future will look back on this moment as the birth of a united and mature nation that's been big enough to recognise the mistakes of the past while simultaneously moving forward to a better future. Mr Acton, Deputy President, uh, I wholeheartedly support the motion, and I commend my Senate colleagues to do likewise. Thank you. Senator Hurley. Mr Ackley, Deputy President, it is a great pleasure to follow um, my fellow South Australian Senator, um, Senator Scott Despoyer, um, to, uh, to support this national apology to the stolen generations. Um, in May 1997, I spoke to a motion in the South Australian Parliament as a, a member of that Parliament at the time. It was a motion of apology and reconciliation. And I indicated then that I thought it was appropriate, would be appropriate that the federal Parliament make a similar apology. Now, it has taken more than 10 years 
Um, and I hope that this occasion means that Aboriginal people will finally have the sense of a complete and heartfelt apology from all of the uh, nations of Australia, because all of the states and territories now, I, I think, have delivered an apology for their role in the administration of, uh, of the rem forcible removal of Aboriginal children. But it is, um, it is very pleasing to see that the national parliament, the prime minister, the leader of the opposition, and uh, all of the um, uh, minor parties here in this chamber have now joined in one voice with the states to, to speak that apology to those people who have suffered the pain and, and the devastating consequences at that policy which was aimed at assimilation of Aboriginal people. Um, so it, um, at, at the time um, it was, um, uh, we, we gave the apology in uh, the South Australian Parliament. It marked the anniversary of 30 years since the 1967 referendum to give the Commonwealth special powers to be used for the benefit of the Aboriginal people. And I'd just like to um, reiterate a short part of the remarks that I made at the time. I said, it is not enough to recognise and acknowledge the mistakes of the past. We must also make a commitment to avoid those mistakes in the future. In 1967, the Australian people voted overwhelmingly in favour of that referendum in a country where very few referendum questions get up. The Australian people did that, I believe, because they thought it was a fair thing and a recognition of the rights of people in this country. We take for granted that our government is set up to make laws for our benefit, even if we do not agree with those laws. But Aborigines have no such confidence based on their past experiences. The rights of Aborigines as citizens were denied, rights such as life, liberty, property and dignity. They deserve an apology for those past mistakes and deserve to be told that we will ensure that it will not happen in the future. And I think that that is still precisely what this apology is about now. In, in, in my view, it is about um, it is about um, apologising for the past and making sure that these mistakes do not happen in the future and doing something about it. Um, Senator Macdonald quoted a friend of mine, uh, Warren Mundine, earlier about another issue, but I'll, I'll quote him. I saw him just now at lunchtime and he said that this apology is essential because it will raise itself again and again and just get in the way of what we do in the future. So that's another reason why it's important. We must, we must have this as the, as the starting ground before we can go forward and rectify those mistakes. Um, and I think really it is in, re in rectifying those mistakes, we must first of all ask ourselves why we're doing that. And this is about um, the dignity and respect that we hold for the Indigenous people in Australia and the acknowledgement that we will treat all Australians with justice and equity. We don't treat them all the same, but we treat all Australians with uh, justice and equity and respect their rights as individuals. And in uh, moving on to the future, the, the government, the Prime Minister in his speech today talked about um, targets in education and health. And I want to, to, um, to support those targets, but with the understanding that that is with the full cooperation and consultation with Aboriginal people and not have these targets decided for them, because we must um, give Aboriginal people the dignity and respect that we give to all Australians people and give them the choice the say in their life and their lifestyle and never deny that to them. Um, because um, it won't work, basically, if, if we don't do that. And, and I am no expert. I have spent some time working and living in outback uh, areas of South Australia and the Northern Territory. I spent um, some years in Alice Springs working in a pathology lab at the hospital there. And, and therefore had um, some experience of the Aboriginal communities around Alice Springs. And I have a, a sister who's worked for 30 years in education in the Northern Territory, particularly with Aboriginal children. So I don't claim any particular expert, 
expertise, but this is my assessment of, uh, of where the Aboriginal community is, is positioned. That before we can move forward, we need to have full cooperation with that community. They must make the choice. Uh, in, in which direction they want to head. And, um, the, the Prime Minister referred to that in his speech this morning. He said there is no one-size-fits-all approach to the hundreds of Aboriginal communities around Australia. He said what we are doing is setting a destination, and along the way, along that destination, uh, we should be asking the Aboriginal people to come along with us. Aboriginal people have been here on this land for many, many thousands of years. Uh, we came and we built our country and our wealth on their land. And in doing that, we displaced and or disrupted um, many Aboriginal people. That means, in my view, that we have an ongoing obligation to, for care and consideration for those that continue to suffer the consequences of that trauma. And that is the way that we should be addressing ourselves in the future, in providing compensation, ongoing compensation for that. And that this small proportion of our wealth should not be paid with any sense of paternalism or, or someone with a better knowledge of things coming in to provide for those communities. It should be paid as a just and a right uh, contribution for the displacement that the, those Aboriginal communities have suffered. Well, certainly, um, uh, just in conclusion, it has given me great pleasure to be uh, here as a representative of uh, South Australia in the federal parliament to, to be part of this national apology. And from the many people I've seen around Parliament House uh, today, it is, um, it is quite clear that it has given pleasure for many Aboriginal people to receive um, that apology. And I think that that is a wonderful start for the future for, for relations between um, Aboriginal people and uh, the Parliament of Australia and the people of Australia. Thank you. Senator Boswell. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Mr Acting Deputy President, the Senate is debating the motion of a national apology, apology to the stolen generation. Today is about honouring Indigenous Australians, reflecting on their past and apologising for laws and policies which fail to render uh, the, and honour the uh, Indigenous Australians. We say sorry today. We do not know ourselves the grief and the pain of forced removal and separation from family and community. We know of it and we have listened. Today I also want to acknowledge that there were a lot of dedicated people from religions and non-religions that gave a great deal of their life to man missions or make or work with Aboriginals. In these distant communities, the Lutherans at Hopevale, the Brethren at Dermagee, I know the Catholics were represented and so were the Methodists to look after the welfare, the education and the health of Aboriginal communities. In passing this motion, we must in no way denigrate their efforts and their life's work. We see by your reception of this, of this apology how much it was needed. Today there will be celebrations aplenty. The sorry motion was telecast live from many media outlets. There was cheering from the crowds outside and in, and in Parliament House, and people watching from around Australia. I know that today is all these wonderful things, but there are many Australians who will be thinking that tomorrow, in some remote and isolated Indigenous communities, there will still be no work, lots of alcohol and violence, child abuse and neglect, and intolerable levels of sickness and disease. Apologies for the past are meaningful if they lead to a renewed vigour to do more and to do better. The past cannot be undone, but the future can be remade. There is a genuine mood in the nation today 
that we can do better, that we must do better and that we will do better. One step in this process to do is to do more and to do better, is to look again at how remote communities can be made sustainable, where they are not reliant on government handouts and welfare, but are in control of their own choices and destiny. For example, Indigenous communities in Queensland have large amounts of land and water not being used to grow anything. They could grow and, in some instances, have negotiated forestry agreements to grow trees, creating employment and hope for their community to establish a forestry industry in those communities that have lots of land in North Queensland. Queensland has other good examples of success, such as contracting businesses in the cotton industry at St George and Goodnawindi. Many of the Indigenous people have their own businesses there and contract out to the cotton growers. And mining and transport at Mount Isa. Mining companies also offer employment in remote Australia. Some communities are developing their own tourist villages and caravan parks. These are but a few examples of how sustainability can create and ensure a better future for those Indigenous people and their communities. With this apology, we now need to ensure that our efforts are renewed and refocused to ensure the mistakes of the past are learnt from and never repeated. I hope this apology assists in the healing process of those who have suffered from past decisions. I also hope that the momentum for a better future for our Indigenous community is continued with examples like I have described in Queensland and with the Northern Territory intervention. What worries me is that one day in the Parliament of the future, Senators may vote to apologise for what this generation has failed to do for our Indigenous people. We will fail if we do not focus on practical help to forge healthy, educated, law-abiding and sustainable communities. Today, maybe we feel good about ourselves because we apologise for the past mistakes. But tomorrow, we must assume responsibility for our own mistakes and make action, not rhetoric, our weapon of choice. I cannot let this debate go by without recognising the frustration felt by many decent Australians when it comes to Indigenous policy. Their sincere and generous desire to help Indigenous Australians has been backed by a huge amount of public funds, yet it seems to many ordinary Australians that there is such a long way to go. The willingness to see Indigenous Australians succeed is wholeheartedly felt across the nation, but the disappointments have been many. Cross-cultural misunderstandings and internal politics, black and white, have contributed to the difficulties. Sometimes there was conflict despite everyone having the common under underlying aim of improving life for Indigenous people. It is right that there be joy and tears today. It's right that we say sorry. It is also right that we move forward as a nation. The present and the future demand our attention. The world sees the huge abyss of despair in some Aboriginal communities. Australians want to help. They want to stop clouds gathering over the young children. So let there be jubilation today. Let the victims of injustice breathe easier. But please, God, let the leaders stand up and insist on a mutual responsibility as included in this motion. Thank you, Senator Boswell. Senator Nettler. Fantastic day today. I was um, riding my bike into Parliament this morning, and there were just hordes of people walking towards Parliament, wanting to be here out the front of Parliament, watching on the big screen. And in the in the Great Hall, people were streaming out the back just to be there, to be present on such a historic and and really important day. And it's just fantastic to know that that was occurring not just here in Canberra, but we've heard all the reports today about the people who were filed into Federation Square in Melbourne, into Martin Place in the rain in Sydney. 
People gathered at Burke High School to watch on the big screens there and to hear from local Indigenous leaders about what this apology meant to them. And close to my house at the block in Redfern, there many people gathered there as well and were a part of watching the apology that occurred in here. So it's a fantastic day for all of us to be here and to be participating in. And I really um, think that having an apology in the name of the parliament today um, feels really special to us, but the people that it is meant for and that today is really for are for those people who make up the stolen generation. Um, and, and I really hope that today is an opportunity for them to start that process of healing. We've all acknowledged it's just the first step. It's the beginning of a long process of healing. And I hope that today and the activities here in Parliament can, can contribute and assist that process of, of trying to start the healing process. Much damage has been done. Um, and it's only really when we acknowledge that damage and work together that we can start to forge a better future um, for this country. And there were two young schoolgirls, three young schoolgirls, who um, were at the block this morning in Redfern. Um, they were on their way to school and they came because they really wanted to be there. And I heard them on the radio just earlier today and they were saying they were being asked about what it meant to them, what did the apology mean to them. And they said, well, we know one thing, it's been a long time coming. And, um, I thought if, if those schoolgirls can understand that, then perhaps that's some insight into the sense of frustration that many people have. It really has been a long time coming. It's over 200 years that this country um, was first invaded and occupied by um, colonisers. And there's a lot of recognition that needs to occur. It's not just about saying sorry to the stolen generation. It's about saying sorry for the colonisation of this country for so many things that have happened right the way to, to the most recent Northern Territory intervention. Yesterday we had the fantastic opening of parliament with um, a long overdue welcome to country um, and, and that was really pleasing to see. We also had an, a tremendous gathering of people out the front of parliament um, who were talking about the negative impact that the Northern Territory intervention is having. And I think, I think that the history of black and white relations in this country um, are such that if you can learn one thing from it, it's that it doesn't work to impose things on Aboriginal Australians. And that's why we're here now with the parliament saying sorry for people. May have been well-intentioned government policy, but look at the heartache it's created. And on the day when the Northern Territory intervention, when the former Prime Minister made the announcement about the Northern Territory intervention, I was in Rachel Seawitt's office, um, our Green Senator from Western Australia, with a group of women from the Northern Territory. They were in Canberra because they own the land where the former government wanted to put uh, nuclear waste dump sites in the Northern Territory. And one of those women turned, they, they would, so they were lobbying here about that issue, and it happened to be the day when um, former Prime Minister um, made the announcement about the Northern Territory intervention. And they said to me as I was leaving Rachel's office, they turned to me and said, I'm from the stolen generation. And it was a real look of, I've seen this before. And it just made me think, I don't want us to be here. I don't want us or political leaders to be here, decision makers in 10, 20, 15 years' time, saying sorry for well-meaning decisions being made now by the former government, supported by um, the, the Labor Party as well. People were tr trying to do things and feeling that they were doing the best interests of children, and yet that's what happened with the stolen generation. More damage was done. Now, if what is going on in the Northern Territory isn't done in cooperation with Indigenous Australians, the same thing will occur. When you impose things, it doesn't work. When you give Indigenous people the opportunity to drive their own future, to create their own opportunities, then that's what works. And there's so many positive examples of that. In New South Wales, I've visited schools in Aboriginal communities run entirely by Indigenous staff who do fantastic work in engendering in the young people a sense of cultural importance in the dance, the activities that they can be involved in. There are so many success stories. And those success stories, be they um, the snake condom program, for example, that's happening in parts of Victoria, that's Indigenous people running their own programs about the importance of safe sex. They, 
These are the programs that work and they're the programs we should be supporting. So we can't have a, an intervention which is exempt from the Race Discrimination Act so it can be racist imposed onto a group of people in the Northern Territory. It's got to be a cooperative action. And that's why I so support the demands of the protests that happened out the front of parliament yesterday about the Northern Territory intervention. We have to work together in order to achieve things. That's been the history and the legacy of um, so much of the black-white relations in this country. And if we're going to turn the new page, if we're going to start, then it's about working together. There's a whole lot of studies and research that people have done, and people in here know the figures about the disadvantage, about the 17-year gap in life expectancy, about the experiences of Indigenous Australians have had. Well, we need to look at that work that's been done, the Bringing Them Home report. We need to implement all of the recommendations, not just an apology, but fair and just compensation, reparations for Indigenous Australians. We need to go down the path of implementing all of those recommendations, reparations not just monetary sense, but also in a health, education and housing sense. We need to be holistic about the way in which we make reparations work as a whole so that as a country we can forge this new future that we all want to be a part of. There are so many things that, that need to be done in this area and um, recognising sovereignty, putting in place negotiations around a treaty, it, the land rights um, movement that has been so important for this country. We need to look at these issues again and ensure that they are done in a way that Indigenous Australians are leading the way. So there is so much that needs to be done, and, and this is just the first stage. And we need to see, as I said, all of those recommendations of the Bringing Them Home report. There's also recommendations outstanding from the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, which also need to be implemented. And there are far too many Indigenous Australians in prisons right across this country. And we need to look at working with Indigenous communities to ensure that those people are given the opportunities that mean they can have a really positive um, life that allows them to contribute to our society rather than finding themselves in prison. So not only do we need to see those recommendations from the black deaths in custody um, occur, but we also need to be ensuring that we don't have such horrendous representation as we do um, currently of Indigenous communities in our prisons. So, so many of these things need to occur. And there are issues that Greens and other people in here have worked on for many years, um, but we need to continue to do all of this work. I just want to take a couple of moments um, to share with the Senate the story of a, a young woman. Um, she, I think she'd be 41 maybe this year, um, a woman by the name of Charmaine Clark. She ran uh, to be in the Senate um, for the Greens in the federal election of 1998 it was. I, I met her a couple of years beforehand. Um, Charmaine as I say, she's quite young, a couple of years older than me. Charmaine is a member of the Stolen Generation. When she was three, she was taken into care, along with four of her brothers and her sisters, by social workers when she was being looked after by an aunt while her mother and father were out looking for work. She ran away from that care to rejoin her mother when she was 14. And much of her family history is still missing. It's many years ago that Charmaine told me the story about her experiences and the experiences of the other members of her family. These, Charmaine's just one of many people um, who have had a hurtful experience because of the um, actions of the Australian government. And I hope that today's apology can be a part of the healing and the repair for them and for this country so that we can forge a bright future together and a future together is the most important part. Thank you, Senator Nettle. Senator Furavanti Wells. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Today's apology is an acknowledgement of guilt which we will have far which will have far reaching implications for current and future generations both in Australia and internationally. It stems from the 1997 Bringing Them Home report, which found that nationally Indigenous children were forcibly removed from their families and communities between 1910 and 1970 to be placed in institutions, church missions, adopted or fostered where they were potentially at risk, that welfare officials failed in their duty to protect Indigenous wards from abuse, 
that under international law from approximately 1946 the policies of forcible removal amount to genocide and that from 1950 the continuation of distinct laws for Indigenous children was racially discriminatory. A key recommendation was that reparation include an acknowledgement of responsibility and apology for all Australian parliaments, police forces, churches and other non-government agencies which implemented policies of forcible removal. Guarantees against repetition, restitution and rehabilitation and most importantly monetary compensation. On 26 August 1999, then Prime Minister Howard moved a motion of reconciliation which reaffirmed commitment to the cause of reconciliation while acknowledging past mistreatment and expressing deep and sincere regret that Indigenous Australians suffered injustices under the practices of past generations. Given the divergence of views in Australia, that motion struck a fair balance. A motion in similar terms went before the Senate. The primary justification for an apology is inextricably linked to the notion that a policy of genocide was deliberately instituted against our Indigenous community. As coalition senators noted in their dissenting report in the inquiry into the stolen generation, many Australians would not agree that there are direct parallels between the separated children experience and the sort of gross violations of human rights found elsewhere in the world, such as torture, genocide, slavery and executions. The apology follows that acknowledgement that children were removed forcibly. This critically satisfies those international conventions that a policy of genocide was enforced against our Indigenous population. Therefore, an apology will support a tide of claims for compensation, reinforced by an acceptance that human rights were breached. A flurry of legal activity will be driven by the principle stated in the report that states, breaches, that states breach their obligations when they fail to prevent human rights violations by others, as well as when human rights are violated by state action. In either event, the victims have a right to reparation under international conventions such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Let's understand the extent of potential claims. Recommendation 4 requires reparation be made not only to the individuals but others whose ties with them were affected by the removal, such as family members, descendants and their communities. The Senate inquiry into implementation of the report also advocated a reparation tribunal, a powerful precursor of what is likely to materialise. The advocacy for compensation remains strong and is driven by a diversity of stakeholders who say that a symbolic apology without compensation is meaningless. In recent memory, our nation has sought to expunge our psyche with notions of political correctness and divisive policies designed to overwhelm us with symbolism, but which fail to deliver tangible and practical solutions to complicated challenges. Any objections about an apology in no way negate the tremendous need to support support our Indigenous uh, population. The disparity between their living standards and their mortality rates is cause for great concern. Many remain destitute in a lifestyle surrounded by violence, addiction, poor health and low levels of education. A situation I saw growing up one block away from an uh, Aboriginal community in the Illawarra. These challenges can only be addressed through practical responses such as Northern Territory intervention. My concerns about the motion are, one, it exposes the taxpayers to potential ambit claims of compensation, including under international law. Two, it solidifies an acknowledgement that a policy of genocide was deliberately instituted against our Indigenous population. Three, it leaves an indelible mark on our history by supporting the notion that Aboriginal children were stolen and thus imputing some criminal intent on the actions of good men and women whose actions were motivated by rescuing or saving children from appalling conditions. Four, it tarnishes our nation's reputation and imputes guilt on the current generation for alleged transgressions over past policies and practices. And it creates an and five, it creates an environment whereby generations of students will be inculcated through a curriculum that Australia once adopted a past practice of violation of human rights of Indigenous people. 
Remember that some very good men and women from churches and other organisations acted legally and with the best intentions to remove children from appalling conditions where they had been abandoned, abused or neglected, many of whom, though, who went on to make important and varied contributions. What about their children? What about the children and the grandchildren of these good men and women? How are we making them feel? Whilst many Australians may regret any injustices suffered under past practices, they do not believe that this constituted stealing for which this generation should say sorry. A vocal coterie of interests has effectively created a pressure cooker environment designed to stymie debate over an emotive issue stoked against our collective national interest. As Professor Winshuffle recently said, one thing, though, that this coterie has kept to themselves is that the major pieces of legislation underlying these past practices were all passed by Labor governments. As a lawyer with the Australian Government Solicitor for 15 of my 20 years in public sector employment, I saw instances of collective activism egged on by unscrupulous lawyers who had no intention, um, who had no intention encouraging no hesitation in encouraging plaintiffs to pursue spurious claims against the Commonwealth, knowing that at the very least go away money together with their costs would be paid. Naturally, prospective plaintiffs may have legitimate common law rights to sue, such as Mr Trevorrow, who was awarded $525,000 for breach of duty of care by the South Australian Government. Such legitimate legal rights, of course, continue to exist. Should we go back into our history and consider reparation for other alleged injustices committed, however well-intentioned or well-founded? What about the many white children removed from appalling conditions for the same reasons of being abandoned, abused or neglected? Are they entitled to compensation for forced removal? What about those law-abiding migrants who suffered when interned during the war for no other reason than their nationality? Should they be compensated? Will we see emerging other groups who may legitimately argue that they too should be compensated for an alleged injustice? Should we now find these aggrieved people? Where do you draw the line? And more importantly, as Andrew Bolt recently stated in the Herald Sun, will the fear of liability for reparation mean that welfare officials of today are too scared to remove Indigenous children from dangers from which ordinarily children of any other race will be saved? On the other hand, will we see future claims for reparations where, with the best of intention, Indigenous children are today removed from circumstances of sexual abuse, neglect and other atrocious instances? It is incumbent on us to remain true to our convictions and maintain the cohesiveness of our nation by enacting initiatives designed to benefit all Australians. The motion omits compensation and reparation. It is illusory to think that an apology itself will be sufficient. Many will want compensation, and given the potential claimants, I believe reparations will run into billions of dollars. Rest assured that in the future we will be called upon to consider compensation legislation. Compensation calls by key figures in the debate is only the beginning of a sustained campaign. Some claim today's motion provides finality and closure, but many believe it is the beginning of the next phase where this and future generations will be made financially responsible for past and potentially current actions towards Indigenous Australia. There are very diverse views on an apology held by Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians ranging from strong support to outright opposition. I know that my concerns and reservations are shared by many Australians. For this reason, I left the chamber when the motion was carried on the voices, thereby abstaining from the vote. Thank you, Senator Ferravanti Well, Senator Moore. I don't always begin speeches in this place by acknowledging the tra traditional owners, though many people know that in most places I do. But I think today, in this discussion, it's a time when we can, because acknowledgement today is the focus of our discussion. The word sorry has been said. And it's been said a number of times here, and it has made a difference, and that's the important element. But the word that I want to use most in my short contribution is thank you. Thank you to the many Australians, Indigenous and not Indigenous, who have kept this issue on the agenda. 
From the time that the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission began their work on the, what then became the Bean and Home Report, there was a raising of awareness across our community on these issues, on the issues of our history, of what really happened to Indigenous Australians who were caught up in a period of our history which we didn't tend to acknowledge. It also acknowledged what happened to people who were not Indigenous, people who were, as many speakers have acknowledged, doing things that they were accepted. However, through the Bringing Them Home report, and I know many people in this chamber and in the other place have read that report in detail, individual people had the courage and the support to tell their stories. And through that storytelling, an amazing awareness came across a large sector of our community. And out of that report came individuals who then took their stories wider. And through that process, through various reconciliation networks across our country, there was genuine engagement. And that engagement spread from school groups to pensioners groups, community areas, where there was time and space provided for people to share their stories. And that is the real value of the journey on which we are taking our own place today. We have an awareness now that was not accepted in the past. We cannot hide from what did occur, but we have an opportunity to move forward with this awareness by taking the step. Anyone who saw the candlelight display in front of Parliament House the other night and could see that statement, sorry, first step, indicates that the debate is not over. The discussions that were started through the Being Them Home report over 11 years ago, through working across all areas of Australia encouraging people to come forward, that will keep going. That's the strength that saying sorry today has given all of us, because we have acknowledged that the journey must continue. But by having sorry publicly stated, that communication given today, we have put one extra step into that infrastructure on which we can build. And that's why we're excited. That's why today is not the day to talk about all the other things that have to happen. This is not the day to actually set up contrasting divisions to be competing about who is more disadvantaged than whoever else. Today is the day, as we should together agree, to make the statement our Parliament House, our government, all Australians together, Indigenous and not Indigenous, making this statement but acknowledging that the journey continues. No one believes that there's going to be some magic effect today that everything is going to be better. Anyone who brings that argument into the debate is actually continuing to hide from the core issue. What we are doing together today is acknowledging the first step, acknowledging that there is so much more that has to be done. And one of the key elements of that forward action is keeping in history all the stories that were told through the Bringing Them Home, all the contributions that we have shared in this place and the other place today. We keep that together as a constant reminder of from where we have come, where we are today and where we must go into the future. So that is the hope. But when you actually mingle with the people who really are the owners of today, those people who had told their stories, who now have got the strength of support from their parliament, they have the strength now to help us move forward with them. That must be where we go from today. But I do urge people from across all parties to actually give the time and the space today for some celebration for some acknowledgement, and then we can continue, maybe in different ways, about what should and shouldn't happen in the future and what the legal implications are in the future. That debate will continue. It must. But today is the day to acknowledge the sorry statement. That recommendation from the Being Home report was not the only recommendation. It did not say that by making an apology that would be the end of the issue. What the Bringing Them Home report said was one element, one threshold element of our job was to make the apology, and we can do that. In fact, it has been done today, and we are in furious agreement that that was a good thing to happen. 
what we can now do is actually join with the people from Indigenous communities across the country, most importantly deal with the school kids who have had the opportunity today to watch what has been going on in this place, to regather the energy. Because one of the things that often happens in this place is that something that is really important today, then its future life is on a bookshelf, in a library or pushed aside. That cannot be the legacy of our sorry statement. The legacy of the sorry statement must be the joint commitment to future action. And what we can achieve today is that future action will be able to be done in a more positive way in a way that engages all of us and doesn't have this element of unfinished business. We've actually put together through the process in the lower house and in the Senate today in the agreed decision to make the statement, which has now become part of our government history, our parliament history and our community history, that we have acknowledged what went wrong in the past. We have said that we think that that was wrong, and we as a parliament, as a government, have said sorry. That is the challenge for all of us. In terms of where we go next, I'm sure that there's going to be extreme discussion in various ways about what the next step should be. And when we, when we actually achieve those uh, commitments, when we look at what must happen, and when people have the opportunity to hear the contributions, read the contributions that have been made by various members of parliament and senators today, we'll be able to have a framework for where we move into into the future. I am very, very glad that we have made this statement today. I think that the joy that has been expressed by people who were those that told their stories in the Bringing Them Home report, that joy alone must give us the, um, the courage to take the next steps and remember that there are next steps. We hope that today's activity will be commemorated in a permanent way in this building in our history, so that the people who wander through parliament and see the ways that our government operates will be able to see this moment of time, so that they'll be able to learn about what has happened in the past and be able to share in whatever our community chooses to do in the future. The word sorry is important. The statement of sorry is important, but I think that what we need to do is understand that from tomorrow the words we should be looking at are action and also in terms of how we can work together. The reconciliation story circles that came out of the Bringing Them Home report engaged on that process. They had an engagement education phase, but they also had an action phase about what we do next. That is for the future debate. Today we can celebrate, we can acknowledge and we can share with the people to whom we owe as a community the apology. Sorry and thank you. Thank you, Senator Moore. Uh, Senator Joyce, I, I'd suggest in view of the fact that it's nearly two o'clock, I mean, it might be wise to delay your contribution until later. Senator Bryan, or, sorry, Senator Faulkner. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, the, Senate, uh, the sitting of the Senate be suspended until 2 p.m. if that would assist. Is that uh, motion agreed? Uh, those that appear say aye, against say no. The motion is carried. Thank you, Senator Faulkner. Government business order of the day. Motion to take note of the national apology to the stolen generation. Resume debate. Um, well, I, I was advised, thank you, uh, Senator Joyce, Senator Bartlett. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. Uh, I am pleased to be the uh, uh, final speaker from the Democrats on this motion. All Democrat senators have spoken to it in noting the, the very significant uh, motion of apology that was passed by this Senate chamber without dissent. Uh, earlier today, as well as, of course, in the uh, House of Representatives. Uh, it is a very welcome motion. Uh, like all motions uh, that are drafted by others, you could always pick a word or two where you think, uh, well, I would have expressed it differently. But uh, as the Prime Minister himself has said, uh, this uh, motion, this resolution is not uh, about politicians. It's about the stolen generations themselves. And to me, this motion has clearly been drafted uh, with a lot of consultation uh, from uh, Indigenous people, who all, of course, have their own individual views uh, about this, as with every other issue. 
uh, and of course um, put forward in a way that seeks to uh, receive unanimity to give it maximum strength and maximum significance. And I think it has clearly been put forward uh, in the right spirit and it is, I think, a very strong and powerful motion and it's one that I'm very pleased to give support to. Uh, it has often been said that uh, words uh, are not sufficient, and of course that is true, but words are very important. Uh, we'd be in a bit of trouble here in this chamber if words didn't have importance, because that's about all we do here, is speak. Uh, and we speak of important things, we put important things on the record, uh, we pass laws that are made of words, and uh, we, as with all human beings, uh, provide a large, uh, commit a large component of our uh, communication using words in various forms. And these words are very powerful and they're very important. And I know that uh, they will provide uh, real meaning, real comfort um, and a uh, real positive sense of uh, relief and of uh, thankfulness about the clear recognition that is provided via the words uh, of the motion that the Senate has passed. Uh, I'd also suggest that uh, whilst, of course, uh, passing a motion, any motion, uh, does not provide health care, does not provide in itself uh, resources, does not provide better education, does not in itself uh, provide uh, the concrete assistance that is needed by so many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Uh, but I, I do think it's misleading to say that uh, a motion in itself does not have any practical effect, does not have any positive benefit in itself, because it clearly does. Uh, there is no doubt that a significant part of the difficulties faced by so many Indigenous Australians today uh, result in part, uh, not all, but in part, from uh, the unresolved uh, emotional and spiritual trauma that they, so many of their families, of their peoples, have suffered over so many years. And there is a real problem with uh, mental health issues, with spiritual health uh, for many Indigenous Australians, in part because that trauma has not been acknowledged, has not been fully recognised, has been continually downplayed or dismissed. Uh, so it does have a direct positive effect for some people, not for everybody, but for some people uh, to adopt resolutions like this if they are done in the right spirit and with genuine intent, and I believe that has happened today. Uh, there is, I think, no doubt that for some people this will be a significant part of healing for them. And healing is not imaginary. Just because it's in the heart, it's in the soul, it's in the mind does not mean it's imaginary. Uh, so this does provide direct positive benefit for some individuals and that should not be dismissed. Uh, of course more needs to be done, as the resolution itself says. Uh, when it says the time has come for righting the wrongs of the past, uh, this motion, at least as I read it, does not say OK, we've passed it, all the wrongs are now righted. Uh, this is part of turning that page. Uh, this resolution goes not just to the stolen generations, but for the laws and policies of successive parliaments and governments, and I would say also uh, of, uh, of views of so many in the general community. Uh, actions across the board that have inflicted profound grief, suffering and loss uh, on Indigenous Australians. Uh, not just stolen generations' practices themselves. Uh, so that is also acknowledged in the general, if not in the specific, in this resolution. Uh, but it is not sufficient, and that's why I do also welcome the fact that the Prime Minister took the opportunity in speaking to this resolution to not just support the words in it, but to set goals uh, of uh, commitments for his government and for this parliament, I would believe, not just the government, but for this parliament, and I would hope the wider Australian community to seek to bridge and remove those gaps, those inequalities. Uh, this provides a platform for that and it's up to all of us to make sure we take advantage of that platform. It doesn't matter what words you put in here, the task is still before us to make sure that we take advantage of the opportunity that's provided. And I'd have to say one of those tasks is the need to address 
the significant level of antagonism towards Indigenous Australians that clearly still exists among a significant proportion of the Australian community. Uh, you only had to look at uh, letters to the editor, comments on websites, talkback radio. Uh, quite clearly, uh, a significant number of Australians uh, are still very antagonistic towards any sort of recognition of uh, the unique role of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Now, I'm not saying that everybody who had a problem with uh, a formal apology is antagonistic to Indigenous people. I'm not saying that at all. But I am saying that it's quite clear from the specific comments, uh, I think the, the uh, um, bigoted and prejudiced comments that a number of Australians make in regard to this issue since it's been raised that there is still a serious problem there and it is, it is not un-Australian, it is not um, uh, unpatriotic to raise that. I think it is actually unpatriotic to continue to ignore that uh, and that means that there is a job for all of us in, as community leaders, not just in the parliament but across the board, to address that antagonism, not just by going out and saying everybody's a bigot and a racist who doesn't agree, uh, but you do need to nonetheless acknowledge that that, um, that bigotry exists and to tackle head on the uh, clear uh, falsehoods that are put forward by some people uh, to justify uh, that bigotry uh, and to address some of the ignorance that still lies uh, out there in the general community uh, and the ignorance that still exists in so many of us. Uh, one of the uh, issues or one of the statements of the former Prime Minister that I often agreed with uh, was his uh, comments that we needed to learn more about Australian history. Uh, and one area where so many of us are still woefully ignorant uh, is the reality of the history of Indigenous Australians, history of Indigenous Australians before um, British arrival and uh, before that, uh, before British arrival, of course, other Europeans arrived here and before that, of course, uh, others from Asia arrived here, uh, but of the history even prior to that, but of course, even more so the history since colonisation, because there is still a lot of ignorance about that. and. Of course there are a lot of positives there, but there are some absolutely appalling atrocities uh, that we simply refuse to acknowledge. Uh, I do wish to take the opportunity to repeat my long-standing view and the Democrats' long-standing view that there is still a need to revisit the other recommendations of the Bringing Them Home report, um, particularly in regard to compensation. This resolution uh, of an apology is a standalone thing, as it should be, and I don't believe it should have addressed the issue of compensation. It doesn't in itself open up compensation. There's no doubt about that, despite some of the furfies put around. But I believe there is still a linked need to address the issue of compensation. If you go back to the rationale for the apology and the recommendation, recommendation number three, page 282 of the Bringing Them Home report, it makes clear in coming to the rationale of that recommendation that it is a package, an acknowledgement and apology goes hand in hand with guarantees against repetition, measures of restitution, measures of rehabilitation and monetary compensation. And that is based upon long-standing international principles regarding reparation and acknowledgement, uh, named as the Van Boven principles that are detailed in that report. Uh, they are intertwined and we should not seek to just slice them apart. So I would repeat my call. Uh, that that issue be re-examined uh, by the Senate, as the Senate committee did after this report came down in the late 1990s. Uh, and I think it's unacceptable that the federal government has just dismissed that out of hand without even re-examining it. Uh, and that's what I call for, and I will reintroduce my legislation uh, that seeks to provide one example of how compensation could be provided. That is another issue we can go on with. But we should all celebrate this resolution that was passed here today. Senator Joyce. Thank you, Mr. Deputy President. Um, look, it's, it's an interesting day today, and when walking around, you meet some very decent uh, people, um, Indigenous people, and so everything you say, you have to temper in the fact that there is no point in insulting people, and there's no point of uh, uh, making a statement of belligerence uh, for the purpose of what. The concern is today that uh, even today you could see in, in, the, in the, the way question time was going that the issues move on. And the biggest concern is that this issue will move on and in fact um, will be left behind. 
And in a year's time from now is when we truly can judge whether this was just a rhetorical day where, uh, where there was a great, a great sense of um, presence and possibly a sense of theatre, but it never actually delivered anything. Uh, in a year's time is when we have the ability to look back and say, well, did, it, did anything actually really get better for Indigenous people? Were their lives improved? Did we make uh, concrete statements to go out to, to where these people live and, and pick up the economies of those areas so as to pick up the health and the education and everything that goes with it? I know there are Australians out there who have serious doubts about this issue. Uh, I know that. I know everyone's drawing their, their, their affinities to the Indigenous issue, but uh, having, coming from Danglemar and going to uh, primary school in Moorbrook and having lived in Moree and Charleville, currently living in St George, I think I'm the furthest senator from the coast, um, having a house in Weiris Creek, I suppose I spent most of my life um, around um, Indigenous people and, and probably enriched because of it. But there's always a sense that Sometimes things turn into junkets, and if this thing turns into compensation, it will turn to a junket where money just gets poured um, in all sorts of directions, but generally in the directions of solicitors in Sydney and Melbourne. And, and who does it profit at the end except them? Now, who, who's the actual benefactor of it at the end except them? We saw that in so many of the, the land rights issues. And that is an eternal frustration for so many people in regional Australia that see that uh, so many of these statements are made down here. With all, the, with all the right atmosphere and all the right intentions, but where it all ends up is nowhere. And that is one of the frustrations I hope does not become evident after this pro process is, is finished. Um, there are certainly things in our history that you know, we need to uh, be concerned about. I, I can recollect stories that people have told me. I can think of the one where one person told me how their father went out and shot Aboriginals and uh, then grabbed the children by the back legs and smashed their head across a rock to kill them. Now that is a story that I heard. And uh, the person who was telling me had no reason to lie and uh, I was extremely disgusted and, uh, and disturbed by, by what he had said. I know obviously this, we all know the stories of the Mile Creek Massacre, of uh, the putting of arsenic into flour. We also know the stories of retribution where uh, Aboriginals were driven over cliffs um, to, uh, to try, well, basically just to kill them. And of those things, I am truly, uh, you know, offended that, you know, of, of any association that, uh, the, of any people with that. But it was never an association by the government. It was never an association by the government. It was an association by individuals who were criminals, not by the government. So I don't believe that. The government put forward policies with malice aforethought. That the government put forward policies that were distinctly um, targeted to be some sort of final solution. Because in some of the scripting, that's the way these things are, are, are seen, and I don't think that is right. They may have been misguided. They may have been wrong. They may have need to be corrected. But were they policies with malice aforethought? And that is—I don't know whether that's a blemish that we want. On our nation, we, we have every right to correct. We have every right to say, in a greater light, we have better knowledge, and he shouldn't have done it. But this is uh, not something I suggest that is the case. Um, in this process of going through this debate, it has to be said that a very dangerous precedent was created in this whole debate. This idea that we, are, like I am, I'm discussing an issue now, but the vote's gone. The vote's over. And we know it's a very important issue, but we've, we've, we've created a very dangerous precedent um, that um, once you've created it once, it becomes the excuse for others. And I think that needs to, needs to see the full light. And after this day has cooled down and after the, you know, the media have ha had their uh, time with it, I think we should really reflect on what we did today. Well, that was carry a vote um, without actually acknowledging that the, the debate can influence people. If you respect this chamber, you must respect the belief that people can say things that influence you. And today I've had the capacity to walk around and talk to Indigenous people, and they have influenced me because I'm a human being and, and you're affected by what people say to you. But to circumvent the process of the Senate and say there is a reason for that is, is really 
opening yourself wide up for things that may happen in the future. And I don't think I think that should be acknowledged. And I don't think we, we should ever do it again. And I think people should be brought into question as to whether we could have conducted this in a better way so as not to circumvent and disrespect the process of the Senate. Um, Another flaw, I think, is we see the world in 2008 is, 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 is a world, but the world of 2008 isn't the world of when uh, the initial acts were written in 1869. It was on the premise of an 1864 act. Um, it's a different world even to the 1970s. And we've got to be very careful that we don't start judging people's views of then by our views and values of now. Uh, there are people who did the wrong thing, but I don't think that. Uh, certain nuns who, who honestly would have believed they were trying to advance the, the condition of uh, fellow Australians who are Indigenous, I, I don't think we should target them with the word stolen, because I don't think they believed that they were stealing anybody. I don't believe that they thought that they were doing a criminal act. And the pejorative term stolen st sends that the people who did it were criminals, and they weren't. And so this is, uh, this is an issue that I also think needs to be, in the cold light of day, reflected on. And we've had a lot of symbolism here today, but we all know that symbolism neither feeds nor clothes nor cures anybody. And the issue of this will be judged whether in Wurrabinda or Kanamala or Burktown or Doomagee or maybe in Walgett or Tipperborough or Whitecliffs, that the pe lives of the people actually get better. That will be the real judgment of what happens here today. That will be the real judgment. And um, if it becomes a, 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 a lawyer's feast, if uh, when uh, unfortunately I would have liked to have seen the legal advice tabled, not because of political point scoring, but if this turns into a legal feast, then that just completely um, disavows a, a whole uh, clarity of what we were trying to do. And it also opens the avenue for other people to just be financial benefactors of the Indigenous issue. And that's happened so many times. So many people basically, uh, to be quite honest, white solicitors with harbour views become the, the financial benefactors of these issues by turning them into sort of a, a legal morass. And if that happens because of this, then that, I think, is, 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 not, a, is not a good issue. But in summary, um, uh, and to close, uh, there is a feeling, there is a, an immense sentiment in the nation, I acknowledge it, and I have changed my view of a sense of uh, reconciliation, true reconciliation, where people are talking to one another and acknowledging the humanity of one another and, seeing through, and, and putting aside uh, their conceits and, and maybe some of, some of the views they had prior to this. And maybe that inception has happened today. And if that happens today, that is a good thing. If that is a true inception of reconciliation, of me understanding someone better th than I did before, and possibly them understanding myself and, uh, and uh, other views, then, then that is a great step. I hope that, that view, that unfortunately, that view of uh, reconciliation has already had, in some instances today, the winds of animosity blowing through it and uh, blowing out the candles of reconciliation. And I hope that doesn't happen. If there's one good thing that happens from today, it's that we all go on a path together where, as a nation, we make lives not better just for Indigenous people but for all Australians in general. Senator, Who have we got? Senator Milne. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. Mr Deputy President, Australia changed this week, and I think it's really a very emotional and exciting week for this country. When I was first elected to this parliament in 2004, I gave my inaugural speech the following year, and I said then, what gives me hope is the increasingly loud and urgent cry from the heart of Australians everywhere for a return to what we know in our heart of hearts is country, a return to the spirit of the land and the expansive values of goodness, honesty, justice, fairness, equality, generosity, freedom and ecological stewardship that are for Australians inherent in the concept of country. I went on to say that I'm, what I was talking about in the concept of country is a precious insight we've learned from our Indigenous people. It incorporates the land and their stories. It's not jingoistic. In talking about country, 
We must, as a nation, progress reconciliation with Indigenous people. We must also progress our own reconciliation with country, our own sense of place and identity. And driving here this morning, I couldn't help but being quite overwhelmed and very emotional as I came around the front of parliament at half past seven in the morning and people <laughs> were streaming to the parliament at that hour. I, I have no recollection of any other time in my experience where people were coming from all over the city to the parliament to join indigenous people from all over the country who had already arrived here for the convergence yesterday. And they were lining up in dignified silence but quiet yearning and excitement about the fact that at last this parliament seemed to be in touch with the feeling of the nation. And as I, I witnessed that, I thought this is actually a nation changing event. It is something that I had hoped would have that impact, but I felt that as I saw all of those people coming towards the parliament. And after the official apology given by the Prime Minister this morning around in the coffee shop here at parliament, I had the um, good fortune to meet an Indigenous woman called Lois who said to me, I am proud to be an Aboriginal woman in Australia today and it's the first time I have been able to say that in my life. So things have already changed. And yesterday at the convergence, speaking to Luidja O'Donoghue, she said of the rain yesterday as the welcome to country was taking place, it is the tears of joy of our ancestors, referring to the fact that we, the elected representatives of the people of Australia, were seeking permission from the indigenous owners of the land, the Ngunnawal people, for permission to meet and walk on their land. That is what changed. It is, it is extraordinary and it is, it's a really deep yearning inside indigenous people for recognition and for an expression of sorrow and regret for what has been done to them but it's also a breaking down of the damn wall for all the people across Australia who have marched for reconciliation, who have moved right across the country for re uh, recompense and restitution for the wrongs that have been done to Indigenous people, and it hasn't happened, and now there's a sense that it might happen. I feel particularly humble as well because I was in balance of power in Tasmania in 1997 and I helped to negotiate the apology to the stolen generation in the Tasmanian parliament with a Liberal minority government. And we did it in a tripartite way and we brought onto the floor of the House Tasmania's Indigenous people. And Annette Pearden responded for the Indigenous Tasmanians and for the stolen generation. And it was a particularly dignified occasion and Tasmania has moved on because of that ownership of all political parties of the apology, of the recognition of the wrong that had been done, that it has been now moved to a smooth process of compensation. And the same is occurring in Western Australia, and it can and will happen nationally. There are terrible stories of what has happened. For example, an Aboriginal boy runs through a Hobart street carrying eight and a half pints of stolen milk. The milk has a value of nowadays $1.12. It is the 1960s. Within days, not only the boy, but the family's three other children have been rounded up and made wards of the state. In court, a welfare officer says the boy's behaviour is typical of, quote, people of their origin. I cannot imagine, as a, as a mother, what it would feel like to have your children taken from you in this way, in any way, but in this way. I cannot imagine the loss of living one's life and going to your grave never knowing, and the loss for the children who never know the love of their parents. And in fact, the children 
in, in the, one of the submissions from New South Wales in the Bringing Them Home report said this, we may go home but we cannot relive our childhoods. We may reunite with our mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, aunties, uncles, communities, but we cannot relive the 20, 30, 40 years that we spent without their love and care, and they cannot undo the grief and mourning they felt when we were separated from them. We can go home to ourselves as Aboriginals, but this does not erase the attacks inflicted on our hearts, minds, bodies and souls by caretakers who thought their mission was to eliminate us as Aboriginals. The Greens have said sorry in the parliaments around this country, but I am, I am very grateful for the opportunity to say sorry again and to support the Rudd government in making this official apology uh, to the stolen generation. I think of, in particular, of people like Archie Roach, who have campaigned for this day for many, many years as one of the stolen generation himself. His famous 1990 album, Charcoal Lane, in which he, he, his song, Took the Children Away, Moved the Nation, and still does. And in that song he says, they taught us to read, to write and pray, then they took the children away, took the children away. The children away, snatched from their mother's breast, said this is for the best, took them away. The welfare man, the policeman said, you've got to understand, because we'll give to them what you can't give and teach them how to really live. Teach them how to live, they said, humiliated them instead. And they taught them that and taught them this and others taught them prejudice. They took the children away, took the children away, breaking their mother's heart, tearing us all apart, took them away. And today I note that Archie Roach has said, like many Aboriginal people, he hoped the apology would be a beginning rather than an end. Once this is done, he said, perhaps we can then make an inroads into other issues. I understand that an apology is not going to solve all the problems or the plight of Aboriginal people, but it's going to help. It's going to help people to feel a bit more free to go ahead. It will help me and my children. That is something which I find incredibly humbling. Uh, what I find in particular so overwhelmingly humbling is the, the dignity and the tolerance and the wisdom and the nobleness of the Indigenous people who are accepting this apology and accepting it in good faith as a first step. And it must be a first step. It must be a first step to reparation, to compensation, and it must be a first step to say to Australia's Indigenous people uh, that we are serious about reconciling with them and coming home to country and assisting them to come home to their country. And as Australians, recognising that this is a brand new day. In the words of um, Ujiru Nunakal, look up my people, the dawn is breaking, the world is waking to a, bright, uh, to a new bright day where none defame us, no restriction tame us, nor colour shame us, nor sneer dismay. This is a historic day and I am so pleased to be able to be here to say sorry to the stolen generation of Australia's Indigenous people. Senator Humphreys. Uh, thank you, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, the uh, uh, Australian Parliament um, has this week uh, taken a bold and decisive step, an historic step, uh, quite unprecedented uh, at this level of uh, Australian government, although it should be said not unprecedented at another uh, level of Australian government. Uh, this week uh, we have uh, engineered, I believe, a measure of resolution to an issue which has troubled and divided us as Australians for more than 10 years. We've used the authority, the gravitas of Parliament, as a tool to achieve an important public policy objective, not through uh, the enactment of legislation, but through the symbolism of a solemn and bipartisan uh, resolution to end a decisive 
a rather a divisive chapter in the history of our relations with Indigenous Australia. I'm very, very proud to uh, be here today to participate in this process and proud that, uh, albeit belatedly, my party, the Liberal Party, has joined and endorsed this endeavour. I'm proud because this step is significant, significant far beyond the walls of this and the other chamber. Very often the things we do here reach the consciousness of uh, Australians generally as a dull and distant impression, if they indeed reach them at all. The things we have done today uh, here in this place uh, will undoubtedly be felt by huge numbers of Australians uh, in the most immediate and direct way. This week we have said sorry for the actions over several decades uh, of churches, institutions, police officers, court officials, doctors, individuals and, by implication, governments in participating in the involuntary removal of children from their families on the basis of their race. However well-meaning those actions, they led to enormous grief and heartache. Those actions did great damage to the confidence and self-esteem of those children, damage which resonates today decades after the practice of forced removal has ended. It has been pointed out that many removals of Indigenous children are undertaken for the best of motives, and that, objectively speaking, the material, educational and health outcomes of those so separated were improved by virtue of their removal to other circumstances. In a physical sense, this will often have been true. Not always, of course, but often it will have been true. But that observation overlooks a very important consequence of forced removal. I had the privilege of participating in the Forgotten Australians inquiry, the, the sand inquiry into children in institutional care, one of uh, what Senator Murray refers to as the trifecta of reports on child welfare. That particular inquiry, the third in the series, reported in August 2004 and gave uh, those involved um, an insight into how damaging, uh, or how damaging uh, children has a ripple effect felt throughout society, creating very often damaged and dysfunctional adults. While we took evidence uh, from hundreds of people in that inquiry who had been separated from their families, often has to be said very dysfunctional families, I tried to identify that element of their separation which was most distressing, most harmful to their development as balanced human beings. And surprisingly, the answer was not uh, mistreatment or abuse at the hands of the institutions or foster families to which they were consigned, although of course many people gave evidence of mistreatment in those circumstances. But the fact of separation from people that these children believed loved them and wanted them and missed them. The separation from family, where the children were old enough to remember their families, was the single most corrosive factor undermining that child's sense of well-being, which no amount of care and material comfort could offset. If that was true, of the general population of separated children, it was at least as true uh, of separated Indigenous children. Clearly, for so many children, that knowledge of their real family, kept from them by a cruel authority, was a constant gnawing pain, a rot to the soul which would leave a deep, indelible mark on every child, no matter how decent their treatment in their later homes. I was recently reading a collection of short stories told by Indigenous people about their experience of growing up apart from their families, in homes and institutions where they were made to feel that their Aboriginality was a cause for humiliation and shame. Some of these stories pulsed with anger. Others were overlaid with a great sadness, a sense of loss. One particular story caught my eye because while the author spoke bluntly about the damage done to him and his family by their forced separation, 
He also spoke positively about the need to look forward towards a better future. He wrote, the past cannot be changed, but some of the wounds can be healed. I can think of no better way to express uh, what we all fear he feel here today and what we as a community are aiming to achieve through this apology. The decades since the releasing of the Bringing Them Home report has shown that wounds this deep cannot heal on their own. The previous federal government worked to improve the lot of Indigenous Australians in a range of practical ways, particularly through major funding and support for health, education and social welfare programs. But of course there was something missing in that approach. By not apologising for past wrongs, uh, we have been unable to draw a line between then and now, between what was done in the past and what we plan to do in the future. And so it has been, in some ways, hard for our community, black and white, to heal. Uh, for me, this uh, motion uh, today is about drawing that line. It says to the children of the Cootamundra Girls' Home, St Mary's Hostel, Retta Dixon House, the Parramatta Girls' Home, the Kinchella Boys' Home, Bedford Park and dozens of other homes and missions that we regret the way they were treated, we acknowledge it to have been wrong and we intend to ensure that it does not happen again to future generations. In doing so, we face up to an unpalatable truth about Australia's history. The nature of this truth has been much disputed. Exactly how many children were taken, for how long, uh, and where to is sometimes <coughs> ambiguous, certainly not becoming any clearer as time goes on. Some people say that because of this uncertainty we, should be issuing, we shouldn't be issuing an, an apology today. To be perfectly frank, that's just a cop-out. We know without doubt that some people in some past times experienced pain, suffering and loss of identity as a result of the policies and actions of successive Australian governments, and for that we should rightly be sorry. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, um, it is important for us to use today to be positive about the future and to acknowledge that despite the pain and disadvantage and dispossession which uh, these policies um, engendered, that many people, uh, both uh, through their own endeavours and, I hope, as a result of today's actions, will be able to move forward in a positive way and offset, at least partly, uh, the nature of the experience that they have suffered. Uh, one such uh, person uh, who appears to have had some level of resolution uh, is a man called John Williams Mosley, um, a, a, a man taken from the Palm Valley area of the Northern Territory when he was eight months old, uh, separated from his mother at that very tender age. And some years later he was able to meet his mother in these circumstances, and I wish to uh, quote from that. I spoke to my mother for the first time when I was 27 years old. The time was 11.37 p.m. on Friday, the 15th of September, 1978. I had just arrived at Tennant Creek from Sydney, where I'd lived and worked for the previous 27 years. Um, uh, he, saw, he describes how he, uh, he came to a house in Tennant Creek. My eyes followed the path in front of me to where I saw the silhouette of a woman standing in the half-light of the open door. Her hands were clasped together in front of her body, and she stood perfectly still. Even in the darkness I could see tears rolling down her chubby cheeks. She held out her arms to embrace me and I walked into them. We held each other for the longest time. I was home. Uh, I hope that by today's actions we help more uh, dispossessed, separated uh, people in this country to come home. And that would be the earnest hope, I'm sure, of everybody in this place today. Senator Bishop. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President, for the opportunity to make a contribution to this debate concerning the national apology to the stolen generation. This has indeed been a remarkable and lively topic of discussion for many, many years, more than we all care to remember. And it is appropriate, it is entirely proper, that there is now resolution of this most horrific of issues. It's time to move forward. The symbolism that this resolution represents is very, very important, as many people in a range of forums have repeatedly suggested. But more important now 
is that outcomes come and which are critical to a permanent resolution deriving from the harm that has occurred to so many Australians over the last 40 or 50 or more so years. Mr Acting Deputy President, some more than 20 years ago I attended uh, some conferences in New York City and attended upon some senior officials of the Retail and Wholesale Department Store Employees Union in that city. It in those days had some 250 or 300,000 members, a significant union, on the east coast of the United States. And I met for some time with a senior representative of that union in New York City. He was a man of uh, African American extraction. And after we, we exchanged the customary pleasantries and had our discussion on the business at hand on a range of then topical issues, somehow or other the conversation shifted to issues germane to the treatment of Indigenous people in Australia in the 70s and 80s. And the dis discussion meandered on for some time. This man was in his 50s uh, and had been a veteran of the civil rights movement and battles in the United States in the 50s and 60s before he went on to another part of the uh, liberal movement in the United States. And at the end of the discussion, he looked at me with the most steely blue eyes and said, I meet a lot of Australians. A lot of Australians come and meet with me. And the common factor that you all bring to the discussions is the way you treat Aboriginal people in your own country. He said, I don't know why you all raise this issue with me, but you do so, and we have the discussions. And you must be the 20th or 30th person over the years who has raised these sorts of issues in my country, the United States. And he said to me at the end, young man, and I was very young in those days, he said, young man, I tire of these conversations with you from the other end of the world. Why don't you just go home and fix those problems, because the fact that you've raised them here suggests to me that you are responsible and you need to attend to those problems in your own home. I've always remembered that conversation, and as I was thinking of the comments I should make today, it reminded me of those. In addition to those comments, I bring two other perspectives to this debate. Firstly, Again, many, many years ago, I had exposure to hundreds of files in Perth held by the government relating to uh, in the old, what was then the old Department of Aboriginal Affairs or the Department of Native Welfare, and those files went right back to the 1920s and 1930s. And they'd been assiduously maintained in a warehouse back in 1982 or 83 that was located in West Perth. And I had exposure to those files uh, for many, many weeks on end doing some work. And in those files, properly maintained in detail, were hundreds and hundreds of letters written from the 1920s through into the 1960s from mothers and fathers of children who had gone missing or who had been removed or had been stolen, stolen imploring the bureaucrats in, the in whatever the department was called to give them advice as to why their child was taken, where the child was now, what the name of the child was, what had happened to the child. And there's hundreds and hundreds of these letters, mostly written in a beautiful script uh, um, and pouring out the emotions of these parents who had lost their children over some 40 or 50 or 60 years. The most heartfelt correspondence. And indeed, there was other correspondence from, pl from policemen and priests and pastors and local chambers of commerce and business people writing on behalf of other Indigenous people who presumably were illiterate but asking 
uh, for details as to where their children might be, how they might be located. And on each file there was a simple comment. Government policy, advice, sender, we don't have to respond, we don't have any advice. And I remember as a 20 or 25 year old being exposed to those letters and thinking how horrible it must have been. The second perspective I bring is something that's occurred in more recent years where I have had exposure to a lot of uh, uh, basically, I suppose, uh, younger uh, children, not Aboriginal children, white children, who have been uh, through the court system in Perth. Um, and they come from what by any description would be called uh, dysfunctional families, whether their mother or father uh, is the subject of alcohol abuse, physical abuse, drug addiction, unemployment, a whole range of issues. And often the courts have to make a decision that the child or young boy or girl is to be removed from their parents and put into some form of foster home or welfare or institution. And my observation is, almost without exception, no matter how bad the child's upbringing might be, how dysfunctional the parent or parents might be, how man manipulative or dishonest or engaging in, in grossly improper practices or engaging in, uh, in, in acts of abuse, either of a physical or mental nature, against those young boys and girls from the age of about five or six when they be develop the ability to reason and to the age of 13 or 14 when they develop the sense of right and wrong, almost without exception those young boys and girls resist to the end being removed from their mother or father. No matter how bad their home might be, how often they're not fed, washed, sent to school, provided with love or affection, no matter how bad it is, it is they do not wish to be removed from their mother or father. So in that context, it still goes on, and it must have been absolutely horrific for those thousands and thousands of young Indigenous people uh, and their parents to be separated forcibly. In that context, a number of people have made the observation today that past actions shouldn't be judged by contemporary standards. A very, very interesting comment because to me it seems to confuse absolute concepts of right and wrong and a relativist approach to issues. Always and without exception, it is wrong to steal, to engage in murder, to engage in rape, to engage in theft and like offences. It doesn't matter whether it was in the days of Hammurabi giving down the laws to the Assyrians or Solon's Athens. Always and without exception, those offences are wrong. And there is no justification for doing them or engaging in them. They might be lawful acts and they might be carried out pursuant to decisions of government policy. But they are always and without exception wrong. Um, and it is entirely proper to judge those absolute acts by today's standards because they were absolutely wrong then and they are absolutely wrong now. So, Mr Directing Deputy President, uh, these, these, this, this debate now moves to practicalities and resolving the absolute poverty, the absolute Order. The Honourable Senator's time has expired. Senator Bernardi. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. In rising to take note of this motion, I would like to open my contribution by stating that I do not personally feel any sense of guilt for what has happened during Australia's brief history. I should also state that I am a very strong supporter of the very limited role that I believe government should occupy. I support an increasing self-reliance for all Australians and a reduced role of government in their lives. And today is a stark reminder that government intervention, no matter how well intentioned, may not actually benefit the people, but indeed it can in fact do the opposite. 
And that is not to say that governments haven't had a positive impact on the lives of Indigenous Australians. The Howard government stood firm in the face of great adversity to achieve practical outcomes for Indigenous people. We tried to break the cycle of poverty, of hopelessness and of dysfunction that afflicted many Aboriginal communities. And we did it by drawing a line between what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. We drew a line between what is right and what is wrong. We ceased to accept excuses and we tried to move forward. I realise now that what we didn't do was embrace the symbolism that is represented by an apology to the Aboriginal people for transgressions of previous government policies. But I do not believe that the uh, previous government, nor indeed any previous government, should stand condemned for this. There is no doubt in my mind that past practices in relation to the treatment of Indigenous Australians have caused significant distress to a number of people within that community. I am in no doubt that some children were unjustly taken from their families. But equally, I have no doubt that many of the so-called stolen generation were saved what would have been an all too brief uh, life of neglect and, in some instances, abuse. And let me be very clear that abuse, especially of children, can never and should never be defendable. I know that physical and sexual abuse of separated children took place in many areas of our community, and most alarmingly, it took place in the very areas in which, they, in which were designed to be sanctuaries. It was wrong, and it continues to be wrong. But unfortunately today, much of that abuse is now taking place within Aboriginal communities. And this is the substance of my contribution today. We need to stop the errors of the past from being a reason not to confront the vile acts of today. For my entire life, I've observed any number of excuses for dysfunction amongst some areas of Indigenous Australia. When I was 14, I was set upon by a gang of Aboriginal youths for daring to be on their land, as they put it, which happened to be Glenelg Beach in South Australia. Their violence went unpunished because, as I was told by a policeman, nothing would happen to them because they were Aboriginal. As a publican, I remember rescuing an Aboriginal woman from a savage attack on the street by her husband. And after providing her sanctuary within my premises, a group of elders then came to visit me and told me that unless I told her to leave my premises, they would, and I quote, destroy my hotel. For too long, this type of behaviour has gone unchallenged. For too long, excuses have been made that have established Indigenous issues in the minds of many Australians as simply too hard to deal with. And that is why I think today is very important. As I said, I feel no personal remorse or sorrow. In fact, I'm quite optimistic about the future because I feel that today is a day that our nation can move on together. And while saying sorry is a symbolic gesture, because, and it is a symbolic gesture because surely none of us can truly believe that tomorrow we'll see an end to the alcoholism, the violence, the child rape, the incest, the abuse that takes place in so many, in too many Aboriginal communities today. But tomorrow can see an end to the excuses for this type of abhorrent behaviour, because today is the first step in achieving reconciliation. But it is only the first step because reconciliation requires not just an act of self-mortification or sorrow. Reconciliation also requires forgiveness. And that is now the challenge confronting Indigenous Australia. They need to ditch the industry that has sprung up preventing the real cha changes the policy areas that can have a significant impact on Indigenous communities from taking effect. They need to reject the inevitable overtures from the no-win, no-fee ambulance-chasing lawyers that will pop up as soon as tomorrow, I would guess, in pursuing billions of dollars in compensation. To do anything else would demonstrate that this call for sorry is more about compensation rather than reconciliation, and I sincerely hope that this is not the case. Senator Webber. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise uh, with a great deal of pride to associate myself with this resolution, because it's resolutions like this that I think really do uh, are, really are examples of what this parliament can do well. It does actually remind people that we are the national parliament, and it's only the national parliament that can take a proper stance on these issues. It's just a pity it's taken us so long to get there. 
When I was uh, thinking about the remarks I would like to make today, I was drawn to some, to some comments that uh, my good friend and former Premier of Western Australia, Dr Jeff Gallup, made when, when he was discussing a similar motion that went through the uh, Western Australian State Parliament in 1997. He commenced his remarks by telling the story of a person that he called Paul. He said he mentioned that Paul was not the real name of the person he was talking about, and I was drawn to that story that he spoke about because Paul was separated from his mother in 1964 when, she, when he was a baby. That is some one year before I was born. So these issues are very relevant to people of my generation. This isn't uh, necessarily an issue just to do with our um, more distant past. People are still living with this pain today. Dr Gallup went on to talk about Paul's separation from his mother. He said it was all done with the stroke of a pen and without his mother's knowledge, and that her subsequent efforts to find her son were treated with contempt by the department. Paul spent his, year, his growing up years in in an appalling series of replacement homes. Um, there were breakdowns, cold institutions and cruel foster homes. When he was formally discharged from wardship at the age of 18 in 1982, he was given his file, which contained some 368 pages of old letters, photographs and birthday cards. The last page of his file stated that he was a very intelligent, likeable boy who had made remarkable progress given the unfortunate treatment of his mother by the department during his childhood. Paul said, his te said that tears flowed when he read those words. They were tears from a mixture of relief at knowing, finally knowing about his past, of guilt and of anger about what had been done to him and his mother. I think it's important that we talk about stories like Paul's. As Prime Minister Rudd has said, the challenge for those of us who are not Indigenous Australians is to ask one very simple question. What if that was me? What if I was Paul? How would I feel? And that is, it should be the test of how we feel about passing motions like today. Political parties of all persuasions, particularly the, ma particularly the major political parties in Australian politics, uh, rightly acknowledge families as the cornerstone of our society. We, wait, we make much of our laws and policies that are intended to strengthen and help families and keep them together. It's often an issue that we debate in this place. But the rights of those families, the right of the family, have to be applied to all Australian families. And for far too long, until more recent times and until motions like today are passed, for far too long, Aboriginal families were torn apart by the very authorities that should have been there to protect them. And they were torn apart for no other reason than for the colour of people's skins. Those of us in this place, because uh, here we represent different interests in different states and in the other place, of course, different geographic locations, we know with, uh, with that role the importance that, I that identity places to people. We know how important it is to learn of our identity and the identity of our community, to learn of our historical connections and our relationships through history. That's what we do if we are truly human. The fundamental right people have to establish their identity, however, was taken away through an active policy throughout the states and territories and the Commonwealth of Australia for our Indigenous people. That policy was based upon the premise that Aboriginality had no role to play in the Australian community. By passing this motion today, we now have the opportunity <coughs> to tell our Indigenous Australians that they are part of our society, they are part of our history, and that they are part of our community, and that we apologise to them for the efforts made by earlier governments to attempt to deny them that very basic right. 
So let us, as a parliament, come together. Let us offer dignity to Indigenous Australians about their own history and its, and its effect on our national history, our shared national history, by acknowledging the past forcible removal of Indigenous children and offering our deepest apologies for what happened in the past. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to make some brief remarks uh, in uh, this very, very important parliamentary discussion, and I'm pleased to have the honour, as I regard it, of participating in this uh, parliamentary resolution of apology. I do think it is an occasion of great significance for our parliament, for Indigenous Australians, for our nation and for our nation's future. Since my first speech in 1997, which I'll avoid the self-indulgence of actually quoting, I have supported an apology to Indigenous Australians of the stolen generations. It was not necessarily a popular claim to make in 1997 from my side of the chamber. I think today's resolution, though, is a very important step in the history of reconciliation in this country. And to those men and women who have campaigned long and hard for this apology and in other aspects of reconciliation, I truly hope that you are able to take a great deal from this day and from this parliamentary resolution. I've heard other speakers uh, today in this chamber and elsewhere talk <coughs> about their experience of living in Indigenous communities, and I can't lay claim to that experience. However, I have found in the last uh, 10 or so years that one of the great privileges of this role in the Senate has been an opportunity to have learned much more about Indigenous Australia and Australians than I had known before I came here. For that, I thank some of my colleagues who, uh, who were in, part, in part formed uh, the instruction team uh, along the way based on their own enthusiasm and own interest, and perhaps ironically, I thank the Senate committee process. The committee processes of the Senate, uh, I think, are sometimes regarded as a practice of the darker arts, but in this case, it is indeed a, great valuable, a greatly valuable experience and has afforded me a chance across the nation in the Northern Territory, in Queensland, in Western Australia, in New South Wales, in Victoria, here in Canberra, to meet with a range of leading Indigenous Australians and many members of the community to discuss a very broad list of issues over time, from the issue we discuss here today, the stolen generations, the subject of this motion, to the detention of juvenile offenders, to reconciliation more broadly and, in fact, more recently, to the question of stolen wages. With my colleagues, I have heard many personal stories and testimonials in these discussions, sometimes highly emotional and highly disturbing, sometimes so coldly factual that they were even more devastating in their effect about some of the personal and family experiences of these, our fellow Australians. And through that process of, uh, of listening, overwhelmingly listening, I have been persuaded that the symbolism of this apology is indeed very important and it, that it does have the capacity to make a real difference to our capacity to move forward in relations between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. I've been interested listening to some of the discussions about the value of symbols. It seems to me that as members and senators in this place, we work in an environment laden with symbolism and in 2008 still redolent with tradition. I think it's actually very difficult for us to judge for others, culturally and personally, what is a validly important symbol. But I do hope that this symbolic step of apology does have the desired outcome for members of the stolen generation and their families and is a step forward on the path to reconciliation in Australia. In saying that, Mr Acting Deputy President, 
It is emphatically not a rejection of the importance of what has become known as practical reconciliation. Without the basic advantages of life that the overwhelming majority of Australians take for granted in terms of health and life expectancy and education and living circumstances, and so the list goes on, without those there is no capacity to move forward. And I absolutely acknowledge that and want that to be a very important part of my remarks this afternoon. But the link between symbolic and practical reconciliation that I hope this apology establishes and confirms is one which I further hope enables us as a nation to, uh, to move so much further forward. I particularly in the last 10 years want to acknowledge and congratulate the women of Indigenous Australia that I've had the most extraordinary honour and pleasure of meeting. In so many cases, it has been their leadership in their communities, in their families, in the face of unknowable adversity for women in the situation that I, the previous speaker and many others in this place enjoy. It has been their leadership that has enabled governments to actually pick up the steps of pra practical reconciliation and move, though, move towards implementation uh, in that regard. Mr Acting Deputy President, I quite honestly can't imagine the pain of being separated from one's living family. I have enough trouble dealing on a daily basis with the loss of both my parents relatively early in adulthood. But I do know that my family grounds me, that my family helps me know where I actually belong. In his remarks in the members' hall today, I heard a person for whom I have an enormous amount of respect, Tom Kalmer, the Social Justice Commissioner of the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission, talk about the importance of belonging in the context of this apology and in the context of the experiences of his own family. It's not rocket science to understand that if you're dislocated, if you're separated from your family, that it's hard to know where you belong. And that doesn't just go for Indigenous Australians, of course, but today is about the impact of these actions, of these policies on Indigenous Australians over decades in this country. When I finally saw the resolution moved uh, by the government yesterday afternoon, after waiting, I thought quite patiently, not something I'm known for, I was struck particularly by the last, I think they are the last five clauses of the resolution, which refer so importantly to the future. A future where the parliament is able to resolve that these injustices must never be repeated. Where we are able to harness the determination of all Australians that hopefully today will reinforce to close the gaps that I spoke about before, life expectancy, education and economy. A future where we do look at new solutions to enduring problems where, as the resolution says, old approaches have failed and without an acknowledgement of that it is impossible to move forward. A future that is based on mutual respect, mutual resolve and mutual responsibility. And one in the last clause which says where all Australians, whatever their origins, are truly equal partners, with equal opportunities and with an equal stake in shaping the next chapter in the history of this great country. They are, Mr Acting Deputy President, very powerful words and ones to which I am very proud to commit myself absolutely. I think the parliamentary resolution is one which provides for this nation in so many ways an opportunity to advance on the path of reconciliation and something which uh, I am proud to see uh, we can all participate in here today. Senator Forshaw. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to um, support uh, the resolution of this Senate and the extension of the apology on behalf of the parliament to the members of the stolen generation and their families, and indeed to all of the Aboriginal and uh, Torres Strait Islander Indigenous people of this country. Uh, it is often said that um, Words have no real meaning without actions, that uh, words can never hurt, 
or that uh, you know, that old uh, saying that uh, sticks and stones will break your bones but won't, words will never hurt me. Well, it's not true, Mr Acting Deputy President. Words are powerful. Words can hurt, but words can heal. And today, what we are doing is through this apology, these remarkable words, we are endeavouring to help to heal. To say that we apologise for the wrongs of the past. And indeed, we apologise for the mistreatment, the neglect that still continues today. And that is why it is so important for the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people, for the Indigenous people of this great nation. They have known all along how important the apology would be to them. They know that it doesn't uh, uh, necessarily right all the wrongs, but they know how deeply important it is that we extend this apology. And we, the non-Indigenous people of this country, have come finally to understand the power of the words that an apology would have, that it would mark a turning point in the history of this nation when we finally, in a public way, at the level of the parliament of this nation, extended this apology. I have listened to the speech of the Prime Minister and heard the speech of the Leader of the uh, Government in the Senate today and listened to other speeches and there's not really much I can add to what has been said because it has been said and rather than try and, um, as it were, you know, be eloquent about it in my own terms, I, I simply adopt and endorse the words of the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Government in the Senate and of the other leaders and representatives of this parliament that they have put. I can't do it any better. And um, I think really, in some respects, whilst today it is important to reflect upon the what was in the Bringing Them Home report. Um, it is also, I think, important to, to recognise that, that an apology often can be simple and more powerful. So, saying you're sorry um, should say it all, and I hope it does. I listened to uh, and I, I read the report a couple of years ago and I've listened to the recounting of the stories of those stolen generations and like all senators and members, you know, you, you feel, um, um, uh, you know, the, uh, and understand, try to understand the, the terrible circumstances in which many of those people um, uh, had to, uh, to grow up torn from their families and their loved ones. Mr Acting Deputy President, um, where I come from in the Sutherland Shire, um, it of course is often characterised as the birthplace of the Australian nation. When Captain Cook landed at what is now Kurnell um, on the April the 29th, 1770. And for many years, that date was commemorated and celebrated as the date of the birthplace of the Australian nation. Each year, a ceremony would be held at Kurnell on the shores of Botany Bay. But some years ago, we realised 
the Sutherland Shire Council and, and others realised that that was not appropriate. That rather we had to recognise on that same day that it was also the day when the dispossession, if you like, of the lands of the Indigenous people commenced to occur in this country. And so what happened was the day the commemoration was changed from one which not just only celebrated and commemorated Cook's great voyage of discovery and landing in Australia at Botany Bay, but also that this was a meeting of two cultures, that this was a symbolic day for the Aboriginal people. And now each year on the 29th of April, that ceremony celebrates both Cook's Landing but also recognises the incredible impact that that uh, event ultimately led to in terms of the Indigenous people of this country. And each year, Indigenous people representatives of the community of that area um, participate in that ceremony in a way in which we saw the uh, ceremony yesterday with the welcome to country here in Parliament House. And so it is now celebrated as and commemorated as not as either a, an achievement or as a dispossession, which it was, depending upon which way you look at it, from which perspective of either white Australia or Indigenous people, but rather as a meeting of two cultures and an opportunity to go forward and endeavour to ensure that Indigenous people of this country, uh, their culture is protected and enriched. Yesterday I attended the ecumenical service um, at St Christopher's here in Manuka prior for the opening of Parliament and I was impressed by the sermon of um, Bishop, uh, Archbishop Coleridge where there was reference made to I think the fact that uh, Pope John Paul VI expressed sorrow for the treatment that the Catholic Church had over centuries extended or, or um, meted out to people of the Jewish faith. And I raise that because at the heart of Christianity, of course, is the concept of expressing sorrow. And I think it's in that context that we should, certainly those of us who follow the Christian faith, should, uh, should also consider this event. It's not about whether or not, you know, we personally were responsible for the misdeeds and the treatment and the massacres and the dispossession that occurred in the past. Now, that may certainly be a historical fact that we personally are not responsible. But that, that is not the point. The point is that you know, if we believe in righting the wrongs of the past, it is appropriate for us to express our sorrow an apology for those deeds that were done in the past. And when I hear speakers refer to what has happened with the Northern Territory intervention as a result of the Little Children Are Sacred report, I ask myself, why is it that some of us can recognise that that mistreatment needs to be dealt with now, but somehow we should, not, we should ignore or not recognise the importance of all of the mistreatment that went before it. And indeed, much of what is happening today within those Aboriginal communities that we are endeavouring to fix through that intervention is a result of that legacy. I Thank sincerely apologise to the stolen generations. Thank you, Senator Forshaw. Senator Adams. Thank you, Mr. Senator Acton. Adams. Sorry? Senator Adams. Yes. So, so who are you calling? Senator <laughs> Adams. Oh, right. I thought you were looking at me, aren't you? No. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Acton, Deputy President. Um, I was confused too, seeing your eyes. I enjoyed it. Uh, Good, right. <laughs> 
<laughs> Thank you. I rise this evening to speak to the national apology which was moved on behalf of the Australian Parliament earlier today. I will be honest and say it is hard to apologise for a series of wrongs carried out under various Acts of Parliament many years ago. The people who carried out these wrongs obviously thought that they were doing the best for Indigenous children at that time. But as we learn more about the problems which occurred then, we are all horrified that something like this could happen in our country. But I also concur with my colleagues who have spoken earlier today that this apology is the first step forward into the future. As we have heard this morning, this future is to be based on mutual respect, mutual resolve and mutual responsibility. And I must say at this stage that I was very disappointed as a senator that we were not invited to go into the other place to um, actually hear the words of the apology, because I felt looking around the chamber here, uh, we were all alone. Um, we couldn't actually hear the Prime Minister deliver that apology. So um, I don't know the reason, but I do think at nine o'clock our House did not um, commence until 9.30 that perhaps we should have been perhaps invited there, but that's in hindsight. So I've um, certainly read what was said. And um, I would like to say at this stage that developments in Australia's states and territories uh, towards an apology certainly um, happened after the bringing, the home, bringing Them Home report was tabled. And to date, all state and territory parliaments have passed motions expressing regret for past actions with respect to Aboriginal families, and most of the motions include an explicit apology for the forced separation of children. New South Wales did this on the 18th of June in 1997, South Australia on the 28th of May 1997, Queensland the 3rd of June 1997, Western Australia on the 27th and 28th of May 1997, the Australian Capital Territory the 17th of June 1997, Victoria the 17th of September 1997, and Tasmania the 13th of August 1997. And I just would like, being a, a senator from Western Australia, I would just like to read the uh, Western Australian contribution on the 27th of May 1997, which was ta uh, tabled as Aborigines and Family Separation. Mr Court, the Premier, it is appropriate that this House show respect for Aboriginal families that have been forcibly separated as a consequence of government policy in the past by observing a period of silence, and members at that time stood for one minute silence. The next day, on the 28th of May 1997, Aborigines and family separation. Dr Gallup, Leader of the Opposition. I move that this House apologises to the Aboriginal people on behalf of all West Australians for the past policies under which Aboriginal children were removed from their families and expresses deep regret at the hurt and distress that this caused. Now, this was the start. and. Um, as uh, we uh, have heard from many speakers, um, the Howard government also, um, in, uh, earlier on, um, passed a motion of respect for what had happened, but this was not an apology. Um, today has uh, certainly changed the lives, I hope, for those people that have felt that deep hurt, and um, as it was a unanimous decision from uh, both the government and the alternative government, I do hope that this is going to go some way to helping in the future. And there are ways that we can do this. Um, I've perhaps just paused to say that, uh, unfortunately, in Western Australia, possibly um, Western Australians, whether they've had more contact with their um, Aboriginal counterparts or we've had a number of problems there, Headlines in the paper say WA voters reject this is in the West Australian WA voters reject Rudd's apology. And then we have um, from Jerry Warber, a member of the Stolen Generation, he's a 75-year-old who was brought up at um, Sister Kate's home, says an apology will not change the past. 
sorry, just another word. That's headlines in the West Australian as well on the February the 2nd. And uh, just to quote Mr Warber, saying sorry is only a matter of rhetoric because some people are demanding it and it opens the floodgates for compensation. And the compensation is something that worries me as well, but I will discuss that later. But uh, Mr Warber and uh, his, um, a number of other older Aboriginals who grew up at Sister Kate's have um, been working very, very hard. They are a family and they are trying to um, raise a million, a nine million dollars um, which is close to fruition, which will enable two groups of former Sister Kate's children to build an aged care home and a healing centre on the site so they can spend their later years in the company of some of the only family many of them have known. And I think this is a great incentive, and I do hope that um, whether it be the uh, federal government and the state government, that that um, actually can be done because uh, that's a positive and I want to move to the future. The past has been well discussed um, today and I think we have to go forward and the way to go forward is something like this, showing that right, we can do something to help these people who were a family even though they were not related. That would be a wonderful gesture. So I do hope you know, Mr Warber at 75 and his colleagues, and one of these was Sue Gordon, whom uh, we all know has been very, very involved with the um, federal government's task force as the chair and also in the um, Ab um, Aboriginal or Indigenous Council, which unfortunately has now been um, disbanded, and we're hoping that something will come up in that place. But for Western Australia, we have quite a long way to go, and I would like to um, advise the um, Senate of this. Um, unfortunately, crime has become uh, quite difficult in Western Australia and, un and also, unfortunately, most of the people that um, have uh, been involved with this have been young Aboriginal children. And I'm um, a little worried about how we get them on track, and also we had a very nasty incident in Geraldton about three weeks ago with um, a pastoralist playing beach cricket with his family, and um, unfortunately some Aboriginal youth decided to try and steal their um, uh, wine, and uh, he consequently was hit over the head with a baseball bat and died. Last uh, Thursday week I attended a funeral in Perth of one of our past members of, um, or past member for Geraldton, uh, Mr. Bob Bloffwich. And there were about 800 people at that funeral. And I was just overwhelmed by people coming to me and saying, look, enough's enough. Don't you go and apologise on my behalf. So these are the sort of issues that we have in our state. And the number of bag snatchers, elderly people um, being knocked over in the street and, and uh, really having problems. Um, Western Australia does have a lot to do and also up in the um, Kimberley area of course with Halls Creek and um, uh, Fitzroy Crossing uh, and Balgo, all of these communities which I've visited and with the petrol sniffing inquiry probably one thing for me as a member of um, community affairs um, committee I've been able to travel to a lot of these places. I was a nurse, I was a midwife, I've worked in all of these areas, delivering Aboriginal women, sitting with them through the labour and hearing stories about what we have been discussing in the last day. So it's just something I'd like to um, promote here. We have what we call the Australian Defence Force Parliamentary Program. And this year, within the choices that my fellow um, members of parliament have is, um, an opportunity to spend a week with the North Force um, members and to travel around through these communities. So I would suggest that this might be a way as, that we can all learn how we can go forward. This is, of course, part of the um, Northern Territory Intervention Plan, but that's an opportunity that we can do, and I think that it'd be great to see a number of us um, take that up. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Adams. Um, now can I call Senator Boyce? Thank you, Mr. Senator, Senator, Sen Senator Boyce. <laughs>
Um, thank, thank you, Mr. Acting President. And, and firstly, I must say, uh, having received uh, in my office only about four minutes ago a list that actually had my name on it, I'm rather surprised to be here at the moment and, and would have appreciated uh, a bit more notice, as obviously Senator Abetz would have, as to how this was going to uh, pan out. Well, you've been on my list all morning, Senator. Would have been good if it was in the <laughs> office too, Mr <laughs> Acting President. Um, I certainly want to add my uh, voice to those who are saying sorry today as individuals and recognising that as state and federal governments we have much to be sorry for to the Indigenous peoples of Australia, not just to those who were forcibly removed as children from their families, but to everyone um, who has been affected adversely by uh, white settlement in Australia since 1788. There can be no disputing that that happened. But I have felt uneasy, I suppose, over the last few days, a sense that to not see everything that was being done as perfect and complete and covering every part of the issue was to be seen almost as curmudgeonly and mean-spirited, not to agree with the whole uh, process as it was and every little facet of that process. And I suppose for me the uh, article this morning in The Age by Mr Tony Wright uh, crystallised for me what I was finding wrong with this whole process. And it is that in many ways we aren't telling the full story. Much uh, was made yesterday, uh, yesterday at the Indigenous welcome to Parliament, which was a fabulous initiative, I think, and in fact was recommended um, in a 2001 joint standing report chaired by former Liberal member of the House of Representatives, Gary Nairn. This was one of the recommendations that that committee made, that there should be an Indigenous welcome at the opening of every parliament. Um, coincidentally, this committee also recommended that the current Australian of the Year, whoever that might be, might speak at such an opening on behalf of the Australian people and that the opening of parliament be held in the Great Hall to enable more people to come along. I think these are both initiatives that we should consider in the future. But what much was made at the uh, ceremony yesterday of the treatment of Mr Jim Clements, um, also known as King Billy, a Wurundjeri man who uh, arrived after walking many miles uh, in a, a battered old suit and barefoot with his dogs. It was commented on that he was actually clear, told to clear off by the police. Mr Wright's article in The Age this morning points out that that wasn't the full story. In fact, when that happened, a good group of the crowd said, no, stand your ground, you stay here. One of the, uh, a member of the clergy, a prominent member of the clergy who was there at the, on the same occasion, said, this man, Mr Clements, has more right to be here than any other of the rest of us. And people apparently threw coins um, at uh, King Billy. I presume that was in a gesture of, of charity at the time, which probably is cringeworthy now, but wasn't then. <coughs> and he ended up not only standing on the steps for the opening of the parliament in 1927, but he was amongst VIPs who met the Duke and Duchess of Kent the next day. That is the full story of the treatment of Mr Clements. And I think that we do ourselves a disservice if we are so keen to paint the black, the dark picture of treatment of people, that we don't also see that there are good people and always have been good people who will fight and continue to fight for the rights of particularly Indigenous people whose situation is currently not a good one. In looking at this issue and preparing my thoughts on this issue, I went back to the motion of reconciliation that was passed by this parliament in August 1999, and I would like to quote it. It reads that this House reaffirms its wholehearted commitment to the cause of reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians as an important national priority for all Australians, 
Recognising the achievements of the Australian nation commits to work together to strengthen the bonds that unite us, to respect and appreciate our differences, and to build a fair and prosperous future in which we can all share. Reaffirms the central importance of practical measures leading to practical results that address the profound economic and social disadvantage which continues to be experienced by many Indigenous Australians recognises the importance of understanding the shared history of Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians and the need to acknowledge openly the wrongs and injustices of Australia's past, acknowledges that the mistreatment of many Indigenous Australians over a significant period represents the most blemished chapter in our national history, expresses its sincere, deep and sincere regret that Indigenous Australians suffered injustices under the practices of past generations and for the hurt and trauma that many Indigenous people continue to feel as a consequence of those practices, and believes that we, having achieved so much as a nation, can now move forward together for the benefit of all Australians. As you may note, that apart from the word sorry, this motion covers every aspect of the motion that we have agreed to today. It covers current disadvantage. It fully acknowledges past wrongs and injustices, the hurt and the trauma that those injustices caused and still cause, and it highlights the need for practical and radical improvement of the way that we help Indigenous people in Australia. To me, that 1999 statement is part of telling the full story of our journey towards a true reconciliation and moving forward. I'd also like to mention um, there has been much made, I think, of, of people of Indigenous background and their involvement in this parliament. There have been far too few. But one that I would like to honour today is the late Senator Neville Bonner, a Jungara man who was the first, Lib first senator of uh, Aboriginal background to serve in this parliament and a Liberal senator, a man from my own state and a man who taught our party and our people a lot about how to go about assisting people of in, an Indigenous background. Um, I'd also, I guess, like to talk about the fact that there has been an improvement, there has been change. If you look at figures from the uh, Medical Journal of Australia published last year, the life expectancy for Indigenous women has increased from 65 to 67.9 years in the past 10 years. Now, this is, this is nowhere good enough. Uh, you know, we must close the gap. But there has been change. There have been improvements. There are uh, actions and there are policies designed to put some practical background behind what we have done to date uh, in this area. And on that basis, I would like to definitely put my voice, add my voice to that view that, yes, we must say sorry, and yes, we must add a practical aspect to that by supporting the moves that are currently going on in the Northern Territory to assist people to come to the situation where they can go on themselves. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy. Thank you, Senator Boyce. Uh, Senator Hogg. Thank you, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise briefly uh, today in this debate to, the, to support the motion uh, on, of sorrow that has been passed in this chamber today. I feel that the motion itself is terribly important because the motion shows a solidarity with Indigenous people. And I use the word solidarity very, very carefully, because it is something that people who have known uh, uh, a, a dispossession come to grips with when they know that those who have possessions, uh, they know that those people are as one with them. And I'm sure that that's the thrust of what is being put here in this chamber and has been put here and passed today, that we are at one feeling a solidarity with our Indigenous Australians who have been so bereft of 
uh, a, a real comfort over a long period of time because of many injustices that have been placed upon them. And there, therefore, I believe that this is an important step in the healing process of this nation. Of course, I support the comments of the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Government uh, in this uh, particular debate. But in particular, I wanted to refer to the, the words of the Prime Minister when he referred to the stolen generations were human beings, not an intellectual curiosity. Human beings deeply damaged by the decision of parliaments and governments. And that's something that has not been focused on, in my view. We are dealing with humanity. We are dealing with human beings. No different from any of the rest of us. The major difference may well be the colour of the skin. The major difference may well be their opportunity. Their major difference may well be their life expectancy. The major difference may well be the hurt that they have suffered. But the reality is they are human beings and as such need to be seen, to be treated with the dignity that human beings deserve. I believe that it is a fundamental right of every individual human being and no more or no less for our Indigenous Australians that they have the right to that dignity as well and that that right to that dignity is expressed through the solidarity of the uh, resolution that was passed in the other chamber and this chamber today. This dignity should prevail through the, st the stages, various stages of life. It's not something that is just uh, gained at birth, not something gained in youth and not something gained simply at the end of life. It's some, something that is a continuum through life and, of course, with much of the injustice that many of our Indigenous Australians have suffered, they have not had that opportunity to experience the dignity of life that they deserve. I'm not ex uh, seeking to expand on the, on the apology um, as a statement as such because I believe it enunciates the heartfelt and strong sorrow that many of us have experienced in this country for a long time. I share that sorrow and I wholly endorse the apology as adopted by our parliament. And I see it, as others have said, as a positive way forward on reconciliation. To express one's sorrow is important indeed. But then the next step is having expressed one's sorrow, then you don't go back and repeat the errors of your ways. You don't sin anymore, as they say. And I think that that's the significance of the statement, the significance of the process, that having, having recognised our own inadequacies that we have said that we are sorry, it is a sorrow that comes from within the heart. Because if one doesn't have that, then the sorrow is shallow indeed. And I think the expressions that I have heard in this uh, debate on the issue in general shows that the sorrow is deep, is, is heartfelt and that people genuinely don't want to see a repeat of what has happened previously. I believe that the solidarity shown by the Parliament of Australia and other parliaments before us in the States will give hope to our Indigenous Australians that there is a future and a bright future where their dignity will be respected, 
their dignity will grow, and it will grow because of the respect that we show to each other as human beings. I commend the recommendation of the Senate, and I support it fully. Thank you, Senator Hull. Senator Kemp. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting uh, Deputy President. Uh, I rise to support the motion regarding an apology uh, to those Indigenous Australians who were forcibly removed uh, from their families and communities under the laws of past state and federal governments. The Leader of the Opposition, uh, Brendan Nelson, has uh, spoken eloquently uh, on this matter today uh, on behalf of uh, the Coalition. There has been, uh, as we all know, a long-standing debate on the appropriateness of one generation apologising for another. At least uh, as far as this parliament is concerned, this debate uh, is now over. Nevertheless, there will be a continuing debate in the community on the appropriateness uh, of what the parliament has done today. Just 11 years ago, in moving a motion of reconciliation, uh, John Howard said the treatment of Indigenous peoples was, and I quote, without any doubt the greatest blemish and stain on the Australian national story. This motion recognised the mistreatment of many Indigenous Australians over a significant period and expressed uh, deep and sincere regret that Indigenous Australians had suffered injustices under the practices of past generations and for the hurt and trauma that many Indigenous people continue to feel as a consequence of those practices. The, the parliament today has reinforced that statement, in a sense, with the use of the word sorry. This is, as I think most senators understand, a complex issue. And uh, as the Aboriginal leader Noel Pearson said in an extensive uh, article in the Australian newspaper yesterday, and let me quote his words, the truth is the removal of Aboriginal children and the breaking up of Aboriginal families is a history of complexity and great variety. People were stolen. People were rescued. People were brought in chains. People were brought by their parents. Mixed blood children were in danger from their tribal stepfathers, while others were loved and treated as their own. People were in danger from whites, and people were protected by whites. The motivations and actions of those whites involved in this history, governments and missions, range from cruel to caring, malign to loving, well-intentioned to evil. Some of the examples of the removal of Aboriginal children that have been stated before this parliament are simply horrific. They demonstrate that uh, bureaucracies, as well as having the potential for good, uh, also have the potential for great evil. It is appropriate to say sorry to people who have suffered so dreadfully from the actions uh, of governments and its officers. But it would be wrong, uh, also wrong, not to acknowledge that there were children who were rescued from dreadful circumstances. And there were white missionaries who had the, the interests of Indigenous people at heart. And Noel Pearson refers to a Bavarian missionary who, in his view, will always be a hero. An apology can have both positive and negative aspects. It will be interesting to see whether, in the coming weeks and months, the government, having taken this step, reverts to the failed policies of the past. Or, uh, as so many speakers have indicated, uh, this will be a springboard uh, for moving on and ad addressing the real problems of Aboriginal disadvantage. Today's apology is a very specific apology relating to the harm caused by the removal of Aboriginal children from their families. It should uh, not and cannot obscure the fact that policies which have been put into place by governments prior to the Northern Territory intervention have damaged Aboriginal people over the last 30 years and more. The lives of many thousands of Aboriginal people have been blighted by these failed policies. They are as worthy of an apology as the policy for which we are apologising today. The road to hell 
as the old saying goes, is paved with good intentions. And there is no doubt that the Indigenous policy makers in the post-war period have, in my view, a lot to answer for. Like many parliamentarians, I have visited Indigenous communities in the Northern Territory, and one cannot uh, but be struck by the examples of overriding poverty and despair in some of these communities. Indeed, I believe it is a scandal that such circumstances could exist in Australia today. By every measure—life expectancy, child mortality, unemployment, literacy and violence—the policies of the last 30 years have failed. Indeed, some future parliament may well be apologising for our failure. The Northern Territory uh, Government's uh, Little uh, Children of Sacred report showed the shocking conditions in Indigenous communities in the Northern Territory. It summarised, a number of underlying causes are said to explain the present state of both town and remote communities. Excessive consumption of alcohol is variously described as the uh, result of poverty, unemployment, lack of education, boredom and overcrowded and inadequate housing. The use of other drugs and petrol sniffing can be added to these. Uh, together, they lead to excessive violence. In the worst case scenario, it leads to sexual abuse of children. It is inexcusable that the Northern Territory government had allowed this situation to develop. And what are the policies which have led to this result? Just let me summarise uh, some of these policies. Unrestricted welfare. Reverse apartheid through the permit system, absence of proper policing in many Indigenous communities, failure to control alcohol, uh, drugs and pornography, concealing of abuse by welfare agencies, almost complete neglect of needs in education, health and housing in remote communities. My brother, Dr David Kemp, by establishing national standards for numeracy and literacy, exposed possibly for the first time, the shocking neglect of education for Indigenous children in remote communities in the Northern Territory and elsewhere. These policies, let us not forget, remained in place because of misguided symbolism and political correctness, and stayed in place until John Howard and Mal Brough had the courage to act to save the children. The Howard government, to its enormous credit, broke from the failed policies of the last 30 years, when former Minister Mal Brough uh, announced uh, the Northern Territory National Emergency Response Bill. And Mr Brough said in his uh, second reading speech, when confronted with a failed society where basic standards of law and order and behaviour have broken down and where women and children are unsafe, how should we respond? Do we respond with more of what we have done in the past? Or do we radically change direction with an intervention strategy matched to the magnitude of the problem? He went on, we are providing extra police. We will stem the flow of alcohol, drugs and pornography, assess the health situation of children, engage local people in improving living conditions and offer more employment opportunities and activities for young people. We aim to limit the amount of cash available for alcohol, drugs and gambling during the emergency period and make a strong link between welfare payments and school attendance. Now that an apology uh, has been said, it is time to approach again the pressing issues of the safety of children and the well-being of Aboriginal communities. A great deal of work remains to be done. Thank you, Senator Kemp. Senator McLucas. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, I firstly would like to acknowledge the traditional owners on whose country we are meeting here today. And I'd also like to acknowledge all traditional owners and elders across our country. I want to thank Matilda House uh, for her welcome uh, yesterday, uh, Matilda House and her delegation, for their ge generosity of their welcome that we received yesterday. And in doing so, I want to congratulate all the people who were involved in that moving ceremony that we witnessed. As Senator Boyce has said, yes, this has been on the cards for a very long time, and it's wonderful that it has finally become a part uh, of uh, the ceremony of opening a parliament in this place. 
and I was particularly pleased to hear the Leader of the Opposition commit to, the, to uh, continuing with a welcome to country into the future. Uh, yesterday heralded a new dawn for relations between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders and uh, non-Indigenous Australians uh, uh, yesterday, and that has been built on today. It is an understatement, in my view, to say that today is an historic day for all Australians. The celebration that this parliament has seen throughout today is something that will not be forgotten for a very long time. Uh, the laughter and the tears, the emotion, the people coming together, Indigenous Australians, non-Indigenous Australians coming together to celebrate an important day in the history of our country. It gives me enormous pride and a sense of relief to today wholeheartedly support the motion that has been carried unanimously in the Senate and the House today. I commend the Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, and the Minister for Indigenous Affairs, Jenny Macklin, for all of their efforts to ensure that the words in this motion were consulted with indig Indigenous people and for planning such a wonderful day here in Canberra. I also agree that today's motion of apology is not about us as senators and members of parliament. It is a day for Indigenous people in particular, but a day for all Australians to come together to right past wrongs. The words of the motion are very important. I encourage all Australians to take the time to read them, to know what they mean and to know personally uh, of the intent behind them. The words are, are designed to, firstly, recognise the indisputable fact that past actions instigated and or sanctioned by parliaments and governments resulted in many, many thousands, we don't actually know the number, but many thousands of indigen Indigenous children being taken from their mothers and their families because of their race. And that's the key. That's the very significant difference that we need to remember in this debate today. It was because they were black that they were taken, and that is the sorrow that they live with. The words are designed to show that we, as non-Indigenous Australians, want to say that we are sorry for what occurred. As a mother, I cannot understand, I cannot imagine the abject loss, the emptiness that mothers who had their children stolen endured, endured for the rest of their lives in many, many cases. I can't contemplate the fear that people lived it with, waiting for the welfare, hiding their children as we know they did. The words are drafted to show that we understand the toll that the practices of forced removal, of, uh, of fostering, so-called, of being placed into unpaid labour, of institutionalisation, have wrecked on Indigenous Australians. And the words are drafted to make it clear that we know that much has to be done to bridge the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. The tenor of the Prime Minister's speech and many others, including, I must say, the Leader of the Opposition, in this and the other place, have been sincere and heartfelt. Australians can take heart from the leadership that has been shown today that we as a nation have taken a very large step towards a reconciled Australia. In May 1997, I was fortunate to be in attendance at the National Reconciliation Convention. and At the end of that convention, very emotionally, uh, up and down uh, meeting. Uh, Pat Dod Dodson invited us uh, to walk with him on the road to reconciliation. What we have witnessed today restarts that proce process of reconciliation anew. I have talked about what the words in the motion say. I think it's also important to talk about what the words don't say. The words don't apportion blame. They don't encourage people to feel guilt. There is nowhere in those words that tries to point a finger at anyone, at any group or at any particular government action. There is no purpose in doing so. The words don't apportion blame, nor do they encourage guilt. 
The words do not seek to advance the value of symbolism above the real and obvious need for improved outcomes for, in terms of health, education and employment for Indigenous people. It is not one or the other. It is not symbolism or services and programs. It's both. Of course it's both, and that's how it should be. We need, as a nation, to lay down a marker, to acknowledge the horrifying, the unthinkable truth of the Stolen Generation era and to sincerely apologise. And that is what we have done today. This morning, Mr Acting Deputy President, on uh, the ABC AM program, uh, an Indigenous gentleman was uh, speaking about how there are some Australians, some non-Indigenous Australians, who had an understanding of the experience of the Stolen Generation. He referred to the child migrants as, being, as also being stolen, and it's been referred to in this place today. Along with the child migrants, as we know through the Senate inquiry, there are also those, those many Australians who have been institutionalised, taken from their families and placed in institutions. I acknowledge the pain of the child migrants and of the so-called forgotten Australians today and apologise too for the actions of governments that separated them, those children, from their families. Can I say there is more to be done in that area as well? In closing, Mr Acting Deputy President, I want to thank the many Indigenous Australians, Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders, mainly in North Queensland, who have shared their stories and lives with my family and I. I have felt welcome in their homes and in their communities, and I'm grateful for the opportunity and the chance and the generosity that has been shown to me to be able to understand better their lives and their culture. Can I say to those people, and I can't name them all, that their generosity and openness has allowed us, that's my family, to have some understanding of the road that you walk. Mr Acting Deputy President, I am always in awe of the patience of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. We know they waited for their vote, they waited for native title, they've waited for education, they've waited for health services. But today's motion means that the wait for the apology to the Australian generation is now over. We are now once again on the path to reconciliation and on the path to closing the gap between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders and non-Indigenous Australians. I wholeheartedly support the motion and commit to working to improving outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in Australia. Thank you, Senator McLucas. Uh, Senator Troth. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I also would like to rise to, to support the apology because today is a very important day in the life of this parliament and this country. There is no doubt that much of the past policy was undertaken partly in the name of improving the lives of children, supposedly in material ways of measuring happiness, in the thought that they would be removed from their families so that they could have what were seen as better living conditions, better education and with the hope of better eventual employment. But there was no thought given of the family providing an essential underpinning to an individual's emotional life. And that is what we are recognising today, amongst other things. Over time, there's no doubt that on both sides of government, we have attempted to provide practical forms of reconciliation through health, housing, education and employment initiatives. This has been done to the extent that the former government last year spent $4 billion on Indigenous initiatives. And yet many of the indicators which would signal an improvement in those areas have changed very little, such as life expectancy, infant mortality, progress through primary and secondary school and sustainable employment. Saying sorry will not change these conditions in the short term. And yet by acknowledging the emotional scarring that the previous policy has caused, I hope that we are creating a true feeling of partnership to go forward and start to improve living standards in every way. And by living, I don't just mean physical conditions. 
but anticipating and being able to aspire to a physical and emotional standard of living which is due to all Australians. As a parent, I can only begin to understand what it would feel like to have one child taken from the family, let alone multiple removals, as so many of these cases seem to be. It is no wonder that so many of those parents spent the rest of their often short lives wondering what had become of their children. They were never to know. Many of these issues have come together in the expressions of regret by various state governments and I was very pleased last year when former Prime Minister John Howard and former Minister Mal Brough announced what, has been, what is now known as the Northern Territory intervention. And I'm well aware that not everyone agrees with every aspect of that initiative. But what I do hope is that the new Rudd government carries on the practical aspect of this reform. We must act now in concert with state and territory governments to ensure that conditions improve. There have been many expressions of bipartisanship at national government level uh, for some time and especially yesterday and today and I applaud the acceptance of this declaration by the leader of my party, Dr Brendan Nelson. Let us go on with this so that the succeeding generations can note this declaration at the start of this new parliament as the start of a new era and new partnerships. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I rise uh, to speak on the motion of apology that is before the chamber, and can I say uh, what an historic moment it is that this federal parliament has finally done what ought to have been done uh, many years ago, and that is to apologise to Indigenous Australians for this long chapter in our history where people were taken away from their families. Uh, I wanted to just speak briefly, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, about some of the reasons why I believe this apology is so important. Uh, in my first speech to this place, I spoke about the need for compassion and why compassion was, to my way of thinking, uh, the driver or ought to be the driver uh, for those of us who are in public life. It ought to be uh, that uh, which those who have power uh, remember and seek to implement uh, when engaging in their activities. Uh, and I said that uh, this notion of compassion really was that which lay at the heart of a truly civilised society. I also made the point that compassion is what underscores our relationships with one another and that which enables us to come to a place of community, even in our diversity. Uh, that is a view which I have had for all of my life, or as far as I can recall, perhaps not when I was born, but certainly for all of the, the, my time where I've actually thought about these issues. And it is very much the reason why I have always been, since this issue was raised, an advocate for an apology, because it is an expression an expression uh, not only of regret but also of apology uh, that enables us uh, to come to a place of community. Uh, it demonstrates an understanding of what was done, of the impact of what was done, uh, and enables us to move forward. Uh, during uh, the years uh, of the Howard government, the former Howard government, uh, I was engaged uh, uh, for some part of that in various anti-racism activities at a community level. and In the context of that, uh, I once interviewed Loitra O'Donoghue in a public forum uh, in which she uh, talked about her experience. Uh, and I have to say my experience on that day uh, was one of the more profoundly moving experiences uh, that I have had, uh, where this woman of extraordinary achievement uh, an extraordinary intellect and extraordinary integrity spoke about what it meant for her to have been taken away. Uh, for those of you who do not know, uh, Louisa O'Donoghue uh, was taken away from her mother at the age of two. Uh, she, uh, from memory, uh, was one of the people or young uh, children who was taken eventually to Colebrook, which uh, was a home in the Adelaide Hills, actually not far uh, from where I lived when I came to Australia from Malaysia. Uh, and Noetis uh, gave 
uh, all the people in the audience that day an extraordinary insight into what that meant for her and what that meant uh, and what it meant for her not to have seen her mother I think for some three and something decades around about 33 years uh, the thing that I remember most about that discussion was not just uh, the uh, sadness of the story that was being told. The thing I remember most was the extraordinary dignity and spirit of forgiveness uh, that uh, uh, Ms O'Donoghue spoke with. Uh, and this, to be honest uh, with the Chamber, has been a hallmark of much of the activity I engaged in before I, became to Parliament, before I came into Parliament uh, on anti-racism and other issues. I have been struck uh, over and over again uh, by the big-heartedness of our Indigenous peoples uh, when dealing with non-Indigenous Australians, how much uh, forgiveness uh, has, there has been in the way in which uh, they have dealt with me and with others. Uh, and I've often thought, if I had been in the same situation and had that sort of history, uh, that I think my anger uh, and bitterness would probably not have enabled me to behave in the ways they did. Uh, and I have so often uh, been humbled uh, by the uh, dignity, uh, forgiveness and, as I said, big-heartedness of the, so many Indigenous peoples with whom I have worked over the years. Uh, so I speak in support of this motion. Uh, first, obviously, as a, someone in this chamber, as an elected representative, but also I want to uh, express my strong personal commitment uh, and uh, gladness that we have come to this place. Uh, because, as I said before, uh, I do believe that it is this understanding of the experience of others uh, which enables us to come to a place of community in our diversity. Uh, diversity is a good thing. It is a characteristic of Australian society which has enriched us, uh, and it is a characteristic which I believe does contribute to a strong, vibrant community. Uh, but in order to ensure that diversity has its most positive manifestation, uh, I believe uh, we must try and understand what it is like for others who are different to ourselves. Uh, so Indigenous, non-Indigenous Australia uh, I think does need to come to a place where we have a better understanding of what life has been like currently and in the past for our, our Indigenous brothers and sisters. Uh, this is not the day for uh, much partisan politics, and uh, I do commend the opposition after some uh, public comments indicating disquiet on this issue for eventually supporting uh, this motion. I did want to make uh, a couple of brief points about comments made by the Leader of the Opposition in this place uh, in his response uh, on behalf of the Opposition. He made first the point uh, that uh, we ought not judge uh, previous actions by contemporary standards. Uh, and that is something I, I have heard said by those in the <coughs> former government. Uh, that is uh, something I've heard said by those who oppose the notion of an apology. Can I say that uh, it is true at, that over time uh, human societies develop different notions about what is right and wrong, what is socially or uh, acceptable? Uh, that is obviously uh, part of, of what is great uh, about, about us. We do move forward and we do change. Uh, but I want to emphasise this. There are some things which were never right. There are some things which, no matter what time in history, uh, no matter what time uh, they, they have occurred, they are simply wrong. Uh, and to try in any way to suggest that because something occurred in the past when people thought, some people thought differently, because some parliaments thought differently, because some policies were different, to some way suggest that in any way diminishes uh, the moral wrongness of what occurred, I think, is incorrect. The second point I wanted to make in relation to the comments by Senator Minchin and, frankly, by a number of opposition senators is this. There was a lot of discussion about the process and criticism of uh, the Prime Minister's release of the apology and so forth. Uh, can I say, on a day where we are talking about what has happened over many decades in this country to a group of people because they were black, because they were Indigenous, 
for people to be so self-absorbed as to be concerned about uh, their own uh, processes, I think, really does uh, demonstrate a level of self-absorption that is extraordinary. It would seem, from some of the comments made in this place, that what was happening inside the coalition party room uh, seemed to be of more importance uh, than the enormity of what has been done today. As I said, uh, this is uh, a motion that has been a long time coming. This is a motion which uh, ought to have been dealt with in this place before. Uh, it is a regret, I think, for many people in Australia that for so many years we, uh, we failed to see the importance of this symbolic gesture in order to move forward. Uh, I hope that in the years to come we can look at this time and say this was a time uh, where we, in this parliament, on behalf of the community who elects us, and more importantly when the broader Australian community, could acknowledge and apologise for past wrongs, and that we then moved forward to do something very different. Uh, nobody who has argued for symbolic uh, gestures, uh, symbolic uh, moments such as this, believes that they are the only things we must do. Clearly there are many practical measures which we have to put in place to redress the unacceptable disadvantage so many of our Indigenous brothers and sisters <coughs> suffer. Uh, but symbolism and ideas is impor are important. Uh, we all know that. We are all members of political parties who are not just about practical plans. They are also very much about ideas, uh, about philosophies and about what we feel in our hearts is right for this nation and for this community. Uh, and today what we have done is stated as a parliament what we believe is right, that we should say sorry. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to support this motion taking note of the apology given in this place and the other place today, and I do so with great pleasure to make a contribution to this debate on this historic occasion. Mr Acting Deputy President, we as people can be terrible and flawed creatures at times. We can inflict harms that make most cringe. We can do wrongs that we dare not speak of, and we can inflict willful pain on each other and the environment around us. However, thankfully, very few are guilty of inflicting such willful, deliberate acts of pain. Most of us, when we inflict pain or harms, are often ignorant of the pain we are causing at the time. Most of us act with the best of intentions, however right, wrong or misguided those intentions may be at that time or prove to be in future years and retrospection. Today this parliament has taken a stand and apologised for wrongs of the past committed against the Indigenous peoples of Australia. We have made this expression of sorrow for both the harms inflicted willfully by some and for the inadvertent or unintended harms of many. As the Liberal Party leader in the other place said in his, I thought, very moving and worthwhile contribution to the apology, each generation lives in ignorance of the long-term consequences of its decisions and actions. Even when motivated by inherent humanity and decency to reach out to the dispossessed in extreme adversity, our actions can have unintended consequences. Well, consequences both unintended and, sadly, in some cases intended, certainly did cause harms and wrongs to many of our Indigenous peoples over the years. They were recognised in the historic Bringing Them Home report released in 1997. And whilst it has taken some time, today this place has done the right thing. And although I may wish it had been done earlier, I am very proud to be a member of the parliament that has said, I believe, very genuinely, very deeply and overwhelmingly in very heartfelt and sincere terms that we are sorry for those wrongs that have been committed. We have heard many comments made in this place and elsewhere, reciting stories out of the reports of bringing them home, very tragic and personal stories of 
forcibly removed children from loving families, the fact that many people lost touch with their culture <coughs> or background, others who were forced into child labour, some, sadly, who were beaten or sexually abused. These are the challenges that generations of Indigenous people have faced and have brought to bear in coming to where we are today. And as little wonder against that backdrop and many other challenges and issues over the years that we see the extent of despair and adversity and disadvantage that exists across our Indigenous communities. I hope today, as I said earlier in this place, will not just mark an expression of sorrow but mark the beginning of healing, a process of forgiveness and, most importantly, an opportunity to move forward. I know, like many, that our Indigenous communities are suffering very deeply. In my role prior to coming to this place, working at the Winemakers Federation of Australia, I spent time in trying to grapple with issues of alcohol and substance abuse, travelling around Alice Springs and the town camps nearby with officers of the Northern Territory Liquor Licensing Commission. And in those trips in those days, it became very clear to me, of course, not just the harms being created as a result of that direct abuse, but the fact that that abuse was a result of many wrongs committed over the years, of the dispossession of people from having a sense of hope and a sense of future about their lives. It is, I hope, in delivering some sense of closure today on part and very broadly worded in this motion many other aspects of the tragic history of our relationship with Indigenous Australia that we can achieve that progress and can ensure that today's Indigenous people and most importantly the generations that are to come can enjoy hope and opportunity and feel a sense of worthwhile and well-being in our community. We as a parliament and parliamentarians need to make today really stand as a proud day in our history. And we will only do that if the current government and future governments back today's words up with action. The symbolism of today must go hand in hand with true meaningful practical steps. We must ensure that the investment is there to genuinely tackle the ills in Aboriginal communities, the disadvantages in health care, in education standards, the need for policing and a stop to the abuse and violence that we have seen reported so widely in our Aboriginal communities. It's a challenge that many governments, of course, through our Federation, have sadly failed to meet. That failure is reflected in the statistics and in the lives of many broken people in Aboriginal communities. It is a challenge now that falls upon the shoulders of the new government and on each of us as parliamentarians to ensure that policies and actions actually follow up with the very great words that will have been spoken in this place and the other place today. So I would urge in making this contribution the new government to make sure that they don't feel that this symbolic step is enough, because it will not be. It is important. I hope it is a great step, but I hope it is the first of many steps to deliver a strong and proud future for our Indigenous peoples. In my first speech to this place, just a few months ago last year, I spoke of the hope that I would be able to see and help make a contribution to Indigenous peoples who were free of suppression, paternalism or welfareism, and instead who enjoyed incentive, respect and opportunity. 
Today, I think we have shown enormous respect in this place, and I'm very proud to have seen that occur. But there is much to be done to ensure that the incentive and opportunity that I spoke of is there as well. I note that I'm not the only person to have referred back to their first speech, and though mine was more recent than most in here, I note Senator Wong and Senator Payne and others have referenced their first speeches in relation to their commitment to healing the wounds in Indigenous Australia and creating advantage and opportunity. Well, if so many of us have made that commitment in what is perhaps our most important speech in this place, our first speech in this place, I hope that we can genuinely see that commitment through in the same type of bipartisan, well-meaning and well-spirited manner that we have today, because that's what our Indigenous peoples need and indeed we will be a much prouder and a much stronger country if today's steps can be taken forward into the future to deliver the hope and opportunity that I hope future Indigenous peoples can have. Senator Lundy. Uh, thank you, um, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we find ourselves on in this federal parliament, and I support the motion taking note. Today, Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, on behalf of the Parliament of Australia, said sorry to Indigenous Australians for past injustices they had experienced as a result of previous government policies. Prime Minister Rudd recognised the devastating impact of previous government policies on families of the stolen generation, the dislocation and displacement of whole communities, and he did so in a way that I think encompassed all of the pain across not just those affected directly but their families, their extended families, and indeed the long-term impact on whole communities an impact that continues today. Saying sorry has been a long time coming, and I know many people in this place and many, many more outside of this place have dreamed of this day, have worked long and hard to make it happen through their own compassion and activism leading towards this moment. I'd like to acknowledge those efforts of everybody who from the bottom of their hearts has worked towards a positive outcome of a genuine apology emanating from the Prime Minister of this country. It is a historic moment uh, for the healing of the nation. It's as, it's as though the warmth and optimism that I felt um, coming into Parliament House today uh, has permeated the community right around the country. There's obviously some scepticism, some questions, what happens next? Of course, that's appropriate. But I was truly inspired by that warmth and optimism that I think was tangible in the building this morning and I think has been reflected in the extraordinarily gracious generosity of the acceptance of that apology by Indigenous people. I think it's a day from which we can move forward. I have great hope myself and optimism for that. I think under the inspired stewardship of Kevin Rudd, and I also acknowledge the very committed work by our Minister for Indigenous Affairs, Jenny Macklin, in making this a priority for this first sitting of the 42nd Parliament. Uh, there are undisputed facts, as reported in the Stolen Generations report. Little children are sacred. And now those facts are firmly imprinted on our collective consciousness. And it's for those facts that today we are saying sorry. We know between 1910 and 1970, between, between 10 and 30% of Indigenous children were forcibly taken from their parents. For those of us who have heard the stories firsthand, it's an incredibly emotional experience and one that 
I think everybody should be able to listen to firsthand because it's that compelling telling of those stories that makes it real for all of us, that makes it real as though we can never share the pain directly, but it makes it real in a way that we all do acknowledge and accept some responsibility. It was, of course, the product of deliberate calculated policies of the state at the time. The powers to take the children away were provided by the parliaments of the day, explicit powers provided under statute. These, this whole experience should make us very humble as legislators. We've seen the harm that misguided policies can cause, and we have an immense responsibility to stand up and acknowledge these mistakes, as we have today, as well as celebrate the successes. And the apology is, as I think everyone is saying, including the Prime Minister, a first step. The Rudd Labor government is committed to reducing the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians with respect to health, education, life expectancy. These policies will no doubt be challenging to implement. To improve health in a genuine, sustainable, long-term, holistic manner requires attention to and investment in the social determinants of health. Housing, education, employment, obviously health services, but the physical environment and individual and collective and community self-esteem. This gamut of public policy challenges is fortunately an area that we in Australia have a great deal of expertise in. In fact, many of our states do have the capacity to provide, I think, the professional guidance, support, public policy inspiration we need to make a real difference. What's been lacking in the area of health promotion public policy has been a genuine commitment by the federal government, by the former federal government, to see fit to deploy those resources in a focused and unrelenting way towards a problem that still exists to our shame. And that is the health status of our Indigenous population. Let's hope we won't have to wait as long to report back positively about the impact of the changes of those policies, the outcomes of investment in education, employment opportunities and health status. Let's hope that this agenda will continue to attract the sort of bipartisan support that I'm hearing echoing back across the chamber today from most, not all, because that gives us all great heart that this really is going to be a concerted effort, not one divided by the partisan politics of opportunism, but one inspired by the opportunity to rectify a great wrong. The weight that lays across, has laid across our collective conscious has been lifted slightly in one corner. We have a way to go, and I think together all Australians, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, will be able to stand tall and walk together um, with this weight lifted at some point in the future. For my part, I'm proud to be part of the moment. Um, I'm proudest of Indigenous people who have lived their lives with great dignity, who found themselves as part of this um, um, formality today in the federal parliament of our Prime Minister finally saying sorry. In closing, Mr Acting Deputy President, I'd also like to acknowledge um, the wonderful initiative in having a welcome to country ceremony at the op opening of parliament prior to the opening of parliament yesterday. 
it's a, a, a long-standing tradition, I know, in other houses of parliament and uh, has been a feature of public events in Canberra for a very long time. Um, the lack of that presence here in Parliament House stood out, was glaring. It's now been fixed and I too would like to acknowledge the bipartisan support for that continuing tradition. And I'd like to thank <coughs> Matilda House and the elders um, for their participation in a wonderful ceremony that I think will set the tone um, for that tradition to continue in the future. Senator McGarren. Um, I speak Sorry. to the motion before the Senate on our national apology that both Houses of Parliament supported um, today and accompanied by uh, the great national fanfare and feeling. I accept that the people the Australian people in the greater majority want this parliament to come together to settle this uh, long-standing matter. And to this end, I express my heartfelt support for the words and feelings in the National Apology, uh, which in part reads that uh, to the mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters for the breaking up of families and communities, we say sorry and for the indignity and degradation thus inflicted on a proud people and a proud culture, we say sorry. For the future, we take heart, resolving that this new page in history of our great continent can now be written, a future where all Australians, whatever their origins, are truly equal partners with equal opportunities and with an equal stake in shaping the next chapter in the history of this great country. Australia. Uh, the National Apology, while accepted as, an Im as important symbolism, uh, it will nevertheless, we trust, have th the very practical effect of healing much of the hurt, pain and anger of those that say that they or their family members were taken from their family origins at a young age for no other reason than race. And that is what we are apologising for today. That is what we are sorry for today. Uh, therefore, it's worthy to note, as has been recognised by previous speakers, uh, that the national apology in no way must blanket the history of the good work and good intentions of so many churches and welfare groups uh, that helped Aboriginal children um, from their settlements who were in dire need of help. Um, and so the difference ought to be made between the two. And in no way dims the apology, uh, but we, make, we, we do set out the differences in what is a complex issue. And it is probably best put by Noel Pearson, um, an Aboriginal elder known to all in this chamber, uh, in a, a very fine and thoughtful piece he made in the Australian newspaper on Tuesday, February the 12th. And, uh, I quote uh, that part of the article, which I recommend to everyone in the Senate, but that part of the article that, that relates to the point I'm making here about the churches. Uh, to quote Noel Pearson, the truth is the removal of Aboriginal children and the breaking up of Aboriginal families is a history of complexity and great variety. People, are uh, people were stolen, people were rescued, people were brought in chains, people were brought by their parents, mixed blood children were in danger from their tribal stepfathers, while others were loved and treated as their own, people were in danger from whites and people were protected by whites. The motivations and actions of those whites involved in this history, governments and missions, range from cruel to caring maligned to loving, well-intentioned to evil. And he says, Noel Pearson goes on to say, the 19-year-old Bavarian missionary who came to the year-old Lutheran mission at Cape Bedford in Cape York Peninsula in 1887 and who, were, and who would spend more than 50 years of his life underwriting the future of um, Noel Pearson's people, uh, in Noel Pearson's words, cannot but be a hero to me and to my people. We owe an un unpayable debt to George 
Schwartz and the white people who supported my grandparents and others to rebuild their lives after they arrived at the mission as young children in 1910. So uh, that is a most significant point in, in, in what Noel Pearson says and we, we, we all concede is a complex issue and uh, really is more eloquently put than what I thought was the Prime Minister's very smart aleck remark uh, in the chamber today in, in relation to what he said was uh, a very crude post-Reformation theology way uh, of, of re resolving the, the differences in the churches. It was nothing of the sort. I venture to say it was nothing of the sort. It had nothing to do with theological differences or the Reformation, the post-Reformation. It was, it was either a tongue-in-cheek or a smart aleck remark by the Prime Minister, unwarranted on, on a day like this. And it was a cheap shot, a cheap shot at the churches. Um, equally, I'd also say that, uh, talking about cheap shots, the, uh, many, as I am informed on the news wires, that uh, many of the staffers of the Labor Party, uh, no doubt caught on film, um, were party to turning their back on Brendan Nelson's speech. That's right. That's right, says my colleagues. Uh, on the grounds, on the grounds that, that Brendan Nelson raised the issue of the Northern Territory uh, intervention. That was the reason that they, they, they decided to turn their back on uh, what, what uh, is, was a bipartisan approach to this from, uh, um, in regard to saying sorry. Um, so before they you know, are so pleased and trumpeting their own compassion in, the, in this matter, I make this point also, that the Labor Party may be feeling rather chuffed with itself. In, in relation to this, particularly those, I, well, I refer to those that have turned their back, you know, that, that uh, played the, poli the game of politics r right to the end. But I, I, I am convinced that this matter of uh, ap apology uh, is, is not a case of a change in political landscape of a new government that has brought in this policy. I think the political landscape changed uh, before the election, well before the election. It changed when, in fact, we introduced when we introduced the Northern Territory Emergency Action. It was then that the Australian people, in the greater majority, decided that having seen this most definite practical action by, from the government or from the parliament, if you like, because it was supported by, 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 by the parliament, but when the Australian people saw this practical action being taken, for what probably the majority thought uh, w that were once against an apology, that were uh, cynical of an apology, thought it was just very hollow uh, and, and had no real meaning. Once they saw the, the practical action being taken, I think that's when the real landscape changed. That's when, the, when there was a sea change. And we felt it. We felt it when we were in government. We actually no, uh, felt the, the, the change where the greater majority of Australians uh, believed that an apology was, was now due and was now really quite acceptable because it combined itself. It, w it went along with the, with the strong practical action. So I make that point. I think the sea change came from the Australian people and the greater majority of the Australian people uh, wanted an apology, accepted the apology for what they once were probably very, very cynical against, due to the strong action in regard to the Northern Territory uh, emergency action. Um, so it would be a tragedy, be a tragedy if that action was unwound. Um, it has been a success. It, ha it has been a, a marked success, with uh, over five and a half thousand children now having health checks in 48 communities. Just to quote one figure, probably the most significant of them all. But the foundation stone to which that action has been built upon, to, to, to pull this foundation stone out, endangers the whole action and its success, and that is the permit system. And the other side must know that. They must know it is the most practical action 
the ability to have a success in the Northern Territory um, emergency action comes from the abolition of the permit system. Yet the government are using it as a symbol. They have reinstated it as a symbol, is my judgment, to the left. They have reinstated it, what has been the most practical action in Aboriginal affairs for many decades has, has, uh, has been unwound. And it would be a tragedy if anything more was done, if you weren't genuine, if you did cave in now to what I see on the news services, pressure about uh, unwinding that whole, that, that whole Northern Territory action. And if it's and if, if you think I'm over dramatising it, when you get staff members, when you get Order. staff members turning Order. their back on the leader Order. of the opposition on the grounds Order. he raises Senator. the issue. Order. Senator's time has expired. Senator Senator Brown. I also rise to speak in relation to the Prime Minister Kevin Rudd's momentous and long overdue apology to the stolen generation. Indigenous Australians who were sadly victims of one of the most shameful chapters of our nation's history. Last year, Mr Rudd made the commitment that if the Labor Party was to form government, that, would he, that he would take this important and historical step and say sorry to the stolen generation for the pain and suffering they endured as a result of being forcibly separated from their families. Today, he delivered on this commitment. Our Prime Minister said sorry on behalf of the government, on behalf of the Australian Parliament, on behalf of the Australian people. The significance of this important moment in our nation's history should not be downplayed or lost. For many thousands of Indigenous, indigenous Australians, both with us and past, this day has been a long time coming. Indeed, for the past 10 years, the possibility of an apology has all but eluded us. However, the election of the Rudd Labor government last year not only put the issue back on the agenda, as we have seen in the last couple of days, it's placed the apology to the stolen generation at the very top of the agenda. The significance of this event we've, we've no doubt be resounding for ye years to come, but for now its present and fresh importance should not be lost. It should be enjoyed and celebrated. The atmosphere in that parliament house over the last two days has come to symbolise the immediate meaning of this event. There has been necessary reflection and acknowledgement of the past, but also a sense of hope for the future. To me, this is the most basic and true meaning of reconciliation, a sincere and heartfelt acknowledgement of what has come before and a genuine desire to move forward together toward the future. The apology today was an acknowledgement of a past wrong. It also represented a clear statement of our desire as a nation to move forward as one people. However, the Rudd Labor government acknowledges that the events of today are only the first step of many steps that need to be taken to mend the past injustices suffered by the Indigenous people. Much more needs to be done to bridge the gap that has been allowed to develop over a number of years between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. As the Prime Minister stated today, in this country, we are about a fair go for all, and up until now, this sentiment has failed to be applied when it comes to Indigenous Australians. The facts speak for themselves. Lower life expectancy, poor health and education outcomes, these people have done it tough. However, the Prime Minister also stated today that the Rudd Labor government is committed to improving outcomes for Indigenous communities from this point on. The Prime Minister acknowledged that most of the old approaches are not working and that there, needs to be, there, is, there is a need for a new beginning, based on consultative, tailored and local approaches to improving outcomes in areas such as health and education in the Indigenous communities. The Rudd Labor government has already committed to a number of policies aimed directly at improving health and education outcomes for, many, for young Indigenous children the future of the Indigenous people, heritage and culture, the future of our country. I am extremely proud to be a member of the Australian Parliament that finally took the important step of acknowledging the wrongs suffered by members of the stolen generation and that, and that has set a positive agenda towards wor working towards closing the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. Today the first words have been spoken and the first words 
and the first steps have been taken on the road towards reconciliation. Let this day rest in the minds of all Australians as one of hope. Senator Heffernan. Thanks very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, today is a great day for all Australians, um, and I suppose you could say it's a new dawn for the original custodians of Australia. I'm a, I mean, I'm a farmer, and occasionally I pretend that I own a farm, and in fact I'm only the custodian of the farm. So, and if, even if you live a long time, Mr Deputy Chairman, you actually don't live very long. And this is where this, this is just a great new opportunity for all Australians, and I am very proud of the fact that uh, Australians have displayed great generosity of spirit. Today is the day for, for our Indigenous people, or as I in the back country say, my blackfellow mates. It's not a whitefellow day. I'm not interested in some of the disadvantage where if you go to you know, different parts of Australia, you'll see th third generation unemployed white fellows that are you know, in pretty dire circumstances. Today is a great day for Australia to display its generosity. And I, I'm not interested in the nuances of where, who, who got what to who. I mean, the whole thing, ever since we got here, has been a national disgrace. And, uh, you know, whitefella habits have inflicted great pain on a lot of our Indigenous people. So I can only say, thank God we've got here. Um, my view is that the people, and the, you know, there are people that have a different view, uh, are innocently ignorant of what's gone on in the past, and there are a lot of people like that. I mean, when I left school, I didn't know that at Kudamundra, 30 miles from where I lived, there was a place full of, as it were, taken away young girls, and uh, we had no idea. So you can be innocently ignorant of the facts. There are some people, and you can pick it by the language, or some you can pick by the silence, that are using, that are passengers of political convenience in this particular issue, who are, are not in favour of it. And there are people who, in my view, are just simply moral cowards. And so, with all human endeavour, there is human failure. And sure, some of the things that have been put together over the years haven't worked out as they should have. But as, as the senators opposite would know and the senators on this side would know, you can go out into any remote community now and things are not like they ought to be. The position in some of these communities are still a continuing national disgrace. But if today is going to help heal not only people who are seriously disadvantaged directly by what's gone on in the past, um, um, but also by raising their self-esteem and seeing the display of generosity of spirit of the wider Australian community, I think today is just a magnificent day for everyone to celebrate. And, uh, and it was a great pleasure for me to see today people with smiles on their faces around this place. Um, sure, one size doesn't fit all. I mean, you go out into some remote communities, and there are still remote communities that want to live traditionally. I mean, they might want to live traditionally with a land cruiser to assist them, but they still want to live traditionally and share their goods with all the neighbourhood and all the rest of it. That's fair enough. There are a lot of people who want to leave something in their will. That is Indigenous people, just the same as white fellows, who, if they get the opportunity, they want to better themselves and leave a better situation for their children. And I mean, I just think it's, we've got to aspire to all the things that have been repeated many times in this place about education, health and all the other things. But we've got to aspire to putting people in a position where they can own their own home on their own country and leave that home in their will to their kids. It's a pretty simple aspiration, but it's a great builder of spirit. And um, I have to say, oh, I'm pretty um, 
I'm pretty upbeat about the future for our Indigenous people, and as I say, for uh, you know, ever since the 1700s, they've got a pretty—I won't swear—I'm in the chamber. Pretty rotten deal, and uh, you know, for various reasons of which I'm not interested. Today is the day of celebration. But I have to say that if you analyse the science of Australia, the weather, and what's happening with climate change and the predictions of declining runoff in the south, somewhere between 3,500 and 11,000 gigalitres of less runoff in the Murray-Darling Basin, which has a total of 23,000 gigalitres and produces 40 per cent of our food from water and 70 per cent, including the dry land. And then you look at the north, where we're the only island continent, Mr De Acting Deputy Chairman, that in my view globally is going to deal with climate change. And I know this is a long way from this particular motion, but it's certainly where it's going to finish up. And I mean, in 50 years' time, the science is right and 50 per cent of the world's population is water poor and a billion people are unable to feed themselves and 1.6 billion people are displaced by climate change and 30 per cent of the productive land of Asia disappears. And the food task doubles, then if Australia can maintain its sovereignty, the new wealth creators, Mr Acting Deputy Chairman, are going to be our Indigenous people. Because gladly they own, for instance, in the Northern Territory, 45 per cent of the land mass. A lot of that land mass is going to be greatly enhanced by climate change if the science is right. And as I've said in this chamber before, at the present time, Despite the fact that, and the ILC, the ILC is a wonderful opportunity for enhancement by our Indigenous people. They own many, many great properties in Australia, scattered right across the top end as well as the south end. And we have a duty of care to our Indigenous people to make sure that they are the beneficiaries of this new wealth that will come, and that a bunch of shysters and crooks don't intercept it all. So I am greatly gladdened by recent events. I'm not interested in the interest cases or the nuances of, of the language. I just think it's a great day for all Australians. And I am so pleased to see um, our Indigenous people celebrating that as well as our whitefellas. And I went, as Senator Moore did today, to see the people that feel that things in the Northern Territory aren't what they ought to be. And you, and what that said to me, Senator Moore, was that uh, all human endeavour has some human failure. One size does not fit all. And I mean, obviously, there are serious problems, and I'm not going to go through the problems now because today is a day of celebration. And uh, I am mightily proud <coughs> to have had the privilege to be in a parliament that did what we did today. I just think that's a great privilege. And like most things in life, you don't really appreciate them till they've passed you by. And uh, I am so proud of everyone in this place today and the wider generosity of spirit of the Australian people. And it's no more complicated than that. Thank you very much. Keep going. Keep going. Oh, uh, I've got to keep going. Oh, just for a couple of minutes. Um, well, I, I would hope. I would hope that the people out at what air see light at the end of the tunnel. Um, that Tobias, who's the, acting, who's the associate principal out there, that today has gladdened his heart. I mean, when you see kids that have no school to go to, that want to go to school, um, it's a great thing that the government has listened to the concerns of the people at Wadi. They've now got They've now got a Centrelink person on the office instead of a phone in the hole in the wall. Um, I think they're all sort of little indicators that Australia is waking up to the rotten deal our Indigenous people have gotten. And I mean, as there's an old saying, you shouldn't walk a mile in my shoes. I mean, the critics who are, in my view, innocently ignorant of the facts ought to try walking a mile in the, their shoes. I mean, a lot of the people I am, I felt like knuckling a few people out there. I struck a bloke out there and who had a, thousands of cattle on an Indigenous property, and I won't repeat the rotten deal the Indigenous people got out of it, but I felt like smacking him in the ear. Um, those things we want to put behind us, and we want to, we want to make sure that the people 
of our Indigenous communities who are the original custodians of Australia and whose heritage is the most precious thing that Australia has got, that want to live traditionally, are allowed to live traditionally, and those that want to go off and become doctors, lawyers and Indian chiefs can do that too. So this is a very complex matter, uh, but it is a day of celebration. And uh, I'm not the least bit interested in any anyone... order. The honourable senator's time has expired. God. It being almost 6:50 p.m., we now move to the consideration of government documents.